The Fire Prophecy Hidden Legends Academy of Magical Creatures, Book One Written by Megan Linsky and Alicia Radis Narrated by Jennifer Jill Araya and Graham Halstead Chapter One Most of the world couldn't understand people like me. I was never really normal, but I'd never been this different. I came from a world where dragons exist and fairy tales are real, but it felt like all the magic had gone out of the world. Every day I saw mythical creatures glide across the skies with riders on their backs, witnessed people conjuring fire and controlling the earth and flying through the air. Hell, even water obeyed my command. Waves rose and came crashing back down as I created them, and the ocean churned at my every whim. Rain poured from the clouds with just a blink of my eye, then froze into icy diamonds without me giving it a second thought. But it wasn't the same anymore. It was no longer incredible or breathtaking. It just was. I used to care about my powers. I no longer cared about anything, except the rage. I was always angry or frustrated, sometimes for no reason, and it just never ended. I stopped having words to explain what happened to me long before I even comprehended what did. I didn't know how to tell people. I just learned how to deal with it. I hated how people looked at me. I hated how I looked at myself. They didn't understand what it was like to be on the brink of life and death constantly. Fuck, I didn't even know. Not until after it happened. My entire life was turned upside down. I didn't even know who I was anymore. My life became nothing but questions. Was the man I was before just a lie? Or was the old Liam dead and did this new shitty one come to take his place? I wished there was a way to make this better. And I wished he was here so I could tell him I'm sorry and that I wanted it to be me instead of him. But he's not. And that's something I could never take back. Something I could never fix. Before, I hoped that someone could love me. For one incredible, amazing moment, I had someone that did. I actually believed for the rest of my life I wouldn't have to be alone. Now I knew that wasn't true. I was cursed to be an outsider. Forever. And I deserved everything I got. Grief is like being underwater, but never being allowed to come up to breathe. Chapter 2 Sophia Henley, you're dead! It took everything I had not to bust a gut laughing. Amelia had threatened my murder enough times throughout my childhood that I knew her words were nothing more than an empty threat. Besides, all I did was admit to stealing a pair of jeans she'd left home while she was off at college. That was hardly a crime worthy of a death sentence. I shot a smirk at my sister. You'll have to catch me first. I didn't give her a chance to respond. I sprinted forward, ignoring the burn in my legs as I raced up the mountain trail. The Salt Lake Valley was long behind us, with nothing but huge rocks and small shrubs covering the dry earth ahead of us. Pine trees dotted the surrounding mountain peaks. The higher I climbed, the narrower the dirt trail became, until I was running along a thin ledge. Sharp rocks jutted from the cliff to my right. It was easily a twenty-foot drop to the ground below. Amelia would so regret saying that if I slipped and fell. Good thing I was confident in my footing. Sophia! Amelia shouted from down the trail. This time it sounded like I was being sentenced for being faster than her, because it'd be so unfair if I was actually better than her at something. A high-pitched squawk filled the air above me. I glanced up to see Amelia's parrot circling my head. I wasn't sure what kind he was. When I asked Amelia after she brought him home from college, she just said he was exotic. I didn't have the heart to tell her that exotic wasn't a species. I didn't even want to ask how much she paid for the rat gremlin. She took him everywhere we went, though I wished he'd just stay in a cage. Amelia refused to buy one for him, said cages were inhumane. He looked like some sort of parrot, but his beak was longer and his feathers were a deep green, like the color of a luscious rainforest. 
I'd never seen anything like him before, especially not with his type of temperament. The thing hated me for whatever reason. Though I trusted my sister with my life, I didn't trust Kiwi. I slowed. My chest heaved as I inhaled deep breaths. Sophia! Amelia scolded once she caught up to me. What? I asked innocently. The path evened out, the sharp cliff behind us. Amelia plopped her butt into the dirt on the side of the trail, trying to catch her breath. The late afternoon sun beat down on us. When did you get so much faster than me? She asked through heavy breaths. Right around the time I started walking, I shot her a teasing smile. I'd always been able to beat Amelia in a race, on land at least. Amelia could totally school me in the water, though to be fair, I despised swimming. She sighed and shook her head at me. You're such a dweeb. I scoffed and sat beside her. I am not. She reached her sweaty arm around me and pulled me in close. Of course you are. You're my little dweeb. Gross, I protested, pushing away from her armpit. Come on, Sophia, she complained. Give me a hug. I'm only home for a few days. I miss you. I took a swig from my water bottle. I'm not that gullible. You're just going to give me a wet willy or something. Amelia laughed and wiped the sweat from her forehead. We're not kids anymore. I just rolled my eyes at her. It had been four years since she moved out, but she was still my sister, which meant every time she visited, I was subject to her teasing. Kiwi landed in the dirt beside Amelia and immediately headbutted a rock twice the size of his head. It rolled toward her hand. If I didn't know better, I'd say he was trying to offer the rock as a gift to her, but I was pretty sure he was just knocking his head against it for kicks. Despite what Amelia said, Kiwi wasn't exactly a bright bird. Amelia sighed. Forget about the pants. I just want to have fun with my little sister before I have to leave again for work. Amelia had graduated college a few months ago and immediately got a job as a cruise ship attendant. She was only home for a week before she had to pack up and leave on her next cruise. I hate you, you know, I teased. You have, like, the coolest job in the world. Amelia shrugged, but she couldn't hide her smile. No, I'm serious, I said. You get to travel the world on a cruise ship while I'm stuck at home for the next four years. Amelia screwed the cap off her water bottle and held it to her lips. Have you decided on a major yet? I shook my head as she threw her head back and chugged her water. Honestly, I had no idea what I wanted to do. One day I was a kid, dreaming of becoming a wild land firefighter. The next, my parents were telling me I had to get serious about a real career. Before I knew it, I was filling out college applications and graduating high school without a clue of where I'd go next. It seemed like everyone had their lives figured out but me. Amelia was going to travel the world on cruise ships, and my friends Emily and Leah were headed off to the same art school across the country. Even Kiwi, the idiot bird, seemed to know what he wanted in life. I didn't know what he was doing with that rock, but he sure looked determined. Me? I was just hoping things would change once school started. I'd find my passion and maybe a hot guy to share it with, and I'd make my mark on the world. It's okay, Amelia assured me, wiping water from the corner of her mouth. You have plenty of time to choose a major. Yeah. I grabbed a nearby rock and rolled it around in my hands, just so I wouldn't have to meet her gaze. I studied it intensely, taking note of the various shades of red woven together. It was cool enough to warrant a place in my rock collection. It just feels like I'm going to spend four years exploring my options and still not know what I want to do. Amelia rolled her eyes. It's normal to feel that way, Sophia. You'll figure it out. I glared at my sister. Says the girl who's had her life figured out since she was five. That's not true, she countered. I had no idea I wanted to work on a cruise ship. But you've always known what school you wanted to go to, I pointed out. Amelia had gone to some school in Northern California that was so small it didn't even have a website. I was pretty sure the last four years of her life had been a scam, but she claimed she loved it there. 
The important thing about college is that you have fun. Amelia cut off when the sound of a twig snapping behind us reached our ears. Both of our heads snapped in the direction of the noise. My eyes darted between the bushes and shrubs on the mountainside, but I saw nothing. My shoulders relaxed, and I glanced to Amelia. Her eyes went wide in fear. Don't be such a wuss, I told her. I hike this trail all the time by myself. I'm sure it was nothing. Amelia kept her eyes on the landscape. I just thought I saw... She trailed off. Saw what? I asked. Creeps didn't actually pop up out of the bushes, did they? Nothing, Amelia stood. We should probably start heading back, though. But it's only half a mile to the top, I countered. Which is like forever with this incline, she complained. My legs hurt, and it's a long way back to the car. It'll be dark before we get back. A half mile was nothing, but it was my older sister I was arguing with. I'd never win. Fine, I relented. But then you have to let me keep the jeans. No, she denied without hesitation, staring down at me and waiting for me to move. I curled the rock I held into my fist and hopped to my feet. You're a booger, you know that? You're a big, rotting clump of troll boogers. Wow, Amelia said flatly, like she wasn't at all impressed. That's creative. I smiled proudly, but my smile quickly faded when Amelia shot a nervous glance over her shoulder. The look in her eyes made my mouth go dry. You're okay, aren't you, Am? All my teasing from earlier had disappeared from my tone. You're not being stalked or something, are you? What? Amelia's voice rose at least three pitches above normal. The light laugh she threw in didn't sound the least bit genuine. If I was being stalked, you'd know it. I couldn't help but notice she hadn't exactly answered me. She started down the trail. Kiwi squawked and spread his wings to follow behind her. I remained quiet as we descended the mountain. Amelia didn't speak either, but I noticed she had quickened her pace and kept glancing behind us. It wasn't until night had fallen and we made it back to the parking lot that I finally spoke. I reached for Amelia's wrist before she could round Mom's crossover to the driver's side. Are you going to tell me what's up or not? Amelia's eyes scanned the dark, deserted parking lot. Nothing's wrong. Just get in the car. I planted my feet firmly on the pavement. Not until you tell me, get in the car, Sophia. Amelia's tone hit me like a slap in the face. I rushed so fast to the passenger side door that she hadn't even unlocked it yet. Something was definitely up, and now that I had confirmation, I wasn't about to hang around to find out what it was. The click of the lock hit my ears, and I swung the door open and scrambled inside. Kiwi flew in through Amelia's door, and she slammed it behind her. Amelia, I demanded. Talk to me. Amelia reached for her seatbelt and pulled it across her body. Her lips tightened as she turned the key in the ignition, but she didn't answer. The engine roared to life, and the headlights lit the bushes in front of us. My breath stopped when I caught sight of two small, shiny objects in the distance. Eyes. The creature was far enough away from the car that I couldn't see its body, but judging by how high its eyes seemed to hover above the ground, it was huge, like mountain lion huge. Am, I cried. There's something out there. Amelia gritted her teeth and spoke under her breath. Yeah, I thought so. Let's get out of here. My heart slammed against my ribcage. In all the years I'd been hiking this trail, I hadn't seen anything larger than a bighorn sheep. I racked my brain, trying to remember if sheep eyes glowed, but I was pretty sure they weren't nocturnal. Could it be some sort of canine? Maybe a deer? Yes, a deer. That wasn't so scary. No, Amelia said lowly, unclicking her seatbelt and kicking her door open. This ends now. What the... Amelia! Stay here, she instructed. Watch Kiwi. Amelia slammed her door shut and headed straight for the bushes. 
What the hell was she thinking going after a wild animal? If I didn't know better, I'd say she was the dweeb. But she wasn't this stupid. I jumped out of the car behind her. Amelia! I hissed, keeping my voice as low as I could. She turned back to me. The headlights of our car illuminated her. I said to stay in the car. Are you insane? I wanted to rush over to her and drag her back to the car. But I still didn't know what kind of animal was out there. Fear stalled me, and I remained rooted in place next to the vehicle. Amelia ignored me and stepped forward, disappearing into the darkness beyond the light of our headlights. She called out into the bushes, but I couldn't hear what she was saying. Amelia's officially lost it. The hairs on my arms stood. Kiwi let out a high-pitched shriek from inside the car and pecked against the windshield. Against my better judgment, I abandoned the safety of the vehicle and hurried forward behind Amelia. Come out, Naomi, I heard Amelia say. Come and face me, you lousy piece of dirt. Amelia, I whisper screamed. Amelia had wandered so far into the darkness that I could only make out her silhouette. I told you to stay in the car, her voice shot back. She spoke with such authority that I almost considered turning back just so I wouldn't have to deal with her lecture later. Before I could make a decision, a shadow leapt from the bushes and slammed into her. My hands shot up to cover my mouth before a scream erupted from my lungs. Amelia stumbled backward into the light, but tripped over a shrub and fell to the ground. She got to her elbows and scurried backward. A low growl came from somewhere in the darkness. Every inch of my body shook, but I rushed forward and looped my arms under Amelia's to pull her to her feet. Am! I broke off. I hadn't even helped her to her feet yet. Up closer, I got a better look at the shadow in the darkness. It moved with finesse, as if every movement was calculated. The creature was stalking us, ready to pounce. It paced in front of us, its shoulder blades rising and falling with every step. A cat. But it wasn't the kind of cat you wanted to cuddle. This cat was bigger than me, with sharp claws and the kind of powerful teeth that could rip a human's throat out. Amelia was right. I'm dead. We both are. Don't make any sudden movements. I whispered under my breath, completely frozen in place. The cat in front of us was huge and covered in a coat of blonde fur. I'd never seen a cougar in real life before, but this seemed bigger, like some sort of African cat. Had it escaped from the zoo? I hoped that was the case and that it was used to humans, and that it wasn't hungry. Against my instruction, Amelia jumped to her feet and dusted the dirt off her shorts, like she hadn't noticed the beast in front of us. Except she stared right at it, almost like she knew the creature personally. She turned from the cat and grabbed my arm. Her fingernails dug into my skin, but I couldn't bring myself to move for fear that it had run after us. She tugged harder, and I had no choice but to stumble behind her. I told you to stay in the car, Amelia scolded. I know, but... A screech ripped out of my chest. Amelia's hand fell from my arm as her body crashed to the ground again. The cat stood over her, baring its teeth. Before I could react, Amelia shoved her elbow up into the cat's nose. The cat immediately retaliated by swiping its claws at the arm she held protectively in front of her face. Instinct overtook. I didn't even think about what I was doing when I drew my arm back and hurled the rock I still held at the cat. I didn't wait to see if I hit it. I bent and grabbed a thick stick in the dirt nearby and swung it upward to connect with the cat's jaw. The dry stick snapped in half as it connected. The cat continued to stare down my sister as if it hadn't felt a thing. I hurled the remaining half of my stick at its head. By sheer luck, I managed to hit it square in the eye. The cat stumbled backward with a whimper, but before I could help Amelia to her feet, 
the cat turned its frightening gaze on me. I mean, its one eye was winky, but that didn't make me feel any better. Sheer terror ripped through my gut, and my skin heated so much that sweat broke out across my brow. A split second passed. Then the cat lunged, launching itself through the air toward me. My scream filled the air around us, and I threw my arms out in front of me. If I wasn't scared before, I was freaking terrified when a burst of red light shot across the space between us. I didn't have the time to contemplate the strange phenomenon. I expected a blow to come, for sharp claws to rip into my skin and strong jaws to tear me apart. But instead, the cat twisted sideways and landed on the ground on its side. I only let my shock last a split second. I rushed forward and grabbed Amelia's arm and dragged her to her feet. Together, we sprinted back to the car. Amelia shifted into reverse before I even had my door closed. She tore out of the parking lot without looking back. Kiwi was going crazy, flying around the back seat. What were you thinking? I shrieked. We could have been killed. Forget about that, Amelia cried. Her eyes darted between mine and the road. Did I see you use fire, Sophia? What? Is that what that flash of red had been? Some sort of fireball? It was, wasn't it? Amelia accused. You're Coigny. Coigny? I practically yelled. Have you gone insane? No, Amelia bit back, obviously offended. You tried to pet a wild cat. Amelia's jaw tensed but she softened her tone. I wasn't trying to pet it. Then what were you doing? I demanded. It doesn't matter, she said. What matters is that Mom and Dad lied to me. To both of us. I was momentarily struck silent. What did Mom and Dad have to do with this? They told me you were human. Adopted. Amelia slowed the car to match the speed limit. I swallowed hard. This had to be a dream. Or maybe I'd been drugged. Apparently, an African cat attack in the middle of Salt Lake I could believe, but there was no way my parents had lied to me for 18 years about being adopted. Sure, I was the black sheep of the family with lighter hair and paler skin, but we told each other everything. Yet that wasn't the most disturbing part of what Amelia had just said. Human? My voice shook. What else is there? Amelia pressed her lips together. How do I put this? She took a deep breath. Sophia, you're magical, like me. You're an elementi. My brow furrowed. Maybe Amelia wasn't insane. Maybe she was just high. Maybe we both were high. Elementi? I repeated the word. It felt strange on my tongue, like it shouldn't be there. What are you talking about? Amelia hesitated. I'm sorry you had to find out like this, Sophia, but there's no other explanation. You're Coigny, a fire elementi. Me, Mom, and Dad are Toaqua, water elementi. What do you mean? I demanded. Amelia had better start making sense or I was going to lose it. Amelia swallowed, like she didn't know how to break the news. It means you're one of us, she finally said. It means you have magic. Chapter 3 A long time ago, the school felt like home. Now all it had become was a painful reminder of everything I'd lost. The halls of Orenda Academy seemed dark and intimidating, not warm and friendly. Only every other torch was lit because of summer, and the clouds outside from the impending storm covered up the sun. I kept my head down and focused on counting the stones two by two, avoiding the eyes of the judgmental paintings and tapestries. They were all of elementi and familiars. I wasn't part of them anymore. Orenda Academy was huge. It took me a half hour to navigate through the castle and find the head dean's tower. 
I knew every inch of this castle by heart, yet my steps were slow and hesitant. I didn't know what Alaric wanted from me. Not yet. I would say being summoned by him scared me, but I wasn't scared. After what had happened, I wasn't afraid of anything anymore. Just living. I entered the tower and climbed the dozens of steps that spiraled upward to head Dean Alric's office. I grabbed the dragon's head knocker and knocked three times. The great iron doors opened of their own accord, and I stepped into the office. The room was circular and large, packed with books from the floor to the ceiling and bookcases that expanded upward, the sunroof shining light into the middle of the marble floor. A fireplace burned, and Hawkeye memorabilia was placed in an organized fashion in glass cabinets. Head Dean Caspian Alric, the master elementi that ran the place, stood in the middle of the room with his hands clasped behind his back. Each part of his suit was impeccably ironed and cleaned, his shoes shined. Though he was ancient, he moved with all the grace of a young man. His short white hair and sculpted beard were trimmed to neurotic perfection. Even the wrinkles on his tanned face appeared to fall exactly into place. His dragon familiar was circling above the school somewhere. I could hear the power of her wings through the walls outside as she buffeted them up and down, her dominating roar quivering the tower. Good. I didn't want to cross Valda today. The four other minor deans were situated around the room in four chairs. Dean Eliza from Yapluma, the air house, stared at me like I was in a zoo, while Dean Hestian from Nevita, the earth house, wouldn't look me in the eye. Eliza's familiar was a large yellow thunderbird that hardly glanced at me. I didn't mind. I didn't feel like getting zapped today. Hestian's familiar was a white stag that had ivy leaves twisting up its legs and around its massive antlers, which were twelve-pronged on each side and six feet end to end. The stag clicked its hooves on the floor but said nothing more. They pitied me. It was a sickening feeling that I hated. I noticed that Madame Eleanor Doya, Dean of Coigny, was missing her lioness familiar. That was weird. Naomi was hardly absent from Madame Doya's side. Wherever she was, no doubt the lioness was stalking some poor soul on behalf of Doya's bidding. Whoever had been stupid enough to cross Madame Doya would certainly regret it. Madame Doya was dressed elaborately, as she always was, in a purple velvet dress and furs. She had multiple rings on her fingers. Her long red hair was curled, red lips puckered and tight. She had mastered resting bitch face better than anyone I knew. My dean, from Toaqua, Professor Elliot Bain, was the only one who gave me an encouraging smile behind baggy and tired eyes. He had short cropped hair that was combed back, large square glasses, a thick and pointed nose, and a scraggly gray beard. He looked more or less thrown together, his suit sloppy with stains and shoes almost worn with holes, but despite his ragged appearance, I was glad he'd shown up. His familiar wasn't here, as she needed the ocean to survive. I was glad there was a fellow Water Tribe member in here with me in case things got a little heated and I was already on my last nerve. What's this about? I asked bluntly. It was more than a little rude. Madame Doya raised an eyebrow, and the Navita and Yapluma deans shifted uncomfortably. Normally, a third year would get in trouble for mouthing off to their superiors. Big trouble. A million punishments flew behind Madame Doya's eyes, but no one said anything. I was testing them. I wanted to see how far I could push, how much I could get away with, just how sorry they felt for me. Head Dean Alric didn't bat an eye at my attitude. By now, he was long used to it. We've gotten notice of a missing child, he began. Eighteen years ago, an infant was stolen from Coigny. We've recently located her in Utah, living with members of Toaqua. Toaqua stole a baby from the fire tribe? I asked in astonishment, before I shook my head. No, it can't be true. 
It is true, boy, Madame Doya said in that condescending voice of hers, the one she reserved for literally everyone that wasn't from Coigny. After all this time, we've discovered the missing child is alive and that she was stolen by none other than Robert and Susan Henley. My stomach sank. I knew the family. Not very well, but well enough to know that, yeah, they'd do something like this. There were multiple reasons that my tribe, Tawakwa, would steal a fire baby. Kawigni and Tawakwa were natural-born enemies and were always trying to one-up each other. But what Alric said next floored me. We believe the Henleys took the child to prevent a prophecy from coming true. As if in unison, all the deans spoke together. The fated Coigny child, born in the summer solstice in the year of the dragon, shall bring glory to the greatest house. <laughs> I've heard of the prophecy, but had always rubbed it off as F.A.S. That is fake as shit. Who believed in corny stuff like that? Apparently, Madame Doya did, because she looked pissed. This girl is critical to the elevation and status of my house. She needs to be returned to Coigny, where she belongs. And you, Liam, are the perfect person to bring her back, Alric finished. Oh, great. Here we go. Okay, a lost fire baby, I said flatly. And you want me to go looking for her. Why? Why not send someone from Coigny? The elders don't want a Coigny. They specifically requested someone from Toaqua to smooth over the delicate situation. Dean Eliza spoke up. Yeah, that made sense. Better to send someone from the Henley's own tribe to convince them to hand over the girl than a fiery, pissed-off Coigny, I guess. Fine. But why me? I stuck my hands in my pockets and stared at them. I'm just a third year. We know well of your troubles, Mr. Maito, Eliza said with a wayward glance at Bane. It was suggested that you should be the one from Toakwa to go, as it might help restore some credit to your name. This was ridiculous. Why was this my problem, and why did I care? I didn't want to get involved in things that weren't my business. I just wanted to keep to myself. It's all I'd asked for in the past few months. On the other hand, this was my chance. An opportunity to win my place back in society after the horrible mess I'd created. Status meant everything to the Elementi. I didn't care about stuff like that, but my family sure did. I couldn't bear disappointing my parents more than I already had. All right, I'll do it, I said. Hopefully you're capable, Doya clipped. You ever had a teacher who completely hated you? Yeah, that was Madame Doya. I was lucky enough to avoid her most of the time because she mostly taught Coigny classes, but I had gotten stuck with her after bonding with Nashoma. We were put into predator familiars together, a class Doya and Naomi ruled like dictators. That class had been hell. I barely passed. At Nashoma's funeral, Doya had the nerve to come up to me and say that her time teaching me had been a waste. If I thought I couldn't hate her any more than I already had, she'd surprised me once again. We have complete faith you'll bring Sophia back to us, Liam, Bane said. He nodded to me for encouragement. Sophia? It caught my interest. That's her name? Sophia Henley. She's not a Henley. At least she won't be for much longer. Troya's tone was cool. We don't know if this girl is indeed the prophesied child, Alric said. But we do know that she belongs here, at Orenda Academy. It's time to bring her home. I nodded grimly. Fine, then I guess I'm your man. They gave me an address, along with a free pass aboard the Hojo cruise liner, before they allowed me to leave. I felt dizzy when I went back down the stairs, but I ignored it. By the time I reached the hallway, I was determined to continue on, but a sudden wave of pain bloomed at the bottom of my back and spread throughout my body, causing my muscles to involuntarily spasm. I let out a cry of pain and gritted my teeth. This sucked. I put a hand against the wall to steady myself and took deep breaths to try and regain my composure. 
Come on, just hurry up and die already, I moaned inwardly. I leaned against the wall and waited for the vertigo to pass. It was always like this. Agony would come up suddenly and without warning. One moment I was completely fine. The next, the room would be spinning and I'd feel my legs turn to water. One too many times in the past few weeks, I'd passed out. How embarrassing would it be if some stupid first year came along and found me on the floor? Or anyone, for that matter. My dad wanted me to keep moving forward in life, but he didn't know what it was like. Most people who lost their familiars died off right away. The ones that stuck around were older, past my father's age, and they only stayed for a few months. Young people like me usually kicked the bucket a few days after their familiar was gone. Elementi couldn't live without their familiars. Not me. For whatever reason, my useless body stubbornly hung on. After Nashoma died, I'd gone from completely fine to completely disabled in a few short months, and it fucking sucked. After a few minutes, my vertigo went away and I felt like I could walk again, though I was significantly weaker. To distract myself from the harsh throbbing radiating throughout my body, I thought of the task ahead. I had to go clean up a mess a bunch of stupid old people had made. Typical. This Sophia girl was probably a spoiled brat. I knew her sister, Amelia. I didn't exactly not like her, but that girl's middle name should be Bossy. She loved ordering people around. I bet her younger sister was worse. I wasn't exactly shocked to find my father waiting for me at the entrance to the school. His familiar, a grizzly named Tatum, was blocking the hallway so I couldn't get around. Fat-ass bear. My dad was wearing a suit, too, which meant he'd been called in for a council meeting. He rarely got dressed up unless he had to. So Aqua went with the flow. Dad had a thick nose and tanner skin than I did. His long black hair hung loose far past his shoulders. If anyone looked like an elementi, he fit the bill. Something I no longer did. He never came up to the school, not unless it was important. Somebody had probably told him about my summoning, most likely one of my mouthy brothers or sisters. Dad looked concerned, which I hated. How are things going, son? He asked. You don't need to check up on me, Dad. I can handle things, I told him. It was a lie, of course. I'd been such a mess over the summer, and he'd seen it all. I'm surprised he wasn't here trying to hold my hand. I wasn't checking up. Tatum and I were just passing through. Your sister wanted me to speak with Professor Lopez, he said. Yeah, right. I resisted the urge to roll my eyes and said, I'm guessing you know what this is about? Dad paused. His eyes narrowed as he said, Yes, the missing Coigny girl has been found, I've heard. There was an awkward pause. I pressed, Dad, do you know anything about this? Dad cleared his throat. There are some things, son, that are better left unsaid. Tatum let out a growl of agreement, which just made me more suspicious. He was totally in on this somehow. I bet he'd help the Henleys take her. I didn't really care. My job was to drag her back. It wasn't in the details. Tribe politics bored me. Dad changed the subject and said, This is important, son. You must do everything in your power to convince this girl that Orenda Academy is the best place for her. Our family's reputation and our house's depends on it. I know, Dad. Being the firstborn son of the water chief had been fantastic, until I'd brought embarrassment upon the entire house a few months ago. After making sure I was okay, Dad's first priority had been coming up with ways to restore honor to Toakwa. As of yet, he hadn't managed to clean up the mess I'd made. Dad was cautious with his next few words. Liam, I know it hasn't been easy with Nashoma gone. Dad, I don't want to talk about it. I'm just saying... Perhaps it is time to move on. You ever try living without a soul? I shot back at him and he recoiled. There's no moving on from that. Dad stared at me and I ran a hand through my hair. Oh, I'm sorry, Dad. I'm just tired. 
I understand, son. He was letting me off too easy these days. Go head home and relax. Your mother will help you pack for the trip. I was 21 and didn't need mom to pack my bags for me, but I bet she would anyway. She spoiled me. I listened to my father and headed out, blocking out the castle around me until I emerged into the evergreen forest that surrounded it. But I didn't go to the ocean to head home. Not yet. Instead, I turned deeper into the woods, heading toward the burial ground. Nobody was here, luckily. I moved around the burial mounds that were covered in flowers until I got to the newest plot, one that had only recently been constructed. The hill was new and was covered in dirt, not grass. A stone wolf's head totem stood before the gravesite. There were no other markings. An empty plot was next to Neshoma's, we were supposed to be buried together, not apart. I kneeled on the ground and took out a few offerings from my pockets. His favorite food, beef jerky, some wild flowers from outside his den, and a couple of incense sticks. I muttered a prayer in the ancient language of our tribe as I lit the incense and scattered the petals over the grave. I don't know what I expected. Some sign from the ancestors? Some indication that Neshoma was here? but I felt nothing and saw nothing. I was totally alone. And fuck, it felt that way. I hung my head. I'm sorry, Nishoma, I whispered. I don't know why I'm here anymore. I couldn't help being bitter. My life meant nothing. I'd lost everything. Chapter 4 Apparently, I was magic, but that was all Amelia had bothered telling me. It was an hour-long drive out of the Salt Lake Valley and back home to our cozy, small town, but Amelia barely let me get a word in the whole time. By the time we got home the night of the lion attack, she'd worked herself up so much that I couldn't understand her ramblings. She threw around words like Hawkeye and Nevada as if she knew an entirely different language. I couldn't understand a word of it. She blew up at Mom and Dad the second we walked through the door. How could you lie to us? She demanded. They acted deeply offended, like they couldn't believe Amelia would accuse them of such a thing. Despite my desperate need to understand what was going on, Mom and Dad exiled me to my room to deal with Amelia in private. I'd lain on my carpet with my ear pressed to the vent in my floor and a blanket draped over my body, trying to hear everything downstairs. I couldn't hear most of what they were saying, and the bits and pieces I caught didn't make any sense. She can't go to Arenda, I heard Mom say. She's a Kowigny raised by Toaqua. The Elementi would have her killed. I tried to tell myself that the events of that night hadn't actually happened that I was drunk or something. But no matter how much I tried to convince myself otherwise, I couldn't get over how real it felt, how my heart pounded at the sight of the lion, how my skin heated when the fire shot out of my palm, how Amelia looked at me like I wasn't her real sister. And who knew? Maybe I wasn't. Sometime during the night, I drifted off, I woke to the morning light and peeled my face off the vent grate. A glance in the mirror showed evenly spaced white and red lines across my skin, where the grate had dug into my skin. That was going to take a while to smooth out. I was still dressed in my athletic shorts and t-shirt from the day before. I was in desperate need of a shower, but clean hair and a change of clothes could wait. I tossed my blanket to my bed and left the room in haste. I nearly tripped over our cat in the hallway. The stupid feline jumped out of the way and hissed at me. He shot daggers my way, like I'd seriously offended him. If I wasn't used to Oliver's constant need to avoid me, I might have been intimidated by the 30-pound beast and his razor-sharp claws. But he just turned from me and continued down the hallway. The house was eerily quiet this morning which gave me chills because there was never a silent moment when Amelia was home. I padded softly down the stairs, listening for signs that anyone else was awake. 
I was usually the last one up, so it'd shock me if the rest of my family was still in bed. I reached the bottom of the stairs and heard the cling of dishes in the kitchen. I crossed the hall and peered into the room. Mom, Dad, and Amelia all sat around the table, quietly scooping cereal into their mouths. They looked like my mom and dad. Mom, with her dark brown hair piled on top of her head and the first signs of age touching the corner of her eyes. And Dad, with his salt and pepper hair and a shadow of scruff along his jawline. They looked the same as every other day, but they moved like robots. I hesitated in the doorway. What could I possibly say to them? So, I'm adopted? You lied to me? Spill it, Mom and Dad, if those are, in fact, your real names. Mom glanced up from her cereal bowl and caught my eye in the doorway. Sophia, she said with a wide smile. She was acting far too cheerful. Another reason I knew last night wasn't just a dream. She stood and pulled the chair out from beside her. Sit down, honey. I'll grab you a bowl. My initial reaction told me to do as I was told. I wasn't one to touch conflict with a ten-foot pole if I could avoid it. But I knew I couldn't avoid it this morning. No matter what I did, I needed to tackle this issue. Dad eyed me like he couldn't believe I hadn't accepted my mother's invitation to join them. Amelia looked half-surprised, too, but she mostly avoided everyone's gazes. Another red flag. How many were we up to now? Mom turned from the cupboard. Sophia, aren't you going to join us for breakfast? I crossed my arms. The only thing I'm hungry for is answers. Mom's brow furrowed as she set my bowl on the counter. What do you mean, honey? I glanced to Dad, hoping he would respond to my request, but he only dug into his cereal like he hadn't heard me. I swallowed. Amelia told me I'm adopted. Mom let out a laugh so loud that it made the rest of us jump in unison. Oh, honey, Amelia was only teasing. Of course you're not adopted. Mom was a terrible liar, even worse than I was. Amelia shot to her feet and slammed her hands against the tabletop. A loud bang filled the air. Bruno, who I hadn't realized was lounging under the table, jumped to his feet and scurried out of the room. The dog, who looked more like a coyote than anything, nearly ran me over on his way out. Can we cut the bullshit? Amelia snapped. Mom and Dad exchanged a glance, but they didn't back down. You can't keep this from her forever, Amelia yelled, her eyes darting between the two of them. Finally, Dad sighed and straightened in his chair. She already knows, Susan. We might as well tell her what we can. Mom's lips tightened. I hoped it would never come to this. We knew it would eventually. Dad turned to me. Amelia is right. We adopted you. The confirmation was like a knife through my back. I didn't want to believe it was true. It wasn't just that this family wasn't my own. It was the fact that all three of them had lied to me my entire life. Even Amelia, who I'd grown up spilling every last deep, dark secret to, had lied to me. I trusted my family with everything. But now, a knot tightened in my chest until I could hardly breathe. My knees shuddered, and I held myself up against the doorframe. I wanted to scream, to spew all the hateful words that were racing through my mind. But I was afraid that if I opened my mouth, more than just words would escape. Mom rushed to my side and took my arm. Sophia, honey, sit down, please. I hardly noticed her leading me across the kitchen to the empty chair closest to the door. I sank into it but my mind raced so fast that it hardly felt like I was in the same room as them. They lied to me. Who lies about this kind of thing? Why? I heard the word escape my lips, 
but it took me a moment to realize that I'd spoken it. Why would you lie to me about something like this? If I'm not your daughter, where did I come from? Mom and Dad looked to each other again. Their stalling was getting on my nerves. Just tell her, Amelia demanded. Tell her or I will. Dad frowned and scooted his chair closer to me. Sophia, everything we've done has been to protect you. I pulled my hand away from his when he reached out for me. He didn't get to comfort me, not right now. Protect me from what? From the elementi, Amelia answered. Mom shot her a heavy glare, but her expression quickly softened when she turned back to me. You were placed in our protection when you were a baby. In our world, it's forbidden for a Toaqua to raise a Coigny. We wanted to raise you as our own, and we knew that we would care for you well, but we couldn't do it in our society. That's why we left. Toaqua? Coigny? I repeated. The words didn't sound real. We come from a group of people with the ability to manipulate the elements, Dad explained. There are four houses of elementi. Toaqua, that's us, are able to manipulate water. Coigny can manipulate fire, while Navida control earth and Yapluma control air. You have the power of fire, Sophia. No! I denied the truth immediately. If my family was running some sort of prank, they obviously hadn't thought it through very well. I can't be from the firehouse. I'm scared of fire. Everyone knows that. I can't be from the firehouse. My own words echoed in my mind. I said them like it was possible I'd come from another house. Was I actually entertaining the idea that I could be one of these elementi? Mom shook her head slowly, regretfully. We only let you believe you were afraid of fire. What? I asked in shock. Another lie. But I fell into a fire pit when I was a kid. You wouldn't even let us have bonfires or a fireplace because you said I was too afraid of them. We only said that to keep you away from fire, Mom admitted. So that I wouldn't control it and freak people out? I demanded. Is that what I was? A freak? No, Dad insisted. Elementi don't get their powers until they're older. Yours are still very weak. We made up the story about the fire pit to curb your fascination with it. Fire can't hurt you. Explains why I have no burn scars. My blood boiled at the confession. What else had they lied to me about? I lifted my gaze to meet Amelia's from across the table. This is all true? Her eyes filled with apology. She nodded. Why didn't you tell me, Am? I whispered. You think I didn't want to tell you I could control water? Amelia replied. In case you don't remember, Mom and Dad lied to me, too. I had no idea you were Coigny. I thought you were a normal human until yesterday. I got to my feet and paced across the room. How could I possibly accept what they'd just told me? Magic didn't exist. I whirled back toward them. What else should I know about the Elementi, about the Coigny? What did I need protection from? I stared at Amelia, but she didn't seem to have an answer for me. Mom and Dad had both gone pale. Mom was the first to speak. None of that matters. The fewer questions you ask, the safer you'll be. Safe from what? I demanded. Nobody answered me. My jaw clenched so hard I was afraid I might crack a tooth. Finally, Mom stood. She pulled me into a hug. I wanted to push her away, but her hug was both a betrayal and a comfort. No matter what she lied about, she was still my mom, and nothing beat a mother's touch. I still hated her right now. Sophia, 
Mom whispered into my ear. I'm sorry we can't be more honest with you. You're just going to have to trust us. The thing was, I wasn't sure I'd ever trust my parents again. Three days had passed, and I was still avoiding my parents as often as I could. They didn't want to open up to me, so I refused to open up back. Amelia, at least, was sympathetic. She found me sitting on our old swing set in the backyard. We hadn't used the thing in years. But right now, it felt like the only thing that was normal. It was pouring rain, and I was soaked. I didn't want her sitting next to me. I wanted to be alone. But Amelia wasn't the type to give people space when they needed it. She took the swing beside me and opened her hands. The rain had stopped. I looked up and noticed that Amelia had made some sort of force field around us so that the rain slid off thin air and stopped pouring on me. That's kind of creepy, I said flatly. You'll be able to do creepy things too. She smiled at me but I didn't smile back. Instead, I scowled at Kiwi on her shoulder because I'd rather look at him than stare her in the eye. Come on, Sophia, Amelia encouraged. You have to talk to me eventually. How can I talk to people who lie to me? I bit back. She frowned. That's not fair. Really? I said sarcastically. Then why don't you tell me what really happened the other night? It was a mountain lion attack, Amelia insisted, just like every other time I dared to bring it up. I've seen pictures of mountain lions, I said. That thing was bigger. It just looked bigger because of all the adrenaline. She wouldn't budge on the topic, but I could still tell she was lying. If she really thought it was a mountain lion, she wouldn't have gone to investigate it. There are still other things you lied to me about. I pointed out. You're being unfair, Amelia said. I knew you were adopted, but I didn't know you were one of us. Exactly, I emphasized. You knew I was adopted and you didn't say anything. It wasn't my secret to tell, Amelia said. I bit my lower lip. But we tell each other everything, Am. You don't understand, Amelia argued. I couldn't tell you about the elementi. Everything in our world has to be kept secret for our survival. I paused, considering this. What's your world like? It's amazing. Amelia sighed with a dreamy look in her eyes. It's incredible. It's everything you ever wanted. Imagine the best dream you've ever had and then multiply that by a hundred. Arenda Academy was my home and it'll be your home, too. My home? What do you mean? You get to spend four years learning how to use your powers and how to take care of magical creatures, Amelia stated simply. Magical creatures? I asked warily. My first thoughts flickered to the fat, naked plant babies that came screaming out of the dirt in Harry Potter. Yes, Amelia said with a smile. It's an elementized duty to take care of all animals that have magic. You'll learn more when you get to the academy. You'll bond with your familiar and... My familiar? I asked. It was like she was speaking in riddles again. Your creature, Amelia clarified while she stroked Kiwi's feathers. Kiwi is mine, Bruno is dad's, and Oliver is mom's. Wait, mom and dad have familiars? Yes, Every elementi has one. What is it? I asked. A familiar? It's your lifetime companion, Amelia explained. The most important relationship you'll ever have. I still didn't really understand familiars, but if mine was anything like Kiwi, I'd take it back. The thought that creatures like dragons, unicorns, and griffins really existed made me feel worse. How had I gone my entire life knowing nothing about who I was? This was too much information at once. I'm probably going to bond with a plant, I said dully. Don't say that, 
Your familiar is going to be so awesome. I just know it, Amelia said. So what exactly did you learn at this school? Like water math? I asked. Amelia laughed loudly. No, Sophia. You learn how to use your powers and how to use them to work together with your familiar. You'll be in fire classes, learning how to use your fire magic. I didn't know if I wanted to learn fire magic. I would burn up my plant. Amelia smacked herself in the head. That's right. You're Coigny. You're going to have classes with Madame Doya. Madame Doya? Her name sounded harsh, even when I said it. The title sounds so formal. We only call her Madame because she's on the Elder Council, Amelia explained. She's really young to be an elder, too, like Mom and Dad's age. Anyway, she's a total bitch. I had her for one class, and we never got along, mostly because she's so mean. She's probably going to hate you, too, because you're my sister. But maybe not, because she's the dean of your house. She loves her little Coigny pets. Oh, great. I already had a strike against me. Madame Doya sounded horrible like the kind of person who would find pleasure in whipping students if it were allowed. Amelia was rambling now. I loved Arenda Academy. There were so many hot guys from the other houses, but I never got a chance to hook up with them because it was forbidden. Huh? I really didn't want to hear about my sister hooking up, but the forbidden part sounded intriguing. People aren't allowed to mate between houses, you can only date people within your own element class, Amelia explained. You'll learn all about it once you get there. Amelia made Arenda Academy sound perfect the more she talked about it. Yet there was so much I still didn't know. I wasn't good with the unknown. I was good with comfortable. Nothing about the elementi made me feel comfortable. There was still this voice in the back of my head telling me that Amelia was pulling my leg. But I knew that all of this, whatever it was, was real. Eventually, I stood and headed inside. Amelia followed me in with Kiwi, and the force field around us trailed us to the front door. It shut off once we stepped inside, and the rain that had piled on top of it splashed down onto the porch steps. Do you really think I'll fit in at Arenda Academy? I asked my sister as we entered the kitchen. No, because you are not going. Dad's sharp voice cut across the room before Amelia could answer. He had a coffee in his hand, but nothing else. He'd been watching us. How can you say that? Amelia asked, disgusted. She's an elementi. It's where she belongs. She can't go. We'll find another way, Dad said, before he turned his back and left the room. Whatever that meant. I guess that settles it, I said, defeated. It doesn't matter what I know or don't know about Arenda Academy, because Mom and Dad won't let me go anyway. Amelia just smiled, like she knew something I didn't. My sister and I ate dinner in front of the TV every night since the lion attack. Mom and Dad didn't say anything about it, even though they had a strict no-food-in-the-living-room policy. They just let me avoid them. I wasn't sure if they were giving me my space or if they were avoiding me as well. Amelia and I were curled up on the couch with our dinner when the doorbell rang the following night. Amelia didn't even blink and kept her eyes on the TV. I stretched my foot across the couch and nudged her. Get the door, Am. You're closer. Amelia frowned. You get it. I don't even live here anymore. I'm a guest. I groaned, but set my dinner plate on the coffee table and rose to my feet anyway. I ran my fingers through my ponytail. I hadn't bothered with makeup today, and I was sure I looked like a slob. It was probably just a neighbor or something, so I guess I didn't really care what I looked like. At least, I didn't until I opened the door. The guy standing in front of me looked nothing like one of my neighbors. He looked more like a security guard. A hot security guard, only without the uniform. He was tall, 
at least a half a foot taller than me, and made of muscle. His skin was a deep brown, and his straight black hair hung past his shoulders. His eyes were dark, and his jaw strong. He stood with his feet in a wide stance, and his hands crossed in front of him, like he was here on some sort of official business. He could officially business me. I mean, if I didn't faint into his arms like a crazy fangirl first. Did he have a fan club? Because I'd totally join. Sophia Henley? He asked. Even his voice was hot. Oh, God. He knows my name. I stood in the doorway, my mouth agape. A million questions raced through my mind. Who are you? How do you know my name? Why didn't I put on makeup today? Did I even brush my hair? Why do you look like a god? Uh... That was all that came out of my mouth. I was officially an idiot. Who is it, Sophia? Amelia called from the living room. The guy's eyebrows rose at the confirmation of my name. I... Uh... Good. You got one word out. Try another. Yeah, I'm Sophia. And you? Liam, he said in a clipped tone, like he was in too much of a hurry to introduce himself properly. I'm here to escort you to Arenda Academy of Magical Creatures. What? Amelia! I shouted, never taking my eyes off Liam. What? Amelia rushed into the hallway. Alarm settled on her face until her eyes fell upon Liam. Her expression immediately softened, but it held a hint of confusion. They sent a student? Yes, Liam said, though he didn't care to elaborate. I stepped back from the doorway, suddenly feeling like I should be slamming the door in this guy's face. Mom and Dad did say they were trying to protect me from the elementi, and here one was, standing on my front steps uninvited. Am? What's going on? I asked in a shaky voice. She didn't have a chance to answer before Mom and Dad entered the hall from the kitchen. Girls, what's... Mom's voice cut off when she caught sight of Liam in the doorway. Mr. and Mrs. Henley, Liam greeted with a nod of his head, like he already knew for certain who my parents were. The least he could do was say their names with some respect, considering he was at their house. But he sounded more bored than anything, like he was forcing himself to be formal. Come inside, Amelia offered. Hold on, Dad objected before Liam had a chance to move. What's this about? I'm from Arenda Academy, Liam said. I've been assigned to escort Sophia. No. Mom cut him off. Absolutely not. If you think we're going to let some Coigny come and take Sophia, I'm not Coigny. Liam spat, as if the word was poison on his tongue. I'm Toakwa. Can we not have this conversation out in the open? Amelia grabbed a handful of Liam's shirt and dragged him inside. She slammed the door behind him. I whirled toward my parents. I thought I wasn't going to Arenda Academy. I still hadn't decided if it was something I wanted to do. Amelia kept saying it was where I was meant to be but according to my parents, I'd be facing some unknown danger there. I wasn't exactly excited about throwing myself straight into harm's way without knowing what I'd be up against, no matter how much I wanted to spite my parents. You aren't, Mom said with certainty. She turned to Liam. How did the school find out about Sophia? Liam's jaw tightened. I don't know. They didn't tell me. I did. Amelia stepped forward. I told them about Sophia. Mom's hands clutched over her chest, horrified. Amelia, what have you done? I realize you're trying to protect our family from a lifetime of shame, Amelia said. But Sophia has to go. She has to find her familiar. If she doesn't, you don't know what will happen if she goes to that school, Dad roared. Everyone's eyes went wide in stunned silence, except Liam, who still looked bored. My dad was always a gentle person, so to hear him yell, it was unusual, to say the least. 
Dad's tone softened. There's more going on here than you realize. Then tell us, Amelia demanded. Dad's gaze dropped. It's complicated. How can you say that? Amelia cried. Nothing's more important than your familiar bond. You should both know that. How could you hide this from her? What were you planning to do when the day came for Sophia to bond and she didn't have a familiar to bond with? Mom and Dad both dropped their heads. I steadied myself against the banister in the hallway, trying to keep my heart from racing a million miles per hour. I couldn't stand that they were fighting over me. If I knew what to do, I'd step in and end this argument right then and there. But the fact was, I had no clue if I was supposed to side with my parents or with Amelia. We knew it would happen eventually, Mom said in a near whisper. We just didn't know what to do about it. We were hoping we had more time. She's 18, Amelia shouted, as if it was obvious their time was up. Liam cleared his throat, and all eyes turned to him. If I may, the elders are aware of your crimes. Crimes? Oh, crap. Were my parents criminals? They're willing to pardon you if you let Sophia come to Arenda Academy, Liam continued. That being said, she will be attending, one way or another. I'd suggest you take the deal the elders are offering. My head swam with the information Liam just revealed. They'd get me to that school one way or another. What were they going to do? Hold me prisoner? Take me by force? This was all too much. My knees could no longer hold me up, and I sank onto the bottom stair next to the door. If you don't mind, I'd rather not get involved with your family affairs, Liam said. I'll give Sophia time to pack her bags and say her goodbyes. I'll be waiting at the coffee shop three blocks from here. If she's not there in three hours, I'll be forced to contact the elders. If you decide to run, they'll be shortly behind you. Was he threatening us? Ugh, this guy was a total jackass. Cross me off the fan club list. I wasn't going anywhere with him. Liam turned on his heel and swung the front door open. We all stared, dumbfounded, behind him. It wasn't until the sound of the door slamming stopped echoing in my ears that Amelia finally broke the silence. I can't believe you two, she snarled at my parents. I didn't hear their reply because I shot to my feet and raced up the stairs. I needed a moment alone to absorb what just happened. In the safety of my own room, I finally had a chance to run everything over in my mind. I tugged my hair tie from my ponytail and paced back and forth across the room. I'm an elementi. My parents are criminals. I'm being forced to go to Arenda Academy. Otherwise, my parents will be punished, I whispered to myself. Saying it out loud didn't help ease my nerves. How did my world change so much in just a matter of a few days? A light knock came at my door. Before I could tell whoever it was to give me a moment of peace, Amelia poked her head into my room. Hey, Sophia, she said softly. I fell onto my bed and buried my face in my hands. What's happening, Amelia? I heard her cross the carpet and felt the weight of her body as she sat beside me on the bed. I expected her to hug me or something, but I wasn't sure I wanted her to. Though she'd been the most understanding about all of this, she was still a part of it. She didn't touch me, though. I know I don't have any clue on what you're going through, Amelia said. But I really think you need to follow Liam to Arenda Academy. Why? I asked, my voice muffled in my hands. I could just run away. Somewhere the element I couldn't find me. Because you need to find your familiar, Amelia pressed. I don't care about that, I said. I know you can't understand yet how important this is for you. Amelia's voice was soft, sad. But if you can't do it for yourself, do it for mom and dad. 
I finally lifted my gaze to meet hers. What will they do to them if I don't go? Amelia swallowed. My guess is they'd kill their familiars. It's the worst thing that can happen to an elementi, to lose your familiar. Worse even than death. This was so wrong. The elders or whatever couldn't force me to go. Except they could, and they were. Bruno and Oliver would be killed, and Mom and Dad would never be the same. I couldn't do that to them, even though they had lied to me. Just keep your head down like you always have, Amelia advised. Steer clear of Doya, and don't get yourself into any trouble. That should be easy for you. True, considering I'd pretty much been invisible my whole life. I had every intention of staying invisible. Here. Amelia shoved a pair of folded jeans toward me. I hadn't even realized she'd been holding them. The jeans we'd been fighting over. Am, I can't. Take them, Sophia, she demanded. Take them, and think of me every time you wear them. I couldn't believe this was happening. I didn't even realize I'd made a decision, until I reached out and took the jeans. I should probably say goodbye to Mom and Dad, I whispered. No, Amelia insisted. Even though they lied to you, they still love you. They'd risk their lives and their familiars for you. You have to leave before they realize it. My heart broke into a million pieces. But instead of feeling pain rip through my chest, I only felt numb. That numb sensation was probably the only thing that got me to rise from the bed and begin packing with Amelia. Arenda Academy, I hope you're worth it. Chapter 5 I hated coffee, but I needed it to keep me awake because I'd been up for the past three days. I rubbed my face and stared at the stain on the table in the coffee shop. At this hour, no one was in here but me. I'd been waiting forever. I told Sophia to meet me here hours ago. What was taking so long? Elders be damned. I wasn't going to waste my time waiting for some spoiled prep to figure out she wanted to grow up and join the real world. I was about to get up and get back on the ship to Orenda Academy when the door opened. In stepped Sophia. She had a duffel bag full of clothes and a lost puppy dog look. She was hot, I guess. Long, chestnut brown hair, chocolate eyes, and a body that was totally bang-worthy. She caught my gaze. Ripples ricocheted in a shock wave through my stomach. Then I remembered who I was and everything inside me shut down. No girl wanted to be with someone like me, a crippled failure who'd lost their familiar. Besides, she was Coigny. I was Toaqua. Never going to happen. Amelia wasn't with her this time, thank the ancestors. Sophia sat down at my table and went to speak, but I got up and ordered her something. She looked like a chai latte kind of girl. I pressed it into her hands and she looked down at it. Thanks, she looked up. But I don't drink. You're going to need it, I told her. The walk to the ship is cold. Ship, she echoed. I resisted rolling my eyes. Oh, never mind, I didn't think she was hot. She was annoying and completely clueless. I couldn't stand people who weren't on top of things, and Sophia was about a hundred pages behind everyone else. I'd be babysitting a toddler until we got back to school. She reminded me of a little kid, and that's exactly what I'd call her. Follow me, Polly. She trailed me, sipping at her latte. I carried her duffel bag, though the weight of it instantly brought my fatigue surging back. Do you need help? She caught me, struggling. I got it, I told her as we exited the coffee shop and started down the street. I wasn't about to let her think I couldn't carry a duffel bag, though it was getting really hard to keep faking it. A duffel bag full of clothes felt like a military backpack weighing me down. Being disabled was a real pain in the ass. We got out of the city limits and into the desert. 
Sophia hesitated when she reached the town sign. She touched it, then looked back at her old home. Well, come on, I said. I was trying not to gasp for breath and trying to act normal, but it was hard. I'm not going to abduct you. Sophia snorted and shoved past me. You couldn't abduct me if you tried. Sadly, she was probably right. We walked a mile into the desert, which might as well have been ten miles for me. I kept up a brave face so she didn't notice that my body was screaming. When the lights of the town had dissolved behind us, I dropped the duffel bag and struggled not to drop to my knees, looking up. I took the golden pass out of my pocket and waved it in the air. Sophia looked at me like I was crazy. We waited a few minutes. The desert was chilly at night. Sophia shivered. I told the cold to piss off. What? What are we waiting for? She asked reluctantly. That, I told her. My eyes never left the sky as the clouds parted. Sophia jumped as the blaring horn of a ship coming into port echoed all around us. Her mouth dropped open, and I grinned. From the sky descended a massive cruise liner over a thousand feet in length, equally as tall and weighing 200,000 tons. The ship was painted white with elements of stark gold here and there. Sophia went to run, but I grabbed her arm and held her in place as the massive ship descended. It could fit over 10,000 passengers, along with 2,000 crew members, but there were rarely that many people on it. Elementi only used it when they wanted to go on vacations, mostly, and when the government insiders needed to get back home. It wasn't meant to transport students, yet here we were. The ship came to a slow park in front of us, the bottom suspended about a hundred feet in the air, before two elementi on the ship's sides waved their hands. The earth jutted up above us and formed steps, a staircase made out of desert dirt, rock, and sand that met the cruise ship's platform. Two familiars, a pegasus and a toucan, both landed on the ground beside the earth staircase and bowed to us. Welcome to the Ho's Ho, the Elementi's premier cruise ship, I told her. It's how we'll be getting to the academy. It, it... Her mouth bobbed up and down like a fish's. Yes, Pawi, it can fly, I told her. Hurry up. Sophia grabbed her bag before I could, thank the ancestors, and ran after me. I began the climb up the long, torturous staircase, which was the last thing I needed after that walk. Why are you going so slow? Sophia complained behind me. Shut up. I was already out of breath. We finally reached the top, and an elementi reached out her hand. May I take that bag for you and deliver it to your cabin, miss? She asked Sophia. Um, Sophia started. We'll be staying overnight. It's a long flight to the academy, I told her. Not to mention this big-ass ship doesn't move very fast. Sophia handed off her bag, and I gestured for her to follow me. The staircase was pushed back into the earth, the doors closed behind us, and the hose ho rattled as it rose into the sky once more. Sophia clung to the railing like a cat, shaking and terrified. I rolled my eyes this time. Come on, I grabbed her arm again and hauled her after me, from the deck and into the inside of the ship. Sophia's head went from this way to that as she tried to take in all of her surroundings and failed. The carpet was lush green with swirling designs, and the walls were wooden paneling with gold railings. We passed all sorts of shops, such as rare jewelers, clothing stores, and places that sold souvenirs and chocolates. I think the elementi with their familiars is what impressed her the most. She had to be careful to avoid accidentally stepping on anyone in the crowded hallway. Elementi had birds on their shoulders, or small animals like rabbits or chinchillas in their arms. Dogs followed at the heels of their elementi, while big cats like tigers and jaguars stuck together, yowling as if they were having some sort of conversation. Sophia had to press to the wall to let a moose with antlers that were as wide as the hallway pass by. Above us and embedded in the ceiling was a huge inner tube filled with water, 
water creatures like manatees and otters swam to where they needed to go. Once a unicorn shoved her out of the way. Sophia went to pet it, but I grabbed her hand. Don't touch another person's familiar without permission, I told her sharply. It's not allowed. Yip, like watching a toddler. I dragged her out of the hallway and onto the deck where it was more quiet. All around us was the murky gray of the clouds and a touch of condensation, a hint of the Toaqua on board doing their job. She gasped when I led her to the main lobby. A crystal chandelier hung from the center, opening up to a massive ballroom with stained glass windows and a shiny wooden dance floor. A classical band played soft music while attendants checked in guests. I gave our passes to the elementi at the front desk, who handed us two key cards. Sophia wasn't paying attention. She was twirling around on the dance floor like a princess in a fairy tale. It's gorgeous, Sophia said, looking around. It's something. I'd been riding the hose ho since I was a kid, but it still never failed to impress me. They were always adding more and more onto it. I was pretty sure there was a movie theater and an ice rink somewhere in here. Personally, I'd been fine with the water park. I'd been on the ship a million times over the years, and I still hadn't seen everything. The ship bobbed up and down like a real cruise liner would, only it rode the air currents instead of the waves. I was a Toaqua, so I was immune to getting seasick, but Sophia looked a little green. Come on, let's get something to eat, I told her. But I just had dinner, she protested. Yeah, well, good for you, I didn't. I led her to my favorite restaurant, known for native Hawkeye food. It was late, so we didn't have to wait for a table. We sat on the deck outside the restaurant and watched the tiny hydras and dolphins playing in the pool below. Their elementi swam and chatted in the water. They were Toaqua, so they manipulated the water to splash each other, causing many waves. Their happy screams made me remember what I'd lost. You want anything? I asked, looking up from my menu. She shook her head. No, I'm fine. Well, that's not happening, I muttered. She needed some food in her to combat the sickness. Riding the hose ho on an empty stomach was a recipe for disaster, and I wasn't going to be holding the trash can all night for this girl. I'd seen her plate when I'd gotten to her house. She'd barely eaten her dinner. She had to be starving by now. The waiter came back, and I said, I'd like the salted salmon with a side of buffalo stew. She'll have some acorn bread and ginger ale. Liam, I don't. I gave her a look, and she shut up. I handed the waiter our menus. He came back with the acorn bread a moment later, and I nudged it toward Sophia. Go on, it'll help. She nibbled on it, and I noticed the green in her skin subsided. She ate half of the loaf, and I grinned. She'd lied about not being hungry. When her ginger ale was half gone, she put down the drink and sighed. Thanks, I do feel a little better now. I smiled. Good. By this time, my food was out. I was a gross eater, a true carnivore, but there was no shame in it. I really didn't care if people thought I was nasty. I inhaled the soup and started tearing into the salmon with my bare hands seconds after, chewing loudly. There was sauce smeared on the side of my cheek. Sophia stared at me with a disgusted look on her face, her nose wrinkled and lip curled. I was starving. That was the only thing worth sticking around for anymore. The food. I put the plates aside and wiped my face. Sophia was giggling. What? I asked, throwing the napkin down. Nothing. The waiter took the plates away and Sophia stared at me. So, I've been meaning to ask you a few questions. Oh, goody. Uh, like what? Well, for starters... <laughs> How the heck is this thing flying around, and why hasn't anyone noticed it yet? It's a huge cruise ship, she belted. The Yapluma used the power of air to keep the ship flying and afloat, while Toaqua moved clouds in front of the liner so it isn't spotted by outsiders, I informed her. The Coigny keep the boiler room running so the rudder has control over where the ship is directed. 
the Navita help it land and build the staircase. We all worked together to make the ship possible. That's weird. Amelia made it sound like the different houses hated each other, Sophia said. She's not wrong. Amelia was exaggerating. Yapluma and Nevita are opposites as air and earth, but they get along fine. Like I said, we all need to work together to stay alive and underground. I'm guessing fire and water don't mix, Sophia asked. There was a rolling in my stomach and I shook my head. No, to be honest, it would be weird for people at school to see you, a uh, Coigny, talking to me, a Tawakwa, outside of class. She nodded glumly. My house sounds terrible. I wanted to high-five her, but I gave her a diplomatic answer instead, because it's what my dad would expect me to do. Our entire world is about unity. We need each other to keep our society running, I informed her. That's why most of the Elementi live together in the area around Orenda Academy. I thought Elementi would be all over the world. She sat upright. No, there are some Elementi spread around the Earth and throughout the world governments. They're put there to keep our world secret. But most of the Elementi live together in Northern California, which is where we're going. It's uh, unheard of for an Elementi to be away from the tribe like your family is... I eyed her. Tribe? she questioned. All Elementi come from one ancient tribe, the Hawkeye. We still follow their customs and live in the same area they originated from long ago. Like Native Americans? She stared at me blankly. There are many indigenous societies. All of them have their own traditions and are very different. The Hawkeye are no exception, I said. I've never heard of the Hawkeye before, they weren't in any history books I read, Sophia replied. We don't let in outsiders for a reason. Keeping our culture and stories secret is one of the only reasons our people are still alive. I crossed my arms. Amelia said something like that. She looked away from me. But I notice all the Elementi look different. I sighed. We, that includes you, have married and intermingled with many different cultures throughout the centuries. Oh, she sipped at her latte again. It was taking her forever to finish it. It was getting on my nerves. She didn't ask any more questions about the original tribe, which made it obvious she was the type of person that didn't care about history or tradition. Oh, we were going to get along splendidly. And by splendidly, I meant not at all. Are there other magic people in the world? Sophia asked. Or are there just elementi? There are a few groups who have magical powers, but none of them can bond with animals like Elementi can, and their magic is different. Only we control the elements. Our kind doesn't associate with them. We keep to ourselves. I feel like I'm so far behind. She dropped her eyes. Tell me about it. You'll catch up, Polly, I promise. Why do you keep calling me that? Her eyebrows knitted together. Polly? It means little child, I told her, smirking. Because you act like such a kid. Thanks, Sophia said sourly. It made me smile more. What I didn't tell her was there was another meaning behind the word too. But that was a secret. I stood. It's nearly midnight. We should really get to bed. The ship will come into port early tomorrow. Sophia followed me out of the restaurant. The traffic had started to die down, and many Elementi had returned to their cabins. We were basically alone out here. I rounded a corner before Sophia did. I stopped in my tracks when I saw a large lioness prowling the deck, her eyes searching for something. Naomi. I'd seen her, but she hadn't seen me. Yet, I didn't have anything to hide. I was bringing Sophia back like Madame Doya wanted. There was no reason for her familiar to bother me. Even so, just being around Naomi made me feel like a criminal, like I had something to hide. Dad always said to follow my instincts. I wasn't about to question them now. Before Sophia knew what was happening, I latched onto her, then dragged her behind a collection of lifeboats with parachutes, hugging her tightly to my body. Sophia screamed. I slapped my hand over her mouth and whispered, Be quiet. Someone's coming. 
Sophia's eyes widened when she saw the cat. Then she went silent. Naomi stopped in front of the lifeboats, then raised her nose to sniff the air. Her lip curled, and she made a rumbling noise of discontentment before she moved on, her steps heavy with intent. I didn't breathe until the lioness was gone. What was Naomi doing here? Madame Doya was at the school. Why were they separated? Sophia kept quiet until I let her go. We stepped out from behind the lifeboats, and Sophia cried, what the heck is that stupid cat doing here? You know her? My eyes widened. Yeah, that cat attacked me and my sister when we were hiking in the woods the other day, Sophia explained. Was anyone with her? I asked quickly. A woman? Not that I know of, Sophia said slowly. I just thought she was wild. She must be a familiar. She seemed really focused on my sister. My mind raced. What the hell had Amelia Henley been up to while she was at school? That cat is Madame Doya's familiar, I told her. I'm assuming you don't know her? No, but Amelia mentioned her. Sophia tapped her chin with a finger, thinking. You mean to tell me that the lion who attacked me and Madame Doya are bonded? Yes. But Amelia told me it was just a mountain lion, she said quietly. She should have known that was Madame Doya's familiar, she took classes with her. Naomi is an African lioness, not a mountain. Amelia knows who she is. She lied to you. I had to be blunt. Sophia deserved to know the truth. She lied? Again? Sophia deflated. Her face went into a pitiful, upset look. There has to be a reason for it. I struggled to recover because even though I didn't like Amelia, I knew Sophia loved her and I really didn't want to get in the middle of family drama. Maybe she was just trying to protect you. Maybe, Sophia chewed her lip. But why not tell me the truth? What was she trying to protect me from? I hesitated. Your guess is as good as mine. This wasn't good. Madame Doya and Naomi couldn't be separated. If they were apart, it meant that they were looking into something important. Amelia had been poking her nose in places where it didn't belong, and I didn't like it. Sophia crossed her arms. Why would Madame Doya send her familiar after us? I could think of a few good reasons, but I shrugged and said, I don't know. She didn't seem satisfied with my answer. I led Sophia to her cabin. She used the key card to get in. Inside, there were dozens of little familiars making everything perfect. Hummingbirds plumped the pillows and straightened out the sheets, while monkeys and lemurs polished the mirrors and floors. They bowed to us as we came in before they scuttled away. I noticed that the elders had spared no expense in Sophia's room. It was one of the nicest suites on the ship with a king-sized bed, a mini bar, a living room area collected around a fireplace, and a window that showed the clouds sailing by. She even got a kitchen, something my suite didn't have. Her duffel bag had been placed on the dresser. I noticed a pair of her pajamas had been neatly folded and set out for her immediate use. She took a peek in the bathroom and squealed when she saw a jacuzzi big enough to fit four people. There was also a vanity and a widescreen TV inside the room. I'm pretty sure her toilet was one of those weird ones that talks to you. I myself was looking forward to getting into my own jacuzzi tonight and not coming out for a really, really long time. My body was sore. A raccoon wearing a sailor's hat and an apron pushed a little cart into the room. He handed Sophia a warm towel scented with lavender and a tiny box of chocolates. Thank you, she told him. The raccoon tottered out with his cart and shut the door behind him. Now that's what I call service, she said in a bright voice. She squealed happily before jumping on the bed. By the ancestors, this girl was lame and really cheesy. Why couldn't she just be cool? My room is right across the hall if you need anything, I told her. I really hope she didn't come by. My duty was done as far as I was concerned. I think I'm just going to hit the hay, she told me. I resisted snorting. She got off the bed and stood in front of me. Thanks for showing me around, Liam. I really appreciate it. This ship is incredible. Don't get used to it. 
Like I said, I'm right across from you if you need anything. She beamed at me, and I felt funny again, but it was probably just my nausea kicking in. I always felt sick after I ate these days. I headed across the room to my suite and filled up my tub, grabbing a beer out of the mini fridge. I wasn't supposed to drink anymore because it would probably make me feel worse, but screw it. Maybe the alcohol would help me sleep for the first time in days. I laughed a little when I thought of Sophia. She was so naive. If she thought the ship was awesome, she hadn't seen anything yet. Just wait till she got to the castle. Chapter 6 The cruise ship horn blared, sending a wave of disappointment over me. Liam and I stood on the deck as the ship descended into port the next day. What's wrong? Liam asked with a heavy sigh. This ship is just so magical, I replied. I'm not ready to leave. He scoffed. What? I asked. Had I said something wrong? He just shook his head. You've got a lot to learn, Pawi. Liam pointed over the railing. I peeked over the edge, and what I saw took my breath away. Welcome to Kenpago, Liam said. Below, the clouds parted. Tall mountain peaks rose around us, but they were different from the mountains back home. These were covered with tall trees and lush greenery, and the caps were painted with snow. In the distance, a waterfall cascaded down the side of the mountain. To my other side, the ocean reached out to the horizon. A city with winding streets stretched far across the valley. The buildings were short, no more than two or three stories high, and most were hidden beneath a thick layer of trees. There were all sorts of houses, but they were unlike any houses I'd ever seen. They were almost like elaborate huts with stucco walls and thatch roofs. The streets were dirt, and there weren't any cars, just carriages pulled by an array of creatures like pegasi and unicorns. Thousands of people were down there, venturing in and out of little shops. It looked like a city straight out of a fairy tale. Get your bags, Liam said. It's time to go. Minutes later, we descended a long flight of stairs made from earth. I couldn't take my eyes off the city in front of me. From this vantage point, there seemed to be a unique charm to it. I had the urge to explore the entire valley. The air was chilly, in stark contrast to the dry desert air I was used to. I pulled my cardigan tighter around me as we made our way down the steps. You cold? Liam asked. Yeah, I said. It's a lot colder here than back home. Liam shrugged. You'll get used to it. Plus your coigny, so it should be easy for you to stay warm. I barely heard what he said, since the city once again stole my attention as we got up close. At the base of the staircase, vendors lined the street, like we were walking straight into a magical farmer's market. I saw one group in a unicorn-drawn carriage. Another guy rode on the back of a huge beast that looked like a bear with horns. Large plants of all shapes and colors, bigger than even some houses, bloomed out of gorgeous painted pots. Streamers and banners, along with little stringed lights, crisscrossed over our heads and connected to various buildings. Every shop looked different, some with hand-painted signs and others with ones that looked like they were made of metal. It was like everywhere I looked there was a different color or something else going on. There were so many different smells, like bread cooking and cinnamon and other spices. I heard music coming from all directions, along with laughter and conversation. It was so loud I had trouble hearing myself think. You're in the center of the city, where you'll find most of the stores, restaurants, and shops. All your magical needs can be supplied here, Liam said, like he wanted to get this over with. Behind us, near the cruise port, are offices and shopping centers. Each part of Kinpago is split into various cultural districts, though the Hawkeye District, the one we're now in, is the largest. For example, the Latin District is directly on the left, three blocks down, and on the other side is the Gay Quarter. About a mile down Main Street is Chinatown. You can find Little Bavaria on the other side. 
Liam rattled on and on about all the areas of Kenpago so quickly that it was tough for me to keep up with him. It seemed like every country from around the world was packed into the crooked streets and small spaces. People of all colors and nationalities crowded the streets, dressed in everything from casual daywear to traditional clothes from various places around the world. Were they really all descended from the Hawkeye tribe? Everyone looked so different. I'd never been in a place so culturally diverse. I didn't realize Kinpago would be so big, I said, glancing around in wonder. Liam shrugged. There are maybe 10, 15,000 people per tribe. Tribe? I asked. There are more than just the Hawkeye here? No, we're all Hawkeye, Liam answered, sounding irritated. I'm referring to the four houses, earth, water, fire, and air. Oh, I said, but I was quickly distracted. The only things more beautiful than the people were the familiars. They came in all shapes and sizes, their fur purple and blue and sometimes multicolored. Elephants with rainbow manes and purple skin walked beside cats that had scales. A four-legged mammal the size of a horse, but that looked like a weasel with a large furry white mane and feathers, blinked at me before its elementi called her, and she vanished before my very eyes. I was pretty sure there weren't even names for some of these gorgeous creatures. They were things I hadn't even imagined seeing in storybooks. In the middle of the street, a man in a beautiful outfit that was embroidered with beads and decorated with feathers danced to a couple of street musicians playing on flutes and drums. I wanted to stop to watch, but Liam grabbed my wrist and dragged me behind him. I resisted his hold, my pace slowing to take it all in. A nearby booth buzzed with small critters. They were the color of emerald tiger beetles with wings like dragonflies. They glowed a soft yellow, blinking on and off like fireflies. Fortune fairies, the guy behind the booth shouted. Get your fortune fairies, said to bring you good luck and change your future. I took a step toward them, but I didn't make it far before Liam tugged on my arm. Hey, I protested. I just wanted to see what they looked like up close. Don't waste your money, Liam said. Fortune fairies are easy enough to catch on your own. Besides, they don't bring fortune to everyone. While he spoke, my eyes fell upon a white, winged stallion ahead of us. My breath left my chest, and I stopped right there in the middle of the street. Children swarmed the pegasus and petted its soft white fur. The sign in front of its stall advertised pegasus rides. Nearby, a kid cried because his mom wouldn't let him ride the pony. I turned to Liam, who didn't look happy that I'd stopped again. I thought you weren't supposed to touch someone else's familiar. You aren't, he confirmed. That pegasus isn't bonded yet. I wanted to ask if it would ever bond, but before I could, a voice cut through the crowd. Mr. Mito, a male voice called. Not interested, Jones, Liam replied. I turned to see who he was talking to and another wave of amazement overcame me. At this point, I was probably going to pass out from sheer overwhelm before we made it to the school. An older guy with a lot of muscle stood on the other side of the street, holding the reins on two massive beasts. The front half of the beast looked like a stag, with a long nose and pointed antlers. The back half resembled a bird, with strong legs, sharp talons, and massive feathered wings. It even had a beautiful plumed tail spanning out behind it. What is it? I whispered in wonder. They're Perryton, Liam said, like they weren't interesting in the slightest. Half deer, half bird. What was this guy's problem? Was he so used to this place that he could no longer appreciate the magic in it? Mr. Mito, Jones repeated in a whining voice. We don't have the money. Liam told Jones before he could get another word in, though it sounded like a lie. Not to worry, Jones responded, taking no notice to Liam's rude tone. These Perryton have already been reserved, courtesy of Elliot Bain. They're to take you up to Arenda. Bain, thanks the ancestors, Liam mumbled under his breath. 
His shoulders relaxed. He led me closer to Jones until we were close enough to touch the periton. The one closest to me stared down with his big, dark eyes. He was a large beast, but there was a gentle quality in his eyes. I was just about to reach out and touch him when a set of hands wrapped around my waist and swept me off my feet. I let out a yelp on instinct. Up you go, Joan's voice said in my ear. Before I knew what was happening, I was straddling the periton with my knees tucked under his wings. Jones placed the reins in my hands, then adjusted the strap on my duffel bag so that it draped securely across my body. You're in good hands with Bud here. Jones patted the periton's neck. Just hang on tight and don't startle him. But wait, I started to say. Jones smacked Bud's behind and the creature lurched forward. My stomach dropped and a shot of adrenaline rushed through my chest as we launched into the air. A scream tore out of my lungs. Within seconds, the market was far below us, and the people looked like nothing more than ants. Relax, Liam shouted over the sound of the air whipping past my ears. He looked more comfortable on the other periton's back than I'd ever seen him in the short time I'd known him. I think even a slight smile graced his expression. I quieted and the fear in my body slowly eased. Even with the flapping of the periton's wings, I felt strangely secure on his back. Laughter bubbled up from my chest. I think I can get used to this. We flew over the city and toward the ocean, but we didn't reach it before the periton shifted course, soaring parallel to the mountain range. As the town disappeared behind us, a large clearing came into view. A castle, bigger than the state capital back home, stood at the center. Pointed stone towers stretched into the air above the trees. The walls were long, sturdy, and thick. Hundreds of ornate stained-glass windows were placed here and there. Within the castle walls there were keeps that stretched high above the towers, while gargoyles of various familiars sat perched along the castle's walls. The castle itself was surrounded by a series of narrow rivers and tall waterfalls. The sunlight glistened off the water droplets at the base of the tallest waterfall, creating a rainbow. A large open patch of grass stretched out in front of the school's main doors, filled with flowers and elaborate fountains. There were hundreds of kids and familiars down there, chatting excitedly with each other as they entered the school. A roar caught my attention. My stomach lurched as I saw dragons, actual dragons, soaring in a circle around the castle. They weren't alone. Other flying magical creatures, like griffins and manticores, flew above the castle and played with each other, pretending to fight or making loud noises like they were chatting. Holy crap! Amelia made Arenda Academy sound magical, but she didn't tell me I'd be attending something this spectacular. Our periton circled around a courtyard near the tallest tower. Birds of all different sizes and colors soared above the courtyard, while creatures followed behind their elementi as they crossed the lawn. I caught sight of another pegasus, and I saw what I swore was a huge feathered serpent slither behind someone and into the open doors at the front of the school. Bud swooped down so fast that I was afraid we'd crash straight into the ground, but he pulled back at the last second and landed gracefully at the center of the courtyard. Liam's periton landed behind Bud, and he slipped off its back with ease. Meanwhile, I was acutely aware of all the eyes on me. Liam reached up to help me off the periton's back. I placed my hands on his shoulders to steady myself, shivering slightly as his hands touched my hips to lift me off. As soon as I landed, the Peritons took off again and went back the way we came. Once I was on the ground, Liam let go of me like I was a hot potato. Liam started for the grand double doors, but I remained rooted in place. The whole courtyard had gone quiet. At least a hundred pairs of eyes locked on me. Is that her? Someone whispered. Liam hurried back to my side. Are you coming? I still couldn't move. 
it didn't seem right when I was being ogled at like a zoo animal. Why's everyone staring? I asked under my breath. We don't often get outsiders, Liam explained. Great, I'd already been pegged an outcast. You know, they'd stop staring if you followed me to your dorm, Liam said. I was just about to take him up on that offer when a girl with long black hair and manicured eyebrows stepped forward. She wore skin-tight black pants that showed off her curves and an orange top that accented her chest. Her liquid eyeliner and perfect contouring made it look like she spent hours every morning painting on her face. A group of five stood behind her, two girls and three guys. They all had the same tan skin and I'm hot and I know it look. A large, beautiful red bird landed on the girl's shoulder. Her tail feathers were so long they trailed on the ground, and she had a feathery plume on her head, which accented black eyes. You must be Sophia Henley, the girl said with a smile. I'm Haley. I'm from your house, Coigny. Despite the look of disgust on Liam's face, I shook her outstretched hand. It was only polite. So, is it true? Haley asked in a tone that had gossip written all over it. I glanced to Liam warily. Is what true? For the ancestors' sake, she just got here, Liam snapped at Haley. Could you let her get settled in before you start interrogating her? Haley narrowed her eyes at him. I wasn't asking you. I think Sophia can speak for herself. Yeah, I can, I agreed. Liam growled. But I have no idea what you're talking about, I added. Haley crossed her arms. Rumor has it you're the one the prophecy talks about, if the prophecy is to be believed, that is. She had to be kidding. I mean, prophecies weren't a real thing. Then again, I had no idea what was real anymore after what I'd seen recently. Like you said, it's just a rumor, Liam reminded her. No one even believes the prophecy. Someone made it up just to scare the houses. Maybe Sophia can confirm it for us, Haley argued. She looked to me for a response. Look, I didn't know what to say. This girl was talking crazy. No one mentioned a prophecy to me. See, Liam said. Now, would you let her rest? She's had a long journey. Haley's lips tightened. I don't take orders from people like you. Liam's nostrils flared. He opened his mouth, but I cut in before things could escalate any further. Actually, I said, I'd just like to get checked into my dorm, but maybe later you can tell me more about this prophecy. I wasn't betting on it. Haley didn't seem like the kind of girl I'd hang out with. She held her nose so high that she'd drown in a rainstorm. Liam left without saying another word. I hurried to follow. What does she mean by people like you? I asked once we were out of earshot. Liam hesitated but answered anyway. In our society, the stronger your familiar is, the higher you stand on the social ladder. She's Coigny and her familiar is a phoenix. She outranks just about everyone at this school. That seems unfair, I said. Shouldn't social status depend on your intelligence and accomplishments? Liam didn't get a chance to answer. A fluffy red critter darted between his legs. He stumbled and cursed under his breath. The creature stopped several feet away and sat, curling its bushy tail around itself. A fox. It looked up at Liam with bright eyes. Sassy! A curvy girl in the strangest outfit I'd ever seen approached us. She wore a bright green tutu with striped pink tights and blue sneakers. Her shirt was black with purple polka dots. At least five thick bangle bracelets hung from each wrist. She wore her hair in pigtails, a giant sunflower pinned to her head between them. Her hair was strawberry blonde. She stood out, even when you stripped away the quirky Dr. Seuss look. Leave the poor guy alone, sassy, the girl scolded the fox. 
She bent to scoop up her familiar, but the fox leapt from her arms and made a break for it. The courtyard buzzed with conversation again, but there were still a lot of eyes on us. Quirky girl didn't seem to notice, or didn't seem to care, as she chased Sassy between a group of nearby people. She dove forward to catch her familiar, but it dodged out of the way. She sprang to her feet and didn't seem to notice she was covered in dirt. Haley's group pointed and laughed. Sassy, if you don't get back here, you're sleeping in the woods tonight, quirky girl threatened. You know what are in the woods, don't you? Big dragons. Sassy darted between the legs of a tall, muscular guy. He stood on the outer edge of a small huddle of students who were no longer paying attention. Quirky girl dropped to the ground and stuck her head right between the guy's knees. Liam tried to stifle his laughter next to me. I just watched in horror. How embarrassing. What the? The guy glanced beneath him. Quirky girl dragged her fox out of the crowd and rose, as if totally forgetting anyone else was there. The top of her head smacked right into the center of the guy's crotch, like full sunflower pressed firmly onto dick. I cringed. It was like watching a train wreck. I couldn't take my eyes off it. What the hell? The guy cried. He jumped away from her and grabbed one of his friends to use as a human shield. Quirky Girl's eyes widened. Oh, my ancestors, I am so sorry. I was just, my familiar is, you need to put that thing on a leash, Imogen. Haley clipped each syllable in the girl's name as she made her way over. Her cronies followed behind her. Imogen got to her feet. That's cruel, and you know it. That thing is a hazard, Haley snapped. People who can't control their familiars shouldn't have them. She is not. Imogen pulled the fox closer to her chest. She's just playful. Come on, Liam said from beside me. Let's go. Hold on, I objected. I dropped my bag at my feet and bent to my knees beside it. I dug inside for an extra tote bag I'd brought with me. I thought it would come in handy if I wanted to haul stuff with me to the beach or something. It was light blue, with bright pink flowers all over it. It would suit Imogen perfectly. Liam groaned when he saw me pull it out. I ignored him and walked across the courtyard, abandoning him with my stuff. That thing needs someone to actually train it, Haley was saying when I approached. I cleared my throat. Um, Imogen? The whole crowd turned to look at me. Whereas everyone else's expression hardened when they saw me, Imogen's softened. Would this work? I held the tote bag out to her. You can keep Sassy by your side, but she can still jump out and run around when she wants to. Imogen's face brightened. That's brilliant! Thank you so much! I opened the bag, and Imogen gently placed Sassy inside. She swung the bag over her shoulder and twisted from side to side as if she was modeling it. Sassy peeked out of the top of the bag, looking positively content. Haley looked me up and down. She was not pleased with my solution. Better? Imogen asked her mockingly, like it didn't matter to her at all what Haley thought. Haley pursed her lips. I hope it suffocates. The crowd drew a collective breath. But the following laughter told me more people agreed with her than were shocked by her heartlessness. And you, Haley pointed at me. Be careful about who you stick up for. It could reflect badly on our house. I'll let it pass this time because you don't know any better. Your house has enough of a reputation, Liam said from behind me. I hadn't realized he'd followed me. I don't think the friends Sophia makes is going to change anything. Haley stared him down, but turned to me instead. Just know that you've been warned. Blood is thicker than water around here. Haley turned on her heel, and the crowd dispersed. Liam handed me my duffel bag. Can we finally go? I glanced to Imogen, who was petting Sassy and looked thrilled with her bag. Yeah, I said, slinging the strap over my body. 
Wait, Imogen called when we were several paces away. Thank you. No problem, I told her, waving back to her and Sassy. Imogen grabbed Sassy's paw and helped her wave to me. I turned away and followed Liam across the lawn, finally entering the castle. He led me up the big stone staircase to a pair of doors three times my height. If I thought this world couldn't get any more magical, I was wrong. The doors opened up to a huge white foyer that stretched five stories high, with a big gold chandelier hanging in the center. Balconies on every level wrapped around the foyer. The marble floor was dotted with large area rugs and big, comfy chairs. Ahead of us, a huge, grand staircase led to the second level. Tapestries and elaborate paintings hung from every inch of the wall, and a fireplace big enough to hold a dragon burned in the center. Suits of armor stood at attention around the doors and the fireplace. What? How? I couldn't manage to find the words as I tried to take in the splendor of it all. Liam didn't slow his pace. How could he not just stop and stare? I hurried to keep up with him. It's a castle, I managed to get out, because apparently I was really good at stating the obvious. Yeah. Liam said with a shrug. But, but how? I stammered. Did you magic it here? Liam looked thoroughly unamused. No, we didn't magic it here. It was gifted to the Hawkeye long ago. Oh, I said flatly. I wished he'd explain more, but Liam kept silent. Liam led me down a long, wide hall on the second level. Tall, arched windows outlined in elaborately carved stone lined one side of the hallway. Between them stood more statues of familiars, except this time they were accompanied by statues of elementi as well. On the opposite wall hung large dreamcatchers, woven blankets, and feathered headdresses. It seemed like the castle was a mix of old medieval architecture and Native American historical pieces. Everywhere I looked, there was something more beautiful to stare at. Liam's pace slowed the farther we walked. He stayed silent the whole time. Thanks for sticking up for me back there, by the way, I said to break the silence. Yeah, well, don't get used to it, he growled. What the hell? A simple you're welcome would suffice, I responded. You're welcome, he said flatly. Minutes later, Liam stopped in front of a large set of doors. The handles were golden and were crafted in the shape of flames. They were intricate and nearly looked like the real thing. Look, he said, we're from different houses. I shouldn't be sticking up for you, and you shouldn't be sticking up for Imogen. We only work together when we have to. Haley is right. You'll alienate yourself from your house if you keep acting this way. My advice is to find yourself a coigni friend and stick close to them. Any ounce of happiness I'd found in the magic of this place instantly disappeared. I knew Amelia said you couldn't date outside your house, but you couldn't be friends either? What kind of society was this? I thought Liam said these people were all about unity. They seemed full of bullcrap to me. This is your dorm. Liam gestured to the doors beside him. It's where I leave you. Good luck. That was all he said before he started down the hall the way we came. Wait, Liam! He turned back to me, his brow furrowed. If you have any questions, ask a member of your house. The unspoken words in his tone were clear. I wasn't his problem anymore. Liam turned his back on me. Nerves twisted in my gut. How could he just leave me alone? I took a breath and stepped toward the doors. I glanced down the hall one last time to watch him go. My heart broke a little. Liam hadn't exactly been friendly since we met, but at least with him I hadn't been alone. Now the one person here who'd helped me make any sense of this place was abandoning me. Jerk. I gripped the door handle and pushed. I half expected that Liam had led me to the dungeons, but I stepped into a common room. Sunlight spilled in through a tall window, 
and through a sunroof that opened up in the ceiling. There were four fireplaces, each with plush red chairs surrounding them, and two rows of study tables in the center of the room. A flat-screen TV hung on the wall. Two long hallways split off in either direction, which I guessed led to the dorms. The room was swathed in colors of deep red, orange, and yellow. It seemed cozy and warm. At least thirty people were inside. All eyes turned to me, and the whole room quieted. Was it going to be like this every time I entered a room? I swallowed. I must have looked like a deer in the headlights. No one bothered to step up and tell me what to do. Was I supposed to claim a room or just hang out in here until my advisor showed up? The doors banged open behind me. I jumped. You can all relax, Haley said in a bored tone as she entered, followed in tow by her posse. She's not the one. She's just a bastard. Wait, what? I was so not interested in indulging in any drama. I was planning on keeping my head down, like Amelia told me to. But I had to say something. I mean, what the hell? Excuse me? I snapped. Haley crossed the room to the closest fireplace, and her phoenix fluttered behind. The two boys sitting there immediately got up, and Haley's group took their place. Haley tossed her dark hair over her shoulder and looked at me with a shocked expression. Oh, I didn't mean it in a bad way. Since when was that word not meant in a bad way? I just meant, your mom was Toakwa, wasn't she? Haley asked. You're Coigny, so she must have whored around with some Coigny guy or something. I was too stunned to move even though every fiber of my being told me to punch the girl in the face. You don't even know my mother, I snarled. Haley shrugged and turned away. A part of me wanted to reach out and pull a chunk of her hair out, but the rational part told me to walk away. At least my mom raised me right. I'm not sure you can say the same. It wasn't until everyone in the room inhaled a collective gasp that I realized I'd said it out loud. Mortified didn't even begin to describe how I felt. I wasn't the kind of girl who said things like that. Haley just gaped at me, so shocked she couldn't even respond. I wasn't about to stick around to hear whatever she came up with. I whirled around and rushed through the doors I'd just entered. The problem was, I didn't know where to go from there. Even if I missed orientation, I would have thought someone would greet me with a welcome packet or a quick tour. This place wasn't very welcoming, to say the least. I slumped down the hall and dropped my bag on the floor. My whole body shook as I leaned my shoulder up against the stone wall. The events of the last few minutes repeated over and over in my mind. It was like high school all over again. I thought I was done with that. I stared down the hall, my eyes passing over each magnificent statue and tapestry. I couldn't believe I was here. I already missed my parents. I wondered how they took the news the night I left. I hoped they were safe, and that Amelia had convinced them not to come after me. Speaking of Amelia, I reached into my bag and grabbed my phone. I found Amelia's number in my contacts and hit the call button. I just wanted to hear her voice. Maybe she could answer some of my questions, like where to pick up my class schedule. We hadn't had much time to talk about that kind of stuff once I stopped acting like a turd and actually listened to her. Hello? Amelia's voice was like music to my ears. Hey, Am. I cut off when my phone flew upward out of my hand. What the hell? I whirled around, expecting it to be some sort of hazing ritual led by Haley. Instead, I came face to face with an older woman. She had curly red hair, long lashes, and high cheekbones. Her green velvet dress hung to the floor, and she wore a ton of jewelry. The fumed expression in her eyes gave her away immediately. Madam... 
Doya. She looked just as mean and ornery as Amelia described her. And I just swore at her. Whoops. Sophia? I heard Amelia's faint voice on the other end of the line. Why are you calling me? Didn't I tell you? I didn't get a chance to hear the rest of what she said, because Madame Doya hit a button on the screen, and the call went dead. We do not allow students to have communication with the outside world, she stated sternly. I gaped at her. But you have TVs? She pursed her lips. Students are allowed access to streaming services and local channels. Once you graduate, you may access telephones and the internet, but not until you are trained in proper communication channels. We can't take any risks. This phone should have never been allowed on campus. I was only calling... It doesn't matter who you were calling. She cut me off. The rules are in place to keep our society safe. Of course. This wasn't a school. It was a prison. So, basically high school. I dropped my gaze, because I was a goody-two-shoes who never talked back. Yes, I admit it. Despite the anger coursing through my body, I fell victim to her authority. Yes, ma'am, I whispered. Here. Madame Doya shoved a folder in my direction. You'll find your class schedule in here, along with your dorm key and a map of the school. I took the folder. That was it? That was my entire welcome? Madame Doya stared down at me past her nose, like she didn't know what else to say. She cleared her throat. Welcome home, Sophia. I stared after her as she breezed down the hall toward the main stairs, all the while trying to force down the lump in my throat. What she'd said bothered me to the core. This place was the furthest thing from home. I'd momentarily let myself become distracted by the magic of this world, but the truth was I would never belong here. My own house didn't even want me here. I was completely and utterly alone. Chapter 7 I tried to tell myself that I didn't feel bad when I left Sophia in front of the Coigny dorms, but I kind of did. She seemed so lost and helpless when I abandoned her at the doors and turned away. But I couldn't go in there with her. She was from the firehouse. Time to stop holding her hand. The water dorms were swathed with sapphire and silver, Toaqua house colors. Pools were embedded everywhere in the floors, and water familiars dove in and out of them along with elementi. The lighting in here was bright and fluorescent until you went down the right corridor, which was darker and more relaxing, like a spa. Unlike most of the cushy furniture throughout the rest of the castle, the furniture in here was made of wicker and waterproof. Everything got wet. It was like a constant summer party in here. Toaqua could never stay dry for long. Hey, Liam, jump in with us, Wyatt waved to me in the water. He was hanging on to his walrus familiar who was tugging him around. Wyatt had been one of my best friends before. I hadn't seen him all summer. I wasn't in the mood. No thanks. I turned my back on them and headed to my dorm. I heard mutters behind me, but I ignored them. I wasn't a part of them anymore. My room was clean, which I was sure was going to last about a week. By next Friday, it'd have clothes and shit all over it. There'd be so much clutter, it'd be difficult to walk. I wasn't really an organized guy. I found my schedule sitting on my bed. Bane must have dropped it off. I picked it up and opened the letter. Usually, students above first year level got to pick their classes, but I'd been so depressed over the summer that I told the school they could pick for me. I glanced at my schedule. They were a bunch of random classes, Medical Care of Familiars, Advanced Toaqua Magic 3, Magical Herbs and Plants, Survival Instincts, and Basket Weaving. Freaking basket weaving. There was nothing that specified any course of study. It was so obvious they didn't know where to put me. 
But I really couldn't blame them. I didn't know where to put me either. Last year, I'd been so looking forward to signing up for hunters and gatherers. But that was out of the question. For that kind of class, you needed a predator familiar to hunt with. Which I no longer had. I knew what my schedule would have looked like if Nashoma were still here. Interhouse diplomacy, ceremonial tradition, communing with the ancestors, war and negotiation. Classes to prepare the son of the chief to one day take over. But I knew my chances of becoming chief of Tawakwa were long done. That was my brother Ezra's job now. Dad would never let a familiar less elementi take the role of chief after he stepped down, even if I was his firstborn. Most of the students were staying in their dorms tonight, but I still had a few things to get from home. I left the Toakwa dorms and headed back to the main entrance. On the way through the courtyard, I saw that Haley was outside again, gabbing with two of her clones. Her phoenix, Anwara, was sitting on her shoulder. A jaguar and a winged python, familiars that had to belong to Haley's friends, were playing on the grass. Haley's familiar was watching the other animals with interest. Her eyes gleamed longingly as she watched the winged snake and the jaguar wrestle. She seemed a bit lonely. Enwara nudged Haley with her head, then bounced a little on her shoulder, fluffing her feathers. She clearly wanted to play. Enwara, cut it out, Haley snapped, and Enwara shrunk on her shoulder. Why do you want to go and make a fool of yourself? Sit still and behave. Enwara hung her head lowly. She didn't coo. Haley went on bragging loudly about the advanced classes her mother had gotten her into, while Enwara watched the other familiars play with a bit of a tear in her eye. Haley's friends pretended like nothing had happened. I felt a wall of rage rise in my chest. I hated people who mistreated their familiars. I would do anything, anything at all, to have just five more minutes with Nashoma, and here Haley was treating her poor phoenix like it was some designer purse to show off, one that was born simply to do her bidding. I gritted my teeth but didn't say anything. I'd already caused enough trouble with Haley when I stuck up for Sophia. The last thing I wanted was another lecture from Dad. Even worse, if I kept messing with house lines, the elders would get involved. I knew I was already in their line of sight. If I didn't want to mess things up more than I already had, I needed to keep my head down. Orenda Academy was run like any other college. I had classes scattered throughout the week on different days and times. Mondays and Wednesdays were loaded with three different classes, while I only had two classes on Tuesdays and Thursdays. I liked night classes, but the stupid school had signed me up for mostly mornings and afternoons. I hated myself for not picking my own schedule as I dragged my ass out of bed Monday morning and stumbled into the shower. I showed up late to Advanced Toaqua Magic 3. It was held right on the beach. Bane was already lecturing when I showed up. His familiar was swimming far beneath the surface, somewhere out at sea. Everyone else was gathered in a circle around him with their familiars. As a third year, I was the only one without one. I hung back and tried not to be seen. Which Professor Bain was insistent on screwing up. Liam, he announced the moment he saw me. You're just in time. Come on, we're practicing shields today. Amy, you can be his partner. Amy wrinkled her nose, but quickly rearranged her face when she saw me looking. We moved toward the ocean until our ankles were deep in water. I barely had time to get my shield up before Amy clenched her hand, causing a jet of water to rise up from the ocean. She sent it hurtling toward me at a high speed, directed toward my face. I raised up my hand in a sharp manner, and a wall of water came up, stopping Amy's jet midstream. I knew the tribe had resentment toward me for what had happened over the summer, but damn... This was a bit much. Amy snarled. She started tossing bits of water at me faster, one right after the other in fast succession. They nearly looked like bullets with how fast they were going. They got larger, stronger, yet my wall held. It didn't break or waver, and I smirked. I still had it. 
Amy couldn't break my shield and she was getting pissed. Whatever. Even though I was now weaker than almost everyone in my tribe, I was still really good. I just couldn't keep it up as long. Amy's hits kept getting harder and harder, and I was starting to sweat with the effort of keeping the wall steady. I couldn't spar like the rest of them anymore, and I hated myself for it. That's enough, Liam, Bane said sharply when he saw me leaning over my knees trying to catch my breath. Take a break. People were staring. He was coddling me and embarrassing me in front of everyone. I wanted to kill him. I let the wall drop spontaneously and it splashed Amy. She jumped back and glared at me, but I didn't say another word. Amy, you can take turns sparring with Jack and Lyra, Bane told her like I wasn't even there. Amy gladly left me behind and Bane walked over to me. You know better than to push yourself. I've told you this before, he said. I can keep up with everyone else and do even better, I growled through gritted teeth. I'm more talented than anyone here. But I don't have to remind you what you lack, Bane shook his head. One day, you're going to have to face the truth, Liam. Your greatest weakness is your biggest strength, and you need to learn how to implement it to your advantage. Advantage, I snorted. You think you're better despite your illness. I know you are. But prove it, Bane said with force. You're smart enough to find a way around it. But if you keep trying to be like you were before, just like everyone else, well, you and I both know it's not going to work. Bane turned his back on me to help the rest of the class. I was breathing hard, but it wasn't from exhaustion. It was from rage. Forget this. I wouldn't be looked down upon because I was different. I was ditching. I grabbed my backpack and headed out of there without another word. My next class wasn't for another hour, but I didn't care. I wouldn't be seen as the weak one. I was thinking about ditching basket weaving too, but I really couldn't afford to get into any more trouble. If I skipped too much, I'd get kicked out. I hardly cared, but I knew what my tribe would think. So I forced myself into Professor Amber's classroom at 11. Her classroom was one giant wicker basket perched on top of a tower. Inside, tons of blankets and rugs were scattered all over the floor alongside giant pillows. Incense holders hung from the ceiling and created a smoky atmosphere. I had to resist gagging when I saw Amber's familiar, an orangutan, actually playing a wooden flute for ambiance. This class was full of gossiping girls. Not one single male soul in here but me. I sat on a pillow before a loom and let myself be engulfed by the estrogen. What a hippie class. At least it was an easy credit, and I got to sit down. Professor Amber waltzed in. She was wearing a long skirt covered with a draping shawl and actual feathers weaved into her curly hair. She danced, literally danced into the room with bare feet while she twirled her arms above her head like some sort of witch. Greetings, fair children, she sang. I am Professor Amber. Welcome to basket weaving. She bowed to us, and her familiar mimicked the movement. Today, you will be learning the art of storytelling through the magical art that is weaving. In this class, you will understand how to intricately bind together the forces of thread and straw into a unison of sensual and delightful purpose. Professor Amber made making a basket sound sexual. She sat down at her loom. Pay attention, everyone, she said while taking out a collection of threads. This technique is to be used for your blissful understanding and pleasure. Yep, definitely sexual. She demonstrated the technique. The girls watched in interest, and I tried not to fall asleep. She then handed out thread to all of us in baskets and stood at the head of the room. I will be playing the drums and the gong for sound healing while you work. Feel your soul heal through the vibrations that are played, Amber soothed. 
I was ridiculously spiritual, but this was even pushing it for me. I winced as she struck the heavy gong again, then got to work. I had nothing else to do for these two hours. After a while, I fell into a kind of stupor. Weaving the blanket wasn't difficult on my body, and it didn't require that much concentration. It was repetitive work, one that required me to focus but not think overly hard. It was sort of nice, like being there, but your body is just existing, doing the same movements over and over, and the rest of you is floating. Kind of like being high. Maybe. Liam, your weaving is so perfect, Professor Amber praised. She snapped me out of my concentration. I found that everyone was staring at me jealously as Amber displayed the loom and my blanket to the class. Never have I seen a beginner make such a beautiful beginning of a piece. I looked around the room and saw that while the thread on everyone else's looms looked choppy and loose, my stitches were tight and uniform. I blushed so hard everyone could probably see it through my dark skin. I had to resist punching my loom. Professor Amber continued to brag loudly about me to the rest of the class until it was over. I shot out of there as quickly as I could when we were finally released. I was definitely switching this class the minute I could. Stupid ass basket weaving. I wolfed down lunch and headed to my last class of the day. Magical Herbs and Plants was held beside the greenhouse, off a small connecting room called the Alchemist's Lair. Inside were circular stone tables with small wooden bowls, pestles, and vials. Each desk had an alchemy brewing station. Professor Perot strutted around with his peacock familiar, teaching everyone what the different plants in the greenhouse meant and how to use them. I scowled. This class was for elementi who wanted to be medicine men and women, healers, something I definitely wasn't interested in. Yet I didn't know my place in society anymore, which Bain had made clear this morning, so I figured I could at least try it. Professor Perot taught us that plants like burdock, clovers, chickweed, and dandelions could be consumed in a food shortage emergency, something that was in high stock around here. The lecture was long, but interesting. I was happy when I successfully made a poultice for stopping bleeding wounds out of clay and cayenne pepper. Magical herbs and plants wasn't going to be so bad. It might even help. Alchemy was going to be something I needed after I graduated. Familiars and elementi got hurt all the time, mostly by magical afflictions. If some sort of potion or plant could help them feel better, or create some sort of spell that could save them in a pinch, I wanted to know. If I couldn't help myself anymore, maybe I could at least still help my tribe. I left magical herbs and plants feeling more positive than I had in months. This semester was going to be easy. I turned to head back to the Toakwa dorm to, you know, brood and be alone, and maybe work on my basket weaving in private, but I'd die before I told anyone that. I halted in place when my eye caught Sophia in the middle of the hallway. She was looking at her folder, shuffling through her papers like mad and turning on the spot. It was obvious she was lost and trying to find her way around. No one stopped to help her, not even anyone from her own house. That was typical of Coignies. You had to keep up or they'd literally throw you to the flames. They didn't take well to weak members. The Coigny house valued strength and power above everything, something Sophia did not emulate. Sophia looked really upset. Tears were welling up in her eyes, and her bottom lip was trembling. She was two seconds away from a breakdown. Ugh, by the ancestors. I needed to go save this girl before she embarrassed herself in front of everyone yet again. People didn't let things slide around here. They'd remember it forever if she broke down in the middle of school. But before I could, I hesitated. How far had I actually gotten in life by being nice? Being nice was only for two things. One, making hurting people feel better. And two, using it to get what you wanted. Nobody ever got anywhere by being nice. If being polite didn't work, you had to take what you wanted by force. 
Sophia had to learn that, or she'd get eaten alive out here. I stood there watching her, wrestling with a decision. She wasn't my problem anymore. Yet, she was. People were funeral pyres. Every single one of them was scrambling to light the nearest match as quickly as possible, and then once they were on fire, they complained that the fire burned. I was no exception to this rule. Nope. If I'd learned anything about people, it was that you could give them a hundred options, and every time, they'd always pick the worst decision they possibly could. Sophia was a bad decision, but she was one I couldn't help but make. I rolled my eyes and stomped over there. Her expression cleared as I came into view. Without a word, I yanked the folder out of her hands, opened it, and scrolled through her schedule. Typical first-year stuff, except... We had medical care of familiars together tomorrow. Fuck. Your first class is beginner Coigny Magic One. It's down the hall to the left. The door's by the statue of the dancing sprite. If you hit the cafeteria, you've gone too far. I threw the folder back at her. She scrambled to catch it, and papers got jumbled in her arms. Th thank you, she stuttered. Don't mention it, I told her sharply. Like, ever again. I shoved my hands in my pockets, turned around, and stormed off, which I was getting exceptionally good at doing lately. I glanced behind my shoulder just to double-check on her. Well, she seemed a bit more organized, at least. She had a clearer direction of where she was going. I sighed. Sophia was sweet, but she needed to learn how things ran around here. She couldn't keep being lost and confused. She had to find her place at Arenda Academy, fast, and I needed to learn how to stay away from her. Chapter 8 I was grateful for Liam's help in finding my first class, but it would have been more helpful if he'd told me what a sprite actually was. I wandered down the hall, my folder shaking in my hands. I gave myself an hour to explore the castle and find my first class, but it looked like that wasn't going to be enough time, even with the map in front of me. I was starting to think Liam gave me the wrong directions just to get in a good laugh. It wasn't hard to doubt the guy when he acted like a total ass. What was with him anyway? He always had a stone-cold look on his face and often breathed heavily, like he had no concept of simple relaxation. He acted like just being alive was difficult. Weird. Eventually, I hit the cafeteria Liam had mentioned. I turned around and headed back the way I came, looking for any signs of a dancing statue. I ran my hands across the fabric of my jeans, Amelia's jeans, hoping they would bring me luck. So far, I felt so out of my element that I wasn't sure they weren't cursed. I need you, Am. I wish I didn't have to do this without you. My eyes finally fell upon a statue of a woman wrapped in flowing fabric. She rose on one bare foot, the other off the ground and her hands in the air. This must be it. I glanced into the open door beside the statue. The room was one of the biggest I'd seen so far in the castle, with a high ceiling and a massive fireplace along the far wall. The area in front of the fireplace was empty, and there were scorch marks along the hardwood floor. Several large couches faced the empty area. I guessed the space was for training, and the couches were for observing. Tables and chairs were set up in front of a large chalkboard in the opposite corner of the room. Tall bookshelves lined the classroom area, and candles burned all around the room. A red-headed woman sat behind a large desk near the chalkboard, shuffling through papers. Besides that, the room was quiet. I was the first one here. Madame Doya looked up from her desk. She had that same hard look on her face as the first time I met her. I was starting to think it was a permanent expression. Can I help you? She asked, like she had no intention of actually helping me. I glanced down at my schedule, as if one more glance might help me make sense of everything I'd been trying to understand since yesterday. Um, yeah. Is this beginner Coigny Magic One? It is 
she answered. But you're early. Since when did teachers chastise you for being early? I, uh, wanted to make sure I was on time, I said lamely. Madame Doya looked up at me with tight lips, but simply nodded and gazed back down at her papers. You may take a seat and practice conjuring a flame in your palm until the rest of the class arrives. Practice conjuring fire? I thought that was what this class was for, to teach me how to do it. What are you just standing there for? She snapped without looking up from her desk. I sank into the closest chair two rows back. I don't know how to conjure fire yet. Madame Doya's head snapped upward. Excuse me? I fiddled with a corner of my folder. I mean, I used my fire once, but it was an accident. I didn't know I was supposed to know how to use it before class started. Great. I was going to be light years behind my classmates. Madame Doya frowned deeper, if that were possible considering the ever-present downturn of her lips. You should know how to conjure a basic flame by your age. My dad said my powers would be weak until- Your dad? Madame Doya interrupted. It was my understanding that you'd never met your father. What? Who would tell her a lie like that? Realization dawned. She was talking about my biological father. I meant my adoptive father, I said. It felt so wrong to call my dad that. Robert Henley is not your father, she stated in a tone that stung. Oh, I, um, what was I supposed to do? Agree with her? Madame Doya stood from her desk. That was the first time I noticed the creature lounging at her feet. My blood ran cold as a huge African cat with blonde fur stood and followed Madame Doya over to one of the nearby bookcases. I swore the cat scowled at me like it knew something. It does, I told myself. I licked my lips dry, but my tongue felt like sandpaper. This was the cat that had attacked Amelia and me just days ago. Naomi. I knew it. I urged to demand an answer from Doya about what her familiar was doing hundreds of miles away, stalking my sister and me in the Salt Lake Valley. But fear blocked my words. I didn't want to draw any more attention to myself than I had to. And I had a feeling that the more I dug into that, the more danger I'd put my family in. Madame Doya didn't seem to notice I'd gone completely tense at the sight of her familiar. She pulled down one of the thickest books I'd ever seen and flipped it open. She walked over to me and dropped the book so hard onto my desk that I jumped back a few inches. Your father's name was Anthony Grayson, and your mother's name was Lucy Grayson. They were both highly respected members of the Coigny House. Madame Doya pointed at the page in front of me. I glanced down at it, but continued to watch the lioness out of the corner of my eye. She stood still, but stared back. Names and birth dates lined the page. It was a genealogy chart, and sure enough, the names Anthony and Lucy were written beside each other, with a line connecting them to the name Sophia Grayson. My birth date was written below the name. It wasn't exactly a shock, considering my parents admitted I was adopted, but it still didn't feel right to see my name written that way, connected to a man and woman I'd never met. Your adoptive father was nothing more than a thief, Madame Doya accused in disgust. He stole you away from this world when you were only a baby. You must learn to accept that fact. I sat there dumbstruck. She couldn't actually believe my parents stole me, could she? I mean, apart from the whole lying about being adopted thing, my parents were the best. I was sure that whatever happened when I was a baby, the Graysons wanted my parents to have me. And I didn't care what anyone else said. Robert and Susan Henley were the people who raised me. They were, and always would be, my real parents. 
God, I missed them. And thanks to Doya, I couldn't even call them to tell them that. I forced down the lump in my throat, but my voice still came out small. Do they, Anthony and Lucy, know I'm here? They don't know anything, Madame Doya said coldly, considering they're dead. What? I asked breathlessly. I wasn't sure I'd heard her right. Your parents died shortly after you were born. Madame Doya spoke without emotion, as if she wasn't delivering earth-shattering news. I sat still for several beats, absorbing the information. What does this mean? Am I the prophesied one? Whatever it meant to be the prophesied one. With all that talk the day before, no one cared to tell me what the prophecy actually said. Madame Doya's nostrils flared as she inhaled a deep breath. I believed you could be, but anyone capable of fulfilling the prophecy should actually be able to do magic. What was it with this woman? She knew how to deliver a blow with the most minimal of words. Talking to her felt like being thrown into a lion's den without a weapon. At this rate, this lady was going to chew me up and spit me out by the end of next week. She petrified me. Voices from down the hall met my ears, and a group of students entered the room. I turned to see Haley at the front of the group, her phoenix on her shoulder. I noticed she was the only first-year coigny in the group with a familiar. She stopped talking the moment she laid eyes on me. Madame Doya slammed the book on my desk shut, stealing my attention from Haley. She scooped the book up in her arms and began her way back to her desk. The lioness followed. Everyone, please take a seat, Doya said in a bored tone. We'll get started shortly. To say I was behind my classmates was an understatement. These people could light a fire in the palms of their hand with a snap of their finger. Literally. I didn't even have the snapping my fingers part down. Haley showed off by lighting up the wood in the fireplace from halfway across the room and sending it whirling up the chimney like a fire tornado. If that was the kind of thing Coigny could do on their first day, I wasn't sure I wanted to see what they were capable of after four years of training. Maybe by then I'd be good enough to burn Haley's perfect eyebrows off, if I was lucky. Come on, people, Madame Doya yelled across the training area. Apparently, my classmates weren't doing as well as I thought. This isn't Navita magic. We're not moving mountains here. All I'm asking is to see you sustain a flame for ten seconds. It'd be nice if some of you could conjure a flame at all. She shot a glare my way. It didn't go unnoticed. Haley followed Madame Doya's gaze and smirked. Maybe if Madame Doya actually tried teaching us something instead of just yelling like a drill sergeant, we'd have made some progress since the beginning of class. I didn't dare ask her how it was actually done. I probably wouldn't get a direct answer anyway. I want to move on to fireballs by next week, Madame Doya said. At this rate, it'll take us a month, and everyone but Haley will be repeating this class next semester. Sophia! I immediately froze from where I stood near the fireplace, my fingers pinched together in preparation to snap them. I knew it wouldn't work, since I'd already tried a hundred times since class started. What are you doing? she demanded. I blinked a few times, unsure how to answer. I'm trying to conjure fire. Yes, Madame Doya emphasized with raised eyebrows. Which you have yet to do. I swallowed hard. I, I'm not sure how. I didn't have Coigny parents to teach me. Surely everyone could understand that. Everyone back to their desks, she instructed. The class hesitated. Now, she boomed. Everyone scurried back to their seats. Madame Doya walked so lightly that she seemed to float across the room. She stopped at her desk, where her familiar lay on the floor, and grabbed one of the candles burning there. 
She brought it to her face and blew the flame out. Everyone watched with interest as she turned and started her way down the aisle of desks. My heart pounded with every step of her feet. She headed straight toward me. I prayed she would pass me by, but she stopped beside me. My mouth went dry as she set the candle in the middle of my desk. Light it, she commanded. What? I just sat there, glancing between her and the candle. Was she serious? You should be able to conjure a flame for a simple candle, Madame Doya insisted. Perhaps you need a little pressure to push you in the right direction. Everyone's eyes were on me. I could feel it, even without having to look up. Haley snickered from across the room. What are you waiting for? Madame Doya asked. Light the candle. I stared at the charred wick. Anything not to look her in the eyes. A slew of emotions surfaced. Anger, embarrassment, fear. The list went on. It made my blood boil. I thought for a moment the candle might actually light from the power of my emotions. But the seconds ticked by, and all that happened was a tension headache formed in my head. Whispers spread across the room. Why won't she just light it? She's not going to get it. Is she even coigny? Hot breath passed by my upper lip, and my eyes burned. I focused every inch of attention I had on that candle wick, and nothing happened. Why wasn't the damn thing lighting? Why wouldn't Doya tell me how to actually do it? Because she finds pleasure in tormenting you for whatever reason. I must have reminded her too much of someone she hated. Enough! Madame Doya's voice cut off the whispers and snapped me out of my concentration. But I couldn't take it another second. When I looked up, all eyes were on me. It felt like the walls in the room were getting smaller and smaller, and they would crush me if I didn't make it out now. And so I did the only thing I could do. I ran. I wasn't sure what came over me. I'd never ditched class before, and certainly not when I'd already attended the first half of it. I mean, who does that? Me, apparently. We've got a runner, someone teased as I rushed out the door. I couldn't even think straight enough to tell if it was Haley. I was already winded by the time I reached the end of the hall. To be fair, it was a long haul, and I was sprinting pretty fast. But I continued forward. I had to get as far away from that room as I could. I raced out the first doors I found, down a long flight of concrete steps, and onto a worn path carved through the forest. I only slowed when I was far enough into the trees that I felt safe from other students or staff spotting me. I needed to get into nature. It was the only place I felt safe, felt normal. The sound of running water traveled through the forest. The farther I walked, the louder it became. Finally, I reached the water I'd been hearing for the last five minutes. A tall waterfall rushed down the side of a cliff and followed a narrow river over rocks and down the mountainside. White water sprayed into the air, sprinkling the trees hanging above the river. A narrow footbridge with rails crossed over the water, but I abandoned the trail and sat on one of the rocks closest to the bank. I curled my knees to my chest and rested my chin on them. My mind raced, and fury coursed through my veins. Madame Doya should have been fired for how she treated students, and Haley shouldn't have even been in beginner coigny magic if she was that good. They singled me out because I was new, because I was an easy target. I didn't want to be here. It was... The sound of a creature trilling in the trees above me distracted me. I looked upward and spotted a small, fluffy, white creature, the size of a fat squirrel jumping from branch to branch. It moved so fast I couldn't catch a good glimpse of it. All I saw was that it had white fur and a fluffy tail, almost as big as its body. I shot to my feet on the rock, completely alert and captivated by the critter. 
it trilled again. Its voice was melodic and exotic. Whatever the creature was, it wasn't like anything I'd ever seen before. I followed the critter with my eyes. The way it stretched out its arms and swung from branch to branch was effortless and adorable. I had the strangest urge to climb up the tree and swing from the branches with it. I actually cracked a smile. The creature reached the end of a branch hanging over the river. I caught enough of a glance to see it was male. He stretched forward to grab a branch on the next tree, but it was a few inches out of his grasp. The animal glanced behind himself, as if calculating what he had to do to make the leap. He scurried back along the branch and stopped. He set his eyes forward, then sprinted away from the trunk of the tree. The creature kicked off from the end of his branch and soared through the air. He grabbed a hold of the leaves on the tree he'd been aiming for. The whole branch bowed, and then the leaves he held snapped off the tree. My stomach lurched as the critter flipped through the air and landed in the water with a hard splash. The water rushed so fast that when he came up for air a second later, he was already several yards downriver from where he fell in. I couldn't explain why I did what I did. I didn't even give it a second thought. I just jumped. One second I was standing on a boulder along the bank, and the next I was in the middle of the river, with shoes on and everything. The current caught me as soon as I jumped in. I was so not a water person, but my parents had forced me into swimming lessons as a kid, so I wasn't completely useless. But I'd underestimated how fast the current flowed. The water rushed over my head and pushed me over rocks that cut into my skin. I tried to dig my feet into the river bottom to slow myself, but each time I managed to gain a hold on a rock, the current swept me off my feet again. Finally, my head broke the surface long enough for me to inhale a deep breath. The current slowed, and the river grew wider and deeper. Up ahead, tiny white hands shot out of the water, and then they were gone again. I kicked my legs and pushed myself forward. Not far ahead, the river turned back into rapids. Huge boulders stuck out of the water, threatening death to anyone who came too close. If I didn't reach the critter soon, I was going to die. He was going to die. And I couldn't let that happen. I couldn't explain the overwhelming sensation that told me that if I somehow survived without him, it just might kill me anyway. A high-pitched cry filled the air and echoed off the mountains. The creature resurfaced and tried to swim upstream without making any headway. Dread filled my entire body. I stretched my arm forward and stroked as fast as I could toward him. Relief washed over me when I finally reached him. The critter grabbed onto my arm and climbed onto my back, leaving both of my arms free to swim to shore. It took all the strength I had to get us to dry land before the rapids hit, but I crawled to shore in one piece. I fell onto my stomach, heaving in heavy breaths as my heart pounded against my ribcage. I wasn't sure I'd ever been closer to death. And all for... what was it? Whatever it was, it was worth it, I decided. I rolled over, and the creature jumped off my back. I expected him to run away now that he was safe. But when I twisted my head, he was still there. So close that all I saw was a coat of white fur. He shook his fur out, covering my face in another layer of water droplets. I sat up to wipe the water off my face with the back of my hand, then looked down at him. Oh, my heart! It was the cutest thing I'd ever seen. I thought my heart might explode. He had big, fur-covered ears like a fennec fox, with a fluffy tail, chubby cheeks, and a small black nose. Two tiny, rounded horns protruded from the top of his head. His paws were miniature and adorable. The thing that got me, though, were his eyes. I'd only ever seen eyes that big and round in cartoons and on stuffed animals, but here he was in real life, staring up at me with sparkling blue eyes that took up half his face. The creature's expression softened, and I swear he smiled at me. 
I was so entranced by his stare that it didn't even register how strange it was that he reached out for me. I extended my arm back. His tiny paws grabbed my fingers, and he hopped forward to rub his face into my hand. His eyes never left mine. Around us, time seemed to slow to a stop. My entire body froze. I was certain even my heart had stopped beating, and I knew for sure I wasn't breathing. Something in that moment changed everything. It was like I'd been missing something my whole life, and when the tiny critter's gaze locked on mine, a piece of my heart had been returned to me. It was like I'd lived my whole life going through the motions just to lead me to this moment. Time started to move forward again, but neither me nor the creature moved. My senses ignited, rooting me in place. A light, warm breeze brushed across my skin and through my hair. I felt a heartbeat pulse through my skin, but it didn't feel like my own. The sound of the birds chirping met my ears. They sang a tune that sounded a lot like the lullaby my mom used to hum to me as a kid. The birds' voices came together as a choir, singing in perfect harmony. As I stared down at the creature, the taste of my father's homemade cherry pie washed across my taste buds, and the smell of Amelia's apple-scented shampoo filled my nose. It didn't make sense what these reminders of my family were doing here out in the woods hundreds of miles from home. But one thing was certain. I'd never felt more at home in my life. My entire body tingled with glee, and tears rose to my eyes from sheer overwhelm. The creature's eyes glistened, mirroring my own. He never looked away, as if he too was captivated by the magic in the air. I forgot all about what happened in Madame Doya's class earlier. I forgot about wanting to leave this place. I forgot about everything. It was like nothing but me and the little creature clinging to my finger mattered. For the first time in forever, I felt truly at peace. The critter trilled again, pulling me from my daze. The warm wind died down, chilling me to the bone and the sound of the birds I'd heard no longer reached us. The critter nudged me again. I laughed and scratched behind its ears. He let out a low rumble, like a cat's purr. I was pretty sure he liked it. The more I petted him, the more I laughed. But inside, my mind was fixed on the strange moment that just occurred between us. Had I imagined it? Or was there something bigger going on? What's your name, little guy? I asked out loud. He made a small noise that sounded a lot like Essis. Essis? I asked, as if he could actually communicate with me. That's your name? Obviously, he didn't answer, but he let me pet him like he was happy with whatever name I gave him. Okay, Essis! I scooped his tiny, fragile body into my arms, cradling him into my chest. He clung onto my shirt in a surprisingly comfortable position. I giggled and stood. You're not going to let me go, are you? Of course not. Why would he? The mere suggestion didn't make any logical sense. He let out another noise that sounded like he was rolling his tongue. I loved the little noises he made. They were the cutest sounds in the world. I wanted to keep him. Screw whatever their rules might be, I would keep him. He was mine now, and I was his. I stared down at the small fur baby in my arms. He had his foot in his hands and was chewing on his toes. How had my heart not exploded yet? I'm going to take you up to the school and find someone who can check you over, I told him. I want to make sure you're all right. I glanced around the forest wondering how I was going to find my way back to the castle. I started upstream, hoping to meet up with the trail I'd come down. Water squished through my sneakers and goosebumps broke out on my arms. It seemed to take forever to walk through the brush upstream. 
I was starting to think maybe I was following the wrong river or something when the bridge I'd seen earlier came into view. I hurried along the trail and back up to the castle. I wasn't sure where I was headed, but I knew I wasn't going back to Madame Doya's room. I'd find another professor to send me in the right direction. The hall was empty when I entered, but it wasn't long before a familiar voice met my ears. What happened to you? Haley sneered when I passed a hall on my left. She and her group of five were hanging out around a serpent statue, gossiping. I hoped it wasn't about me, but it probably was. Did you get into a fight with a Toaqua? I gritted my teeth. No, actually, I jumped in to save... That? Haley turned her nose up when she spotted Essis in my arms. You saved a dust bunny? Her cronies echoed her laughter. I was officially royally pissed off. Essis made a noise that sounded a lot like a comeback. Good. At least he knew how to stand up to her. I... What's going on? A woman's voice cut me off. I whirled around to find Madame Doya standing behind me. She looked me up and down, clearly displeased by my soaking appearance. Her familiar stood beside her. Naomi's lips curled back over its teeth as she glared at me. I pulled Essis closer to me, just in case the lioness thought she was hungry for a snack. I spoke before Haley could. This little guy fell in the river. I wanted to get him to a vet, or whatever you have around here, to make sure he's okay. Madame Doya eyed Essis. You can take him to Professor Fawn, but it's hardly worth it. What do you mean? I asked. No one knows what that creature is. So even if he could be treated, we wouldn't know how to treat him, Madame Doya explained, like Essis' life was about as important as the dirt on her pointed heels. Thank you, I said, just to end the conversation. I'll go find Professor Fawn. Not like I had any idea where to find him or her, but I'd do anything to get out of this hallway. I bet she bonded with it. Haley muttered under her breath before I could even take a step. I paused, wondering what exactly that would feel like. Had I bonded with Essis? What's it like to bond with a familiar? I asked Doya, expecting a disapproving glance and curt answer, which is exactly what I got. It's different for everyone, she replied. Even without a clear explanation, somehow I knew. The moment we'd shared in the woods left no doubt. Essis and I had bonded, which meant I was never letting him go. The lioness stepped forward and let out a low growl. I instantly took two paces back. Calm down, Naomi, Madame Doya scolded, placing her hand on the lioness back. Naomi glanced back at her and dropped her head. Madame Doya raised an eyebrow, but her lips turned down. It seems that you have bonded, she said, eyeing Essis with disgust. I expected better from a member of my house. What the hell did that mean? Now it makes sense why she can't produce a flame, one of the girls in Haley's group said to the other. She spoke under her breath, but I heard every word. My jaw tightened. I knew I couldn't snap back, not in front of Doya. If you bonded, I guess that means you'll be competing in this year's tournament, Haley said with a smirk. Tournament? My voice shook. She was only saying it to scare me, right? Madame Doya sighed, like she couldn't believe how uninformed I was. I blamed her for that, considering she was the head of my house. Yes, the tournament. She bit, like it was obvious. Each student who is bonded by the end of September every year will be entered into the Elemental Cup to prove their bond with their familiar and their place in our society. That didn't sound too bad. Madame Doya scowled at me. I suggest you don't make skipping class a habit. You'll need all the help you can get preparing for this tournament considering your current circumstances. Your competition will be fierce. 
Madame Doya glanced to Haley, who had a smug expression fixed on her face. I knew instantly she meant that Haley would be in this year's competition with me. I bit back the string of nasty words that danced on the tip of my tongue. I'm not too worried about the competition. Haley's face fell. You should be worried. You'll never survive with that familiar. The blood drained from my face when no one countered her. Haley wasn't just insulting me. She was serious. I realized this was a deadly competition. It was clear that if I didn't learn how to use my fire, this tournament would kill me. Chapter 9 I wasn't looking forward to medical care of familiars, but it wasn't like I had a choice whether or not to go. The class was held in a large medical room tied on to the medical wing. Medical equipment hung on the walls, and long desks with sinks were placed among the room in uniform manner. The room was stark white, and the fluorescent lighting in here was so bright it was enough to make you go blind. It looked like the literal inside of a hospital. I'd spent enough time in one over the summer, so it churned my stomach to look at it. I was late again, a bad habit that I was developing, but fine with, and most of the class was already here. I saw that Haley and her morons were in this class too, but my attention only lingered on them for a moment because my eyes went directly to Sophia. There was a tiny animal sitting on Sophia's shoulder. It was white and looked like nothing but a big furball rolling around her torso. Sophia giggled as she played with it, and the little puffer let out tiny mews as she tickled it. It made her happy, which made me happy, I guess. You've bonded, I said as I walked up to her. She saw me coming and grinned. My heart skipped a beat, but I ignored it. Feelings were for losers. Yep. Sophia was stroking the little critter on her shoulder who had calmed as I'd approached. Isn't he just so cute and fluffy? He was, even though I didn't know what he was. What's his name? Essis, she responded cheerfully. I just got him yesterday. I found him in the woods. Like I'd found Nishoma. Is that a ball of lint? I asked, smirking. Stop it, she recoiled away from me, holding Essis. Don't pick on him. I'm just teasing. He's cute. I reached out to scratch Essis under the chin. His eyes rolled back and he grinned, thumping his foot. I looked at Sophia. How did fire class go yesterday? I didn't even know why I was asking. Her smile fell. Terrible, actually. Everyone else can make fire snap from their fingers. I tried, but it didn't happen. You can't even make a flame? I asked, surprised. Sophia looked down in shame. No, I can't even light a candle. Who boy. She was going to have one hell of a time during the tournament with Essis. His survival skills seemed non-existent. She better hurry up and master fire quick before she became one of the casualties. Thinking of Sophia dying made me really sad. So I didn't. I was just glad I wasn't required to join the tournament because I'd lost Nashoma. Competing against Sophia wouldn't be fun, but being on a team with her would be a nightmare. Don't worry, this class will be easier, I told her. I was reassuring her. Why, I didn't know. Liam! Someone said behind me. I turned to see Jonah next to me, his hippogriff familiar following behind him. Jonah was huge, and I mean huge. He was easily six foot five and towered over everyone else at Orenda. His brown hair was up in a man bun and a thick beard grew halfway down his chest. He wore a red plaid shirt with loose, dark wash jeans and boots I'm pretty sure a dragon could fit into. His arms were as big around as tree trunks for crying out freaking loud. Jonah had bonded over the summer. Jonah's hippogriff, Squeaks, was dancing around and knocking stuff over behind him. I'm pretty sure she had ADHD because no matter what the class was, Squeaks couldn't stand still. She was as big as a draft horse and brown in color with ginger feathers that gleamed in the light. Her eyes were yellow, her beak pitch black, 
I had to step out of the way to avoid getting my foot stomped as she continued her frantic dance, hooves tapping a beat. Jonah and I hadn't really talked since what had happened with Nashoma, though he and Squeaks had come to the funeral a few weeks later. I shook his hand and bumped my shoulder against his. Hey, man, what's up with you? Jonah asked. Not much, I shrugged. Same old shit. I was worried you wouldn't come back this year, Jonah said. I'm glad to see you didn't give it up. Sophia was eyeing me curiously. I forced a laugh and said, I stayed to annoy you. Always, buddy. Jonah's eyes followed Raynar, a tall, thin guy who I always thought had a face that looked like a rat's, as he entered the classroom and sat at one of the desks in the front row. You preoccupied? Because you know I can always leave you two alone, I poked. Jonah's attention was still on Raynar. Yeah, yeah, you're hilarious. Hang out later? He didn't wait for me to answer before he crossed the room and slid into the seat beside Raynar, talking lowly and nudging him with his shoulder. Squeaks muscled her way in beside him and sat down next to the desk. I rolled my eyes. That was Jonah. He was always after the D. I thought people from different houses couldn't be friends, Sophia asked me in a low tone, a small smile on her face. Shut up, I mumbled to her as the professor entered. Sophia didn't get it. A Tawakwa guy being friends with a Yapluma dude was no big deal. Not like Sophia's and my friendship would be. Water and air could mix. Water and fire? No go. Gather round, everyone, Professor Costas said, and eventually the chatter quieted down. I focused on Costas. I'd had her before. She wore a long white coat with a stethoscope hanging around her neck. She was short and looked cute, but she'd seen her fair share of blood and gore. Welcome to my class, Costa started. Now, I know many of you are wondering why this class is necessary, as for most of you, you will be staying within the ranks of the Elementi and will be near enough to emergency medical care. Professor Costas paused to gaze around the class. However, some of you will be taking positions within the tribe that will require you to be away from home and away from other elementi. When you're out in the field, you won't be able to get to medical care quickly. In a majority of cases, you will be alone and must rely on yourself to save your familiar's life, which is why the majority of this class will be held outside, away from the equipment you undoubtedly won't have while exploring the wild. Follow me. Professor Costas led us outside to where a collection of really creepy life-size familiar dolls were lying around. They were in various shapes and sizes of animals and were meant to practice on. I was feeling a little glum. Maybe if I had taken this class last year, I could have saved Nashoma. Also waiting outside was Costas's familiar, Hera. She was a hydra, a large reptile with nine heads, green in color and very intimidating. She walked on four legs with large rounded claws and was about as big as a small house. Venomous fangs protruded from the mouth of each head, along with a collection of poisonous spines along the creature's back all the way down to her long, whip-like tail. From what I'd heard from other people, Hera was a real sweetheart. I'd believe that after I'd spent enough time with her to know one of her nine heads wasn't going to eat me. Pair up, everyone, Costas yelled loudly. For this, I'll need you to work in teams. The best people were gone in seconds. Jonah immediately paired up with Raynar, which I saw coming. Everyone else already had a partner, which meant I was stuck with Sophia. She immediately gravitated toward me, and of course, I took in the sorry orphan, because I was a sorry orphan too. We sat next to a doll that looked like a tiger, and Costas held up a bandage with splints. Listen up, and pay close attention. I will be instructing you on how to create a splint for broken bones, Costas started. She demonstrated on Hera, and I tried to watch, but I noticed Sophia was nodding off, her eyes following Hera around the gardens instead of listening to Costas's instruction. Learning to set bones was useful, but it was tough work for the first day of class. Sophia couldn't wrap the bindings tight enough, and I think she ended up breaking the doll's leg worse than what it originally was. I facepalmed at least five times. Essis didn't make things any easier. 
He kept running around over the doll, squeaking and tumbling like he didn't see the point in wrapping up a broken limb. At one point, he sank his little teeth into the wrappings and started tugging at it, trying to play. Sophia laughed, but it wasn't funny to me. At least we weren't the only ones struggling. Haley got frustrated and ended up throwing her doll, which made me chuckle under my breath. Jonah was sitting around and letting Raynar do all the work. While Raynar was binding up the doll's leg, I caught Jonah looking at his ass. I got Jonah's attention, pointed to Raynar when his back was turned, and made humping movements with my hips. Jonah went red and flipped me off. I laughed. What's with you guys? Sophia questioned, raising an eyebrow. Jonah's been crushing on Raynar forever, but he hasn't made a move, I explained. Hmm. Sophia nodded, then went back to wrapping the mangled doll's leg. Essis stared at me, his eyes getting bigger and bigger and bigger. By the time I ripped my gaze away, I'm pretty sure his giant pupils were covering the rest of his face. That thing was an alien or something. By the end of the class, bandages were everywhere. A couple of girls were crying in frustration, and Haley was bitching. Most everyone had given up. Costas's face was thin and brittle. She obviously wasn't impressed. The majority of you will need to study up. This is not an easy class. If you perform like you have today, you are going to fail. Tomorrow we'll be learning how to perform CPR on your familiar, and next week we'll get into poisons. Class dismissed. People scattered out of there. Professor Costas was a hard ass, but at least she was fair. She was far from Madame Doya. I looked down at our doll. We'd managed to fix the leg back to normal, and the bandages were wrapped tightly now, but I'm pretty sure if it had been a real tiger, Sophia and I would have killed it. Sophia looked happy, though. We actually make a pretty good team, don't we? Essis let out a mew, and I told Sophia, don't get your hopes up. We stood up to leave. We didn't mean to walk together. That's just what happened. Near the entry to the gardens, Haley was taking out her frustration on another Coigny first year. You know, Costas was talking about you, Taylor, she said. You're never going to pass. Taylor was in tears. I think she was Levi's little sister, which would make sense. Haley and Levi dated over the summer before he realized what a bitch she was and thankfully dumped her. But that meant his little sis had to spend a whole semester of enduring Haley's torments. Poor girl. Leave her alone, Haley, Jonah bit at her, laying a hand on Taylor's shoulder. Yours looked worse. Haley's eyes narrowed and she sneered. Aren't people from your pluma supposed to be thin and small? How'd you expect your hippogriff to lift your fat ass, Goliath? Haley goaded, and her friends roared at the insult. He's another abomination like Sophia, Kelsey, Haley's second in command, added. His mom probably slept around with some Nevita guy. This is why houses shouldn't mix. You get all these freaks running around. Right? Sophia's so inbred she can't even light a candle. Her magic's useless, just like her stupid familiar, Haley said, shooting Sophia a nasty grin. Haley and her friends roared. Essis puffed up into a little ball of fury, hopping up and down on Sophia's shoulder and stomping his tiny feet. Sophia tried to comfort him. His tiny cheeks swelled up as he made a quick whoosh sound. Sophia looked troubled, like she didn't know what to do. Jonah moved closer to Taylor and whispered, Are you okay? Taylor slapped his hand away. She backed up, wiping away more tears. Stay away from me. She took off as fast as she could, and Haley grinned. She knew she'd won. Haley then looked at me. She dug around in her bag for something and then threw it at me. Here, I thought you might need this, Liam. Finish the job since you're no good to the tribe anymore. It hit me. My insides cringed as my hands caught what she'd tossed. A rope. Sophia's face was red with rage. Sophia didn't understand what Haley's comment meant, not really, but it still pissed her off. She opened her mouth to say something. But I wasn't dealing with this. Haley's actions didn't deserve a reaction. 
I stuffed the rope inside my pocket, then grabbed Sophia's wrist to pull her away before a bigger scene was made. Jonah turned his back on Haley to look for Raynar, but he was already gone. I'm getting really tired of people picking on me, Sophia grumbled as we walked away. There was a large stone fountain with a statue of a thunderbird taking flight on top of it. Nobody was around, and Sophia paused to catch her breath. She was furious. So then do something about it, I told her. Fight back. Fight back? She gave me a condescending look. You just dragged me away before I could say anything. Because you've got to fight in the right way. You can't just say whatever you want. Haley's mean, but she's also super smart, I told her. Not to mention she'll go running to Madame Doya the minute you open your mouth. You've got to fight with actions, not words. Sophia sighed. I guess you're right. She sat on the edge of the fountain. This sucks. I was so happy when I found Essis. It was like everything was going to be okay, she started. I nodded. I knew the feeling. And? And then Madame Doya ruined it, she made a face. Typical of her. I'm supposed to be some prophesied child, but I can't even make a tiny flame. Everyone talks about unity, but it's just crap. No one wants to help me. And now there's this tournament, and... She sighed in defeat. I don't know, Liam. I don't know how to do this. The thought crossed my mind to help her. I wasn't supposed to be teaching a Coigny how to use a flame. I didn't even know how to do it myself. But the thought of Madame Doya's bitchy face as she gazed down at Sophia in disappointment was enough to make me act. You'll show her. Come on, follow me. I started walking toward the forest where we wouldn't be seen. She followed. When we were deep enough into the trees, I motioned for her to put down Essis. She put him up on a tree branch. He looked down at us in interest, large ears forward. If you want to beat Haley, you have to show her you're better than her at magic, I started. Nothing she could say will trump that. It'll eat away at her. How? She's the best in my class and I'm the worst, Sophia's shoulders slumped. She's had years of practice. You need someone willing to teach you, not just yell at you, I started before I paused. And I guess that sad sack is me. You? She raised an eyebrow. But you're Toaqua. How do you know how to conjure fire? I don't. I'm just guessing. But it's all elemental magic, right? Can't be too difficult. I showed her. I hovered my hand over the ground, and dew droplets rose from the dirt, leaves, and grass to form a ball of water in my hand. I moved it back and forth, weaving my hands like a wave as the water swished in the air from this side to that. Let your magic flow through you. It's an extension of your body. You are connected to the earth and everyone in it. Everything is a living thing and is willing to help you. Use that connection to summon your power. Sophia tried. She raised her hands and tried to conjure magic, but all that resulted was a look that made her seem like she had to shit. I don't get it, she said. Can you explain another way? I thought for a moment. Harnessing water was all about self-control. You had to let peace and harmony flow through you steadily before you gathered it into a powerful force. Water sustained life, but it could also take it. Fire was different. Fire was raging and angry and was fueled by strong emotions unbound by any force. Coigny were strong and ill-tempered. They burned off of pride. It was one of the reasons Haley was so good. No wonder Sophia couldn't create a flame. She was too meek, too gentle. She had to get pissed. I literally was going to have to light a fire under her ass. Think about Madame Doya, how she humiliated you in front of everyone and how badly you want to prove her wrong, I said. Meditate on how that feels. Sophia scrunched up her face. Moments passed and became minutes. I wondered if we'd be out here for hours. Suddenly, a ball of flame appeared brightly in her palm. She opened her eyes, mouth falling open in delight, but the flame only lasted a few seconds before vanishing. Did you see that? She screeched happily, bouncing. I did it. You did? You see, it's not that hard. I shrugged. 
Madame Doya is just a terrible teacher. Yeah, she grinned and looked up at me. Thanks, Liam. I just hope I can do it again in Madame Doya's class. You've got it, I encouraged. Just trust in yourself, and the ancestors will guide you. Ancestors? I don't believe in anything like that, Sophia said. All that spiritual stuff is really silly. My parents didn't raise me like that. Believing in the afterlife is for people who can't stand on their own. Essis looked at his elementi like he couldn't believe what she'd just said, ears back and little lips trembling. I went to bite back something sharp before I held my tongue. Here I was helping this girl, and she was blatantly disrespecting our religion, our culture. She just didn't understand what it meant to be part of the Hawkeye. No good deed goes unpunished, I suppose. Now she was acting like a superior coigny. Great fricking timing. This was why the elders didn't allow outsiders. Esses came down from the trees, but instead of going to Sophia, the squirrel reject went for me. He landed on top of my head and screamed in what seemed like a victory as he perched on top of my skull. Dude, get down. I tried yanking him off, but it didn't work. Essis was set on riding on top of my head. He made a nest in my hair and was clinging onto the strands to hold on, making loud cooing noises like he was the captain of this ship. He likes you, Sophia grinned. Yeah, well, I don't like him. I gave up and let him sit there. It wasn't like he weighed anything. We started back to the castle where hopefully I would find a vice grip to pry the little bugger off. But then there was more than the sound of our footsteps crunching the earth. Someone was giving an audible shout, a cry for help. Did you hear that? Sophia looked at me. I paused to listen for a second, then nodded when I heard the voice again. Yeah, someone's in trouble. Essis took off. He leapt off of my head and started jumping from tree to tree toward the screaming. Essis, wait, Sophia cried. We broke into a run to keep up with him. He became a little white dot in the leaves, zigzagging this way and that. Sophia was ahead of me. She didn't look where she was going, and someone stepped onto the path who Sophia slammed into. Oof, the figure cried. Imogen again. What are you doing here? I asked her as she untangled herself from Sophia. I helped both girls up and stared at Imogen. She was wearing these large bunny ears that looked like antennas poking out of her hair. Sassy was nearby, rising on her hind legs curiously. I had some free time and was out looking for Wolpertingers. Sassy loves to play with them, Imogen said. We were adventuring until we heard screaming and we came this way. I was pretty sure whatever Imogen said didn't exist, but I went along with it. Another voice broke through the woods. Oi, there you guys are. From behind us and with a bunch of twigs in his hair came Jonah, grinning like a wildcat. Jonah? What the fuck? I asked. Squeaks was having a hard time getting through the trees. The hippogriff crushed bushes and knocked over saplings on her struggle to get to Jonah, squawking her irritation at him. I saw you and Sophia go into the woods together, and I got curious. Jonah waggled his eyebrows. But then I got lost. <laughs> Typical. I rolled my eyes. Jonah wasn't very good with directions. Essis was hopping up and down in the tree ahead of us, peeping and wanting us to keep up. There was another scream. Let's go, Sophia said, and she led the way. Isn't it so interesting how we're all going on such an adventure? I think we're going to be very good friends, Imogen said pleasantly amongst the backdrop of the horrified wailing. Yeah, we're a fucking group, all right, I mumbled. The Coigny girl who couldn't conjure fire, the gay Yapluma guy who was too big to be from Yapluma, the weird Navita girl who creeped everyone out, and me, the familiar less cripple. This joke was too damn perfect. If anyone saw me together with all these people at the same time, I'd be a laughingstock. The trees eventually ended and cleared. Below us was a large cliff about 15 feet tall, and at the bottom was a thick black tar pit, sticky and deep. Tar pits weren't unusual around here. There were quite a few dotted throughout the woods. 
Most people knew to stay away from them, but apparently not this time. The yelling was coming from Professor Perot. He was submerged in the middle of the pit up to his neck, the only thing being free, his arms and his head. His peacock familiar, Baxter, was flying around the pit trying to get Perot out. But he had changed. Baxter's body had morphed into a bird representing a cloud. His body, feathers, and plumage were transparent and white, and he fluttered over Professor Perot frantically. With each beat of his wing, he tried to summon the winds to get them to lift Perot out of the muck, but his magic just wasn't strong enough. All the rampaging air managed to do was buffet the trees around and knock a few limbs down. The lower Perot sank, the weaker Baxter got. He was sinking too, struggling to keep himself aloft as Perot gasped for air. Perot's eyes caught us on the cliff. Children, he shouted. Go away from here. This isn't something you can see. We'll get you out, I yelled back. It's too late. Leave, Perot coughed, the thick tar rising up to his chin. He already considered himself a goner. Not on my watch. We need to find a teacher, Jonah said. He went to run back the way he came, but I snagged him by the arm to hold him back. There's no time. He'll be dead by the time we get help. We're going to have to work together, I said. I raised my hands. My power searched the tar pit below for some sort of liquid. It was in there, but it wasn't much. I gritted my teeth and tried to make the liquid beneath Perot move upward. I managed to budge him up for a moment, but once I let go, he sank right back down. There isn't enough water in there for me to manipulate. Tar is earth. Do you think you could try, Imogen? I asked. I can. She took a deep breath and stepped forward. She raised a hand toward the tar pit. We stood around her in a circle, waiting for something to happen. The tar pit bubbled and rumbled, but nothing else happened. Imogen gasped and dropped her hand. I can't. Imogen wiped a bit of sweat from her brow. I'm sorry, Liam, but I'm just a first year. If I had a bit more experience, I could. Fire won't help. If I try to burn it, he'll be killed in seconds, Sophia said. Air is already useless, Jonah said grimly, staring at Baxter. We're going to have to figure out another way. I put my hand to my mouth and thought. We had ten minutes, maybe, before Perot went under. But if our powers didn't work to get him out, what would? There, Sophia interrupted my train of thought by pointing to a loosely hanging tree branch Baxter had blown free. She walked up to the branch and ripped it off, handing it to Jonah. Jonah, can you get your familiar to dangle this over the professor? Maybe she can yank him out, Sophia said. Worth a shot, Jonah replied. He handed the branch to Squeaks, who took it with her beak. She flew over Perot and dangled the branch over him. Professor, grab the branch and she'll pull you out, Sophia cried. Professor Perot reached up to grab the branch. Once he had a hold of it with two hands, Squeaks pulled. His upper body rose out of the tar, but from the waist down, he was still stuck. No matter how hard Squeaks pulled, she couldn't yank him free. It's not working, Jonah said. He appeared tired at Squeaks' struggle. She's not strong enough. Sophia looked desperately at me. I got an idea. Here, I pulled the rope Haley had thrown at me out of my pocket. It was just long enough. I tied a loop, then handed the end of it to Sophia, Imogen, and Jonah. We'll slide down the embankment, then get this around him. With all of us, we should be able to pull him out. Sophia nodded. Right. This was way dangerous. We had an equal chance of falling in and getting trapped ourselves. But there wasn't really any other plan. I slid down the embankment first, on my back, then Sophia followed, trailed by Imogen and Jonah. At the bottom was a thin strip of dirt we could stand on. Perot saw what we were doing, and his eyes widened. Don't risk your own lives, children. I'm not worth it, he yelled. Yes, you are, I said firmly. Let go of the stick for a moment. We'll lasso you and pull you to shore. Meekly, Perot did as he was told. I concentrated, focusing my eyes on him. We only had one rope. If I missed, it was game over. 
I tossed the rope, and thankfully it looped around Perot. He adjusted it so it was around his waist, then reached up to grab the branch Squeaks was dangling again. All together, Sophia shouted. Pull! We yanked on the rope. It wasn't an easy task. Perot really was stuck. Even with all of us pulling, he remained trapped. Harder, Sophia shouted. I know we can do this. Her confidence wasn't helping me, but it obviously did something for Jonah and Imogen, because Perot began to move through the tar toward us. Baxter flew forward and latched his talons under the branch Squeaks was holding, helping her pull up. Sassy lunged forward and sank her teeth into the rope to help Imogen pull. Essis hopped up and down on the cliff above and cheered us on. It's working, I shouted. Perot was getting closer and closer to shore. Keep pulling, he's almost there. With a monumental effort that was gonna pull out my back, all of us yanked at once. Perot came free of the tar pit and landed on shore, heaving. Squeaks dropped the branch and Baxter flew forward, landing on the shore and pecking at Perot's head. I'm fine, Baxter, Perot breathed. I'm fine. Professor, are you all right? I asked him. What were you even doing out here? I was looking for magical mushrooms for our class next week, before I tripped and stumbled down the embankment, Perot said. I didn't see the pit and fell in. I would have died if you and your familiars hadn't come along. Perot was obviously very weak, and his clothes were stuck to his body. Sophia moved forward and said, Come on, we've got to get him back to the castle. Shadows loomed overhead. We looked up and saw that Madame Doya was there with Naomi, as well as Head Dean Alric. Valda landed by his side, staring down the pit. She was an amethyst dragon with brilliant gemstone eyes that stared down in concern at Perot. Her large leathery wings blocked out a portion of the sun as she stared down at us. Perfect timing. Thanks for all the help, I grumbled. Perot, can you stand? Alric called down. I, I am strong enough to make it up the embankment, but not to walk much after, Perot said. We helped Perot up the hill before we climbed it ourselves. By this time, I was exhausted. I still had a long walk back to the castle before I sank into my nice, warm bed. With help from Alric, Perot climbed onto Valda's back and she spread her wings to take him to the medical wing. Now that Perot was out of the pit and safe, Baxter changed back into a regular peacock. He cooed as he followed behind Valda to safety. You children are remarkable. Thank you for risking your lives to save Perot's, Alric said to us. I'm afraid the situation would have ended quite differently if you weren't involved. Adam Doya and I were just on our evening walk before we heard the shouting. I dare say we wouldn't have reached him in time. The guy was practically astounded that we'd stuck out our necks to rescue a teacher. People had morals every now and then, didn't they? Madame Doya didn't look happy. In fact, it looked like she was almost displeased we'd saved Perot's life. <laughs> it's nothing. Don't mention it, Sophia said, smiling. Don't mention it? Are you kidding? I wanted to scream at her. Wasn't there some sort of award we'd get for this? Really? Yes, well... Alric forced a grimace at her. I think it'd be best if you return to your dormitories. I also think it best if we keep this between us and prevent gossip from spreading. Jonah nodded like a brainless doll, and I took the first opportunity I could to get the hell out of there. Great. You weren't even going to get any credit for this. All because of Sophia. Sophia, Imogen, and Jonah followed me back to the castle. I expected us to split up at the door, but they kept trailing me along with their quirky familiars. Essis was sitting on Sophia's shoulder again and was singing some sort of peppy tune. Ancestors, it was like the soundtrack to a sitcom or something, and I was living it. You guys want to eat together? Sophia gestured toward the dining hall. Her cheeks were a bit pink. I, well, usually I eat alone, but it'd be nice if you'd like to join. I'm in, Jonah rubbed his stomach and threw an arm around Squeaks. Me and Squeaks are always down for some grub. Imogen's smile spread wide at Sophia's invite. Sure, 
Liam, you want to come? I was starving, but I wouldn't be seen with them. I wanted some alone time. I'm not hungry. I'm heading back to my dorm. I turned my back before they said anything else. Sophia's face was crestfallen. I felt bad about being a dick, but still, I knew that I'd messed up. It was one thing to be polite and be acquaintances, maybe even friends, but being in a life or death situation was an entirely different story. I didn't want to be that close to anyone. I was supposed to be the lone wolf. I had formed a bond with these people, which was a critical mistake. The next day, Sophia was still following me around like a puppy dog, which was irritating. She couldn't stop talking about how amazing it was that we'd saved Perot. Since I wasn't getting some type of reward, I just wanted to forget about it. You were pretty cool yesterday, she commented after she'd caught me coming in from water class, and I groaned. You're a good leader. Don't say that. I don't like helping people, I growled. You helped me earlier. She leaned against a window in the hallway. Essis was in her arms, and he did that weird staring thing with his eyes again when he looked at me, his little mouth forming a tiny grin. That fluff ball was going to give me nightmares. Totally different. Uh-huh, sure it was. Sophia's tone was so smug, I no longer doubted she was a stolen coigny child. You were the one who came up with the plan, I said. I just helped. What I said earlier is true. We make a good team. Oh yeah, fire and water, great mix. I rolled my eyes. Think whatever you want, Soph. I didn't mean to call her that, but I did. She brightened like a light bulb and I wanted to hit myself. By the ancestors, it was so hard not to let her in. Out of the way, a teacher's loud shout caught my attention. Bane was clearing a path through the hallway, shoving students aside and directing them to get to the wall. A massive group of professors were behind them. Their faces were drawn and grim, not worried but accepting a dark fate. Students froze like statues, clinging to their familiars as they saw what was behind the teachers. Some creature was in the back of a wagon pulled by a black chimera, I couldn't tell what it was, because the animal was covered in a black velvet shroud. It was utterly still and didn't move. The sight of the black shroud caused my body to convulse. I gagged and almost threw up. Pangs of agony shot through my spine and spread throughout my back, and the room turned wavy. I got lightheaded. My body shuddered violently, and I turned away from Sophia so she wouldn't see pressing my head against the cool rock and shaking. Liam, I felt Sophia's soft hand on my back. Are you okay? I took a few deep breaths and blinked back tears. I'm fine. I forced myself to regain my composure and turned back, forced myself to watch the gruesome scene where I already knew what had happened. Behind the cart was a boy, Carter. He was from Yapluma, a guy was on either side of him helping him walk. Carter's face was ashen and his steps were staggering. The guys more or less carried him as he dragged his feet, his eyes dull and lifeless. All the color had gone out of him. It looked like someone had sucked everything out of him that made him himself. He said nothing, eyes staring straight ahead, dried tears on his expressionless void face. Saying he looked half alive would be a compliment. Carter was more or less a walking corpse. It was the scariest thing to witness. He was nothing, a shell. There wasn't anything left. I'd looked the same way when they brought me in. I felt the same way. I was the only one in this hallway who knew what Carter was feeling, because not so long ago I had been the one trailing behind that cart, staring at the lifeless form that had been Nishoma, buried under that black shroud. I jumped when I felt someone coming up behind me. It was Imogen. She snuck between the two of us and kept her voice low. You guys hear the news, she said. What's going on, Sophia asked, confused. I kept quiet and let Imogen explain. This was too painful for me. It's Carter. He and Tiara had an accident in flight class, Imogen whispered. My stomach sunk. 
What happened? Carter misdirected her. They hit a tree, and Tiara spun out into the target they were supposed to fly through. It impaled her through the heart, Imogen hushed. She died while they were trying to get her back to the medical wing. Imogen sighed. Poor kid. He did so much, too. Volunteered for the community, captain of the sports teams and everything. All that's done now, but at least he accomplished something while he was here. I felt like I was going to throw up again. Sophia was really pale. Horrified screams began echoing down the hallway. The girls turned their heads, but I just closed my eyes and wished it was over. When the wailing got louder, I was forced to look. I knew him, James from Nevita. He was beside himself. A couple of girls tried to comfort him as he sobbed. His screams shook the walls as tears streamed down his red face. He was cradling his small dragon familiar in his arms tightly. He couldn't fly on him yet, but I think that they were in flight class with Carter and Tiara too. I bet they'd watch the whole thing. Poor James, Imogen said softly. It's just so sad. Are James and Carter really close? Sophia asked. They're best friends, Imogen said lowly. Or they were. James knows he's gonna have to say goodbye soon. Carter's a goner. What do you mean? Sophia asked, and my heartbeat quickened. He's okay, isn't he? Imogen shook her head. No, he's not. Elementi can't live without their familiars and vice versa. Carter's as good as dead. You mean, if you lose your familiar, you die? Sophia hushed her voice as the procession passed us by. Imogen waited until the group was gone before she nodded solemnly. Yep, it's how it works. You can't survive without your soul. There was a lump in my throat that was hard to swallow. Yeah, except for me. How, how long can you survive without your familiar? Sophia said, pulling Essis closer to her. Imogen shrugged. If you're older a few weeks, months maybe, but students rarely last a few days. I'll be surprised if Carter makes it through the night. The bond is still too fresh. Nobody outlives their familiar for long. Imogen shot a look at me. Well, except for Liam. What? Sophia physically jumped into the air and I cringed. Liam's familiar is dead? Thanks for reminding me, I said sourly. That comment hurt. It felt like she'd slap me or something. Her jaw fell slack. Liam, I, you mean you didn't know? Imogen's eyes went wide and she gave an apologetic look toward me. I'm sorry, Liam, I didn't mean. It's okay, Imogen, I told her quietly. You lost your familiar? I didn't know you'd bonded. Sophia's face was shocked and in pain. How? I don't want to talk about it, I said immediately. I didn't want her to press, but she was Sophia, so she did anyway. But I, I don't want to talk about it, Sophia. My tone was so harsh, she physically recoiled away. I took a walk before she could ask me more questions, and before I said something I would regret. Carter died sometime in the night, as I knew he would. He wasn't strong enough to survive for long after Tiara died. Lucky bastard. The school was a little somber the next morning, but mostly normal. It wasn't unusual for students or familiars to cork off around here. People died every year in the Elemental Cup, after all. Students were given resources on what to do if they were struggling. Carter and Tiara's funeral date was announced, and that was it. I avoided Sophia. I couldn't face her now that she knew what was wrong with me. I caught her chasing after me a couple of times to apologize, but I managed to duck out and get away from her every time. I knew the moment was coming where she'd be creeping outside the Tawakwa dorm waiting for me to come out. So I more or less held myself hostage in my room so she wouldn't be able to find me. I knew I could only run from her for so long. We had class together after all. That didn't mean I wanted to see her a moment before I was forced to. It hurt too much to face her. When Ezra told me that Bane wanted to see me, I knew I had to leave my room. I hoped Sophia didn't bump into me on the way. But my brother looked worried. 
He wouldn't tell me what it was about when I pressed him. I strolled down to Bain's office, thinking that this was finally the moment where I'd be expelled and they were making my house head tell me. Bain was hunched over his desk, papers and books scattered everywhere. Little fairies, glowing bright with white light, zoomed around him and made chirping noises. He ignored them, face grim as I weaved my way around the various trinkets and objects scattered around the room. A carved staff, a few totems, lots and lots of artifacts from his travels around the world were placed in every open spot available. Statues, paintings, and scrolls were literally stacked against the walls in piles. Bane had been an explorer for the Hawkeye before he became a teacher, venturing through ancient crypts and tombs for the elders. I had no idea why he gave up such a cool position just to grade papers for lazy college kids. Maybe after all those years, he just gave up on whatever he was looking for. By the ancestors, it was such a mess in here. Bane was a disgusting slob. No wonder he hadn't found a woman to put up with him. You wanted to see me? I asked as I came to a stop at his desk. My shoe crunched a papyrus map and kicked a small golden sculpture. I hoped they weren't important. I wanted to warn you before your summons came, Bane started. Summons? For the elemental cup. My entire body turned cold. I think I literally shivered. Even the fairy lights in the room seemed to dim. Why would they be summoning me? I'm not competing. Yes, you are. I hoped this was some sort of sick joke, but Bane was completely serious. The elders have decided that despite your loss, you will be competing in the cup anyway. It's the only way for you to prove your worth to the tribe. If you don't participate, you'll be exiled. You know what that means, Liam. I was going to be sick. This was sick. I got that the cup was some sort of coming-of-age ceremony for every elementi, and that the elders wanted everyone to compete. But without Nishoma, I'd die out there, and probably get my teammates killed, too. I can't enter the cup. I don't have a familiar anymore. Nishoma's gone, I argued. I'm sorry, Liam, but the rules are absolute, Bane said firmly. It doesn't matter that you lost Nishoma. All elementi who bonded with a familiar over the previous year are required to enter the tournament in order to continue their education at Orenda Academy. That includes you. I'm sorry. You don't have a choice. A pit of horror formed in my gut, growing larger with each passing second. It didn't matter that my familiar was dead. I was being forced to enter the tournament anyway. Chapter 10 Life at Arenda Academy was lonely, especially now that Liam was avoiding me, but Essis made everything better. He was my constant companion everywhere I went and cheered me up every time I felt like I was missing home. It was like he could feel my emotions and knew exactly how to make me happy. Usually he just snuggled into my hair, but one night he actually fanned my hair out on my pillow and gave me the most amazing scalp massage. I didn't care what anyone said about my furry little bundle of joy. He was one of the most amazing, intelligent creatures I'd ever met. But even Essis couldn't ease my anxiety when it came to dinner time. I stepped into the cafeteria with Essis on my shoulder, knowing I had nowhere to sit. The room was vast, with hundreds of tables situated in rows throughout the room, and modern-day booths lining the outer wall. Near the main entrance sat a buffet line piled with some of the most delicious food I'd ever tasted. On the opposite side of the main doors were heating trays with foil-wrapped burgers and wraps that people could take back to their dorms. The cafeteria was bathed in natural brown tones, with soft lighting that made it look like a fancy restaurant. Along the far wall, a huge mural depicted each house's element from left to right. The orange Kowigny fire faded into green trees for Navita, which swirled into purple wisps for Yapluma, and finally blue waves for Toaqua. I'd noticed that there seemed to be an unwritten rule about sitting closest to your element in the mural, with Kowigny always sitting toward the left of the room, Toaqua on the right, 
and Navita and Yapluma in the middle. As I stepped into the buffet line, I eyed the Coigny section, knowing that if I was going to stay in the cafeteria for dinner, I'd probably have to sit over there. The room was packed with people and their familiars and buzzed with conversation. I didn't notice a single empty table in the Coigny section. I contemplated whether I should introduce myself to someone or just claim one of the empty tables in another section. It was like I was in middle school all over again. I made it through the buffet line and stared out at the crowd. I decided to take the easy route and just sit at an empty table when a guy passed by me and his elbow knocked into my shoulder. My tray jumped in my hands and my plate went flying. The ceramic clattered to the floor and my potatoes and gravy went everywhere. Watch where you're going, the guy snarled before continuing on his way to the Coigny section. Of course he's Coigny, I thought as I bent to clean up the mess. Essis jumped down from my shoulder and began licking at the mashed potatoes on the floor. Ew, Essis, don't do that, I scolded, pulling him away from the potatoes. He already had most of them cleaned up. Here you go, a pair of hands shot out in front of my face, offering me a pile of napkins. I glanced up to see Imogen dressed in a floral dress that suited her figure but had way too many ruffles on it. Her hoop earrings nearly touched her shoulders, and her hair had been twisted into three separate braids. Her heels were shiny blue like metallic nail polish, with four-inch heels whose points split into three different directions in the shape of bird talons. They looked like something from one of those runway shows where the models wear the most ridiculous things but the outfits never hit the market. Thanks, I said shyly, taking the napkins from her. Imogen gestured to Sassy in the tote bag that hung from her shoulder. Sassy and I were just going to sit down. Do you want to join us? Sure, I answered far too quickly while I mopped up my spilled food. Excellent, Imogen clapped her hands together. We sit over there, in that booth. She pointed to a large booth in the corner of the room. Toaqua occupied the tables surrounding it, but Imogen didn't seem to notice. I stood, with my pile of dirty napkins piled atop my tray. I'll join you in the buffet line. I need a new plate anyway. Several minutes later, we slid into our booth in the corner. I sat across from Imogen and faced the wall. I felt more comfortable not being able to see the eyes I knew were on me. Essis jumped down from my shoulder and sat beside me. He placed his little hands on the edge of the table, but he could barely see over the top of it. I was going to need to get this little guy a booster seat. How are you liking Arenda Academy so far? Imogen asked. Oh, I glanced down, completely taken off guard by the question. It's, um, okay. Oh, right, she said, wrinkling her nose. You're Coigny. You probably have Doya. The professors make all the difference. I'm really bummed I didn't get the guy I wanted for my culture's studies class. He's a total dreamboat. I mean, for an old guy. I just nodded along. How many classes are you taking? She asked. Not many, I answered. I'm only taking the minimum amount of credits, which I guess is good because I'm going to need the extra time to practice my fire. I know what you mean, she agreed. Beginner Navita magic is already kicking my butt, and I have it almost every day of the week. Me too, I said. Beginner Coigny magic takes up most of my schedule. Then I'm in medical care of familiars a few days a week. I have my first Dragonology class tomorrow. Ooh, Imogen said in excitement. I'm in dragonology too. I smiled. It'd be nice to know someone in each of my classes. So, what's the dealio? Imogen asked, discreetly dropping a piece of meat to the floor, which Sassy promptly followed and scarfed up. Is that all you're going to eat? I glanced down at my meat and potatoes. Are you kidding? This looks delicious. Sure, if you're bored of traditional Hawkeye food, she agreed. But you aren't even taste testing half of what they have at the buffet. Are you going to get adventurous or what? I tucked a strand of hair behind my ear. I tend to play things safe. Ah, Imogen said in understanding as she took a bite of food. Well, not today, girly. Here, 
Try a bean. Imogen pushed a long purple bean pod onto my plate. It was slathered in some sort of oil and spices and didn't look appetizing in the slightest. What is it? I asked, unable to keep the skepticism out of my voice. Imogen shrugged. We call them magic beans. The ancestors blessed them ages ago and they prospered in this area. They're like a green bean. I poked the bean with my fork and held it up to examine it. But it's purple. So? Purple vegetables are delicious, Imogen said. Beets, eggplant, carrots. Um, carrots are orange. Imogen shook her head. Carrots weren't orange until the 17th century. Now, eat up. Trusting her judgment, I put the bean to my mouth and bit into it. To my surprise, it was juicy and delicious, like the best green bean I'd ever tasted. Good, right? Imogen asked with raised eyebrows as she dropped another piece of meat on the floor for Sassy. Delicious, I agreed. But are you supposed to be doing that? I glanced around the dining hall and couldn't help but notice that Imogen was the only person feeding her familiar regular food. Other familiars just sat there watching people eat. Imogen lowered her voice. Not really, but you won't tell, will you? Sassy's a fussy eater. I shook my head. I won't tell. What about him? She cocked her head toward Essis. What does he eat? I don't know, I admitted. I talked to this guy at the Familiar Nutrition Center, but he didn't know anything about Essis' diet. He suggested he might like bugs, but when I tried to go digging for worms, Essis turned up his nose at them. The only thing I've gotten him to eat so far is burgers from the takeout line. Essis was barely the size of my head, but I swore he ate more than I did. I was pretty sure there was a black hole in the pit of his stomach somewhere. The trash can full of wrappers in my dorm room was proof of his appetite. I wasn't sure where all the food went. I was just grateful I didn't have to pay for it and that all our food was sponsored by the school. As long as he doesn't starve, that's all that counts, right? Imogen said. I smiled. I could really get used to Imogen's positive attitude. After that night dining with Imogen, I didn't have to sit alone in the dining hall anymore. Imogen was there every night, and she always stood and waved me over as soon as I filled my tray. At first, I thought it was strange, like she was trying to draw attention to herself, but I'd come to realize that was just part of Imogen's over-the-top personality. She honestly didn't even notice the attention. Strangely, I felt comfortable in her presence. It was easier to ignore the eyes on us with her around. Three weeks passed, and Liam had managed to avoid me the entire time. He'd skipped out on our medical care class the first week following the tar pit incident. When he returned the next week and Professor Costas instructed us to pair up, he didn't even look at me. He headed straight for his lumberjack friend, Jonah. I got stuck with a first-year Toaqua who wouldn't even look me in the eye. But, thanks to Liam, I was actually making progress with my fire. I sat on the rocks next to the river almost every night, practicing conjuring and manipulating flames. Essis perched on a rock beside me. He clapped and trilled as if he were my own personal cheerleader. I hoped that with enough practice, Madame Doya would stop looking down her nose at me in fire class. So far, no such luck. It's just a piece of wood, Doya shouted in class one day. I'm not asking you to set the entire forest on fire. The class stood in a line facing the room's massive fireplace. A small log atop a cast iron firewood grate five feet in front of each person. We were each to light our log on fire from a distance. Madame Doya paced down the line of students, analyzing each of us as she went. Naomi prowled behind the logs, watching for any signs of flame. I laser-focused my attention on the log in front of me. I did as Liam had instructed and focused on pulling my anger to the surface. I didn't like that I was angry all the time these days. I'd grown up learning how to control my emotions, but I had to throw all that out the window if I was to survive at this school. It's embarrassing you're trying so hard, Hudson, Doya scolded the guy next to me. 
This should be simple for you. I couldn't help it when my gaze flickered from my log. Hudson looked like he was suffering from a hernia. Poor guy. Stand straight, Tabitha, Doya yelled to a girl at the other end of the room. Conjuring fire takes confidence. Just as she said it, Haley's log burst into flame. Haley squealed in excitement and high-fived Kelsey beside her. The phoenix on her shoulder ruffled its feathers in delight. Haley's eyes caught mine on hers, and her face instantly fell. She glanced to my log and smirked. Tiny little hands grabbed my ear. Essis tugged on me until I finally tore my gaze off Haley. He made three quick noises and pointed to my log. He settled back into his spot on my shoulder and wrapped my hair around his body. It was hard to find my anger when he was a constant comfort. The smell of burning wood filled the air as two other logs lit up in flames. Beside me, the bark on Miranda's log was slowly shriveling as embers burnt the delicate outer layer. Sophia! Madame Doya's harsh voice called. There it was, that noise that was sure to get my blood boiling. I could already feel my skin heating. Yes, I asked, trying to sound cool and collected. I didn't want to give her anything else to yell at me about. Madame Doya held her nose high as she made her way over to me. We don't have all day. You're bonded now, which means your powers should be easier to access. I expected your log to light long before any of your classmates. Yes, Madame Doya, I said through gritted teeth. I'm doing my best. Then why, dare I ask, is your log not on fire yet? My teeth gritted as I focused on my log. I was going to light this bitch on fire if she didn't stop pestering me. Nothing was ever good enough for her. Madame Doya stood there, observing. I could feel her eyes on me as all the tiny little hairs on the back of my neck stood up. Naomi stopped behind my log. She gave it a good sniff before turning her face down in dissatisfaction. She was almost as bad as Doya. I felt my magic rise within me, but I didn't know how to direct it across the space between me and my log. Still, I tried. I pictured my magic flowing through the hardwood floor because I thought it'd be easier than air to go through. The smell of burning hair filled my nose. A second later, Naomi leapt backward. I just barely caught sight of the patch of singed fur on her paw before she burst into flame. Literally. Essis buried his face in my hair and I stumbled backward, completely shocked. The back of my knees hit into one of the couches and I fell onto it. My eyes widened. Every inch of Naomi's fur lit up with orange flames. I could still make out the shape of her face through the fire, but the blonde fur was nowhere to be seen, as if the fire had replaced it all. Holy guacamole! Had I lit Naomi on fire? I didn't mean to. Except, Naomi didn't scream. She didn't back away in pain. It was like the flame engulfing her body didn't hurt her at all. Instead, she stood rigid her flaming eyes fixed on me. I'm sorry, I cried. I, I didn't mean to. The whole class watched as Madame Doya stepped forward and placed a calm hand on Naomi's flaming body. Calm down, Naomi. Naomi's ragged breathing slowed and the flames died down. Her blonde fur returned, untouched, but she never took her eyes off me. I was frozen in shock, though my heart hammered. What had just happened? Madame Doya whirled toward me, her lips tight. We do not harm other people's familiars, Sophia. Except that Doya looked like she was two seconds from ripping Essis off my shoulder and snapping his neck in revenge. I held him closer to me, just in case she decided to try anything. I'm sorry! I repeated, stumbling over my words. I don't know what happened. I think it's obvious, Madame Doya raged. You burnt Naomi's paw. I did what? So, 
those flames, I didn't do that? I asked slowly. Madame Doya furrowed her brow. Then realization dawned. You can't even light a simple piece of wood on fire. Naomi is a fire lion. It takes much more power than you're capable of to engulf a creature like her. I stared at Naomi just so I wouldn't have to look Doya in the eye. Naomi's gaze was almost as equally terrifying. When my eyes jumped to the other side of the room, I saw that Haley was standing with her arms folded over her chest, a look of amusement on her face. I should have burnt her instead. Madame Doya turned to the other students. We'll pick up here later this week. I expect everyone to be able to accomplish this task by the end of class on Thursday. Class dismissed. Everyone scrambled across the room to grab their things and hurry out the door. I was still shaking in shock, though Essis tried to comfort me by rubbing his fluffy belly against the skin on my neck. It helped a bit, but I wasn't about to waste any more time. I wouldn't be left alone in this room with Doya. I hurried to my feet and grabbed my bag at my desk. I filed out of the room with everyone else. In the wide hallway, I felt like I could finally breathe. Students broke off in both directions. Some headed to the cafeteria, others to their next class, and some back to the Coigny dorms. I tried to stay away from the dorms as often as I could. The Coigny common room wasn't a welcoming place, and when I tried to find some peace and quiet in my own room, there was usually someone giggling in the hall while the scent of smoke wafted from under the crack in my door. They thought they were hilarious. I thought they were idiots. I quickened my pace toward the doors at the end of the hall, but I stopped dead in my tracks when I caught sight of a man with dark hair and a strong build. Liam. He leaned against the big stone lip that outlined one of the tall castle windows. He was surrounded by a group of five other people. A large, multicolored bird that fluttered around like a hummingbird hovered above one girl's head. A guy almost as big as Jonah was petting the ears of a stag that appeared like it crawled straight from Mother Earth's lair. It had forest green fur with twisted antlers that looked like bark-covered tree branches sticking out of its head. I wasn't great at spotting the differences between houses yet, but judging by the guy's size and his familiar, he was definitely Navita. Liam faced away from me, but I could tell by the way his shoulders shook that he was laughing at something the Navita guy said. Of course because he only acted like he had a stick up his ass when he was around me. He didn't notice me. Now would be a perfect time to finally catch him and apologize. My feet started moving in his direction before I even decided to approach him. I cleared my throat. Liam? No way was he escaping on me this time. I totally had him cornered. Liam turned around. Only it wasn't Liam. I mean, he looked like Liam. He had the same muscular build, same long black hair and dark skin. He even had the same eyes. But the shape of his nose and his jawline were off by just a hair. Liam Clone smiled at me. Inside, I was screaming in embarrassment. Instinct told me to flee. But before I could, Liam Clone spoke. Sorry to disappoint you. He smirked. I took a step back. I'm so sorry. He shrugged. Hey, it's okay. I can pretend to be Liam if you'd like. Liam Clone stood straighter. His eyebrows tightened and the corners of his lips turned down as he deepened his voice. I'm Liam Mito. I swear by the ancestors that I will sulk around until the day I die. I totally lost it. His voice was spot on, and he looked exactly like Liam when he scrunched his face up like that. I could almost believe I was looking right at him. Liam Clone's face relaxed, and he laughed along with me. That was a really good impression, I said, giggling. I would hope so, he replied. I've had a lot of practice imitating my brother. It gets on his nerves. You're Liam's brother? I shouldn't have been shocked. I mean, the guys were practically identical twins. Yep, Ezra, he introduced, sticking his hand out. I shook it. Sophia! Ah, he nodded his head in recognition. You're the pain in his ass. 
Essis drew in a breath of surprise. He didn't take well to crude language. My shoulders slumped involuntarily. He calls me that? Not directly, Ezra said with a roll of his eyes, like it was just a joke. Still, the statement bothered me. What if Liam hated me? I mean, it explained why he'd been avoiding me. I wasn't sure what I'd done wrong besides mention his familiar, and I'd been trying for three weeks to apologize for it. Was it really that bad? Hey, Ezra said softly. The laughter in his voice had vanished. I didn't mean it like that, I just... Ezra, the Navita guy interrupted. Ezra looked at him. We've got to head to class, but we'll catch you later, okay? Yeah, no problem. Ezra waved as his friends headed down the hall. He turned back to me, but I knew he was just going to say something about his brother. I didn't want to talk about Liam, so I spoke before Ezra could. That guy with the stag is Navita, isn't he? I asked. Yeah, Ezra confirmed with a shrug. I thought people from different houses weren't supposed to be friends. I'd been sure that was one of the reasons people stared at Imogen and me so much at dinner. Where'd you hear that? He asked. My brother? I nodded, though Haley had mentioned it too. Don't listen to him, Ezra said. He takes things like that way too seriously. He makes a bigger deal out of most things than they are. Oh, I said flatly. Liam sure sounded serious about everything. Ezra's gaze traveled past me and his eyes lit up. Speak of the devil. I turned around to see Liam, the real Liam, headed down the hall toward us. He took one look at me and whirled around in the opposite direction. He wasn't even sneaky about it. It was obvious he saw me. What's up with him? Ezra thought aloud. He's mad at me, I admitted in a small voice. He avoids me every chance he gets. Ezra looked amused. My brother can be a real ahem sometimes. Come on, he's not getting away this time. Ezra jogged forward, calling out Liam's name. Liam quickened his pace but didn't look back, pretending as if he hadn't heard him. I followed quickly behind. Ezra reached Liam and draped an arm around his shoulder. Hey, brother, Ezra said casually, just as I caught up with them. Hey, Liam replied without emotion. Sophia tells me you've been acting like a dick lately. I did not, I objected. Yeah, well, it's true, isn't it? Ezra glanced between both of us, grinning. Liam stopped walking and stood rigid. He still hadn't looked at me. Maybe you should mind your own business, Ezra. Maybe you should learn some manners, his brother bit back. Sophia said she's been trying to apologize and you've been avoiding her. The least you can do is let her say what she wants to say, and then the two of you can go your separate ways. Liam's nostrils flared. He and Ezra stood eye to eye, staring at each other. Fine. Liam looked down at me expectantly. It suddenly occurred to me that I had no idea what I wanted to say to him. I just knew I had to say something or I'd never get the chance. I swallowed. I'm sorry. Is that it? Liam asked with raised eyebrows. He turned to leave. No, I said quickly, stopping him. I'm sorry I freaked out about your familiar. I know it really has to hurt, and I get why you're upset. My reaction was uncalled for. I hope we can still be friends, if you're okay with that. Liam's features hardened when I said the word friends. I wasn't sure if he'd ever considered us friends. The realization broke my heart. I waited for him to actually admit it out loud, but before he could say anything, a voice cut through the silence. Liam, Sophia, just the two people I was looking for. A man with messy gray hair and salt and pepper stubble approached us. His eyes were young and free of wrinkles, though they looked tired. I guessed he was around my parents' age, despite the premature graying of his hair. The man wore khakis and a baby blue button-down shirt tucked into his slacks. He had one of the sweetest, caring smiles I'd ever seen. He seemed like the kind of person who was always under constant stress, but told the best dad jokes. 
I immediately noticed Imogen and Jonah following behind him. Jonah's hippogriff glanced up at a small dragon statue and almost tripped over her own feet. What is it, Bane? Liam suddenly seemed less annoyed. Bane, where had I heard that name before? I quickly recalled that he was the one who sent the periton for Liam and me to get to school. We were headed to lunch, Bane said, gesturing to Jonah and Imogen beside him. Would you like to join us? He says he has great news. Imogen bounced on her toes. Sassy peeked out from the bag hanging from Imogen's shoulder. What kind of news? I asked curiously. We can talk about that once we get our food, Bane said kindly. I'm not hungry, Liam declined. Bane shot him a look I didn't quite understand. You should come along anyway. How about you, Ezra? Are you hungry? Nah, Ezra replied. Thanks for the invite, but I'm actually going to be late for History of the Hawkeye as it is. I'll catch up with you later. Ezra strolled away casually, walking in a cocky manner with his head thrown back. As he walked down the hallway, about ten different people from all houses waved or acknowledged him in some way. It was clear Ezra was the golden boy, the Academy's most popular student. He had this air around him that was hard to resist. It didn't matter what house you were from. It was obvious people loved him and wanted to be around him. Unlike his brother. He and Liam were totally different. He said he was going to history. Why wasn't I enrolled in that class? I was sure it'd be helpful. The library didn't exactly have many published books on the Hawkeye. I'd tried looking for them and didn't find any. Shall we go? Bane suggested, like he wasn't giving Liam a choice. We followed behind him. So, what do you think of Bane? Imogen whispered to me from several paces back. I shrugged. I don't know. He's hot, right? She wiggled her eyebrows. My eyes darted to the back of Bane's head. He's the professor you think is hot? Imogen blushed. Ew, Imogen, he's like 50. Imogen grinned. Yeah, 50 shades of sexy. I almost gagged. If you're into the disheveled look. He's not disheveled, Imogen argued. He's sophisticated. When you said an older guy, I thought you meant in his 30s, not old enough to be your father. Imogen smirked. All I'm saying is that if I needed to sleep with someone to boost my grade, I would... Dear Lord! I cut her off as we reached the cafeteria. Please, don't finish that sentence. Imogen just shrugged and hurried into the line. Bane suggested we eat outside, so we all grabbed pre-made wraps from the takeout line. These weren't like the usual wraps I ate back home. They were made with a fried flatbread and filled with beef, beans, corn, and a delicious seasoning that was the perfect blend of sweet and spicy. I wasn't sure if the cooks at Arenda used magic in the food here, but sometimes I wondered. It even beat my dad's cooking, and he was the best cook I knew. I pushed the thought away. I couldn't bear to think about my parents. I missed them too much. What's wrong? Imogen asked. You don't like the wraps? They're great, I replied, glancing down at the wraps in my hand. One for me and one for Essis. Bane led us outside to a grassy hill with a clear view of the ocean through the trees. A pleasant breeze passed through my hair as I sat. I handed Essis his wrap, and he jumped down from my shoulder. He pulled the plastic wrap off and gobbled his food down before I'd even bitten into mine. I giggled at him as he snuggled into my lap. So, what's the news? Imogen asked eagerly as she plopped down in the grass beside me. Sassy rolled around in front of her. Imogen pulled a plastic container from her bag, and I nearly gagged when she opened it. The thing was stuffed to the brim with fluffy white carcasses. She pulled out a dead mouse by the tail and tossed it in the air. Sassy caught it in her mouth before it hit the ground. On the other side of Bane, where Jonah and Liam sat, Squeaks gave a jealous squawk. I'm sorry, Imogen said gently to the hippogriff. She turned to Jonah. Do you mind? 
Jonah answered with a full mouse. Go ahead. Imogen tossed another mouse into the air. Squeaks swallowed it in one gulp. Ew, Jonah, I complained. Can you not chew with your mouth open? Sophia hates it, Imogen said with a teasing smile. She knew I couldn't stand the guy who usually sat two tables away from us and always chewed like his parents had never taught him proper table manners. Jonah took another huge bite and chewed loudly, taking extra care to keep his mouth open as much as possible, like he didn't care in the slightest. A smirk touched the corner of his lips. Liam scowled at Jonah's gross display. Imogen just giggled. Bane leaned back on one hand. It's nice spending time with friends, isn't it? Get to the point, Bane, Liam groaned. He hadn't taken a single bite. Bane sighed. I was getting there. You do consider each other friends, don't you? Of course, Imogen said before Liam could deny it. He would have. I just knew it. Good, Bane said with a nod of his head. Because the four of you will be spending a lot of time together. I've requested you be placed on the same team for the Elemental Cup. I will serve as your mentor. What? Liam exploded, shooting to his feet. This is bullshit. First I'm forced to participate. Now I'm placed on the reject team? Essis's ears perked up. He didn't like that comment. Neither did I. Jonah rose to his feet beside Liam. Calm down, dude. I understand that you're feeling... You don't understand shit, Liam snapped. At least you have squeaks. You might actually survive out there with her. For me, this is a death sentence. There's a reason I put you four on a team together, Bane said calmly. I'm aware of what happened at the tar pit. Based on what I heard, you four worked together well. No one's going to let you die in the tournament, Liam. Yeah, Imogen agreed. We won't leave you behind. That doesn't matter, Liam growled. I still don't have a chance. You do, Bane countered. Do you know what the leading cause of injury during the tournament is? Liam's jaw tightened, but he didn't answer. Death and injury occur when teams don't work together, Bane explained. Accidents occur when there are disagreements, when a team member runs off thinking they can get through an obstacle alone, or when someone tries to show off their strength instead of working together. If you let your team members help you, they won't let you down. Liam's hands clenched into fists. I'm not sure I can believe that. The look Liam shot me was like a knife through the heart. My chest compressed. He had to know I would do everything I could to help one of my teammates. The thing was, I didn't think it was that he didn't trust me. He didn't think I was capable. Liam's right. My voice barely broke through the lump in my throat. This isn't a good team. We'll never work together. It killed me to say those words. I didn't even realize how true they were until they came out of my mouth. I'm sorry, Bane said regretfully. I didn't realize you felt that way about each other. But there's no changing teams now. You're stuck with this team until the elemental ball. There's a ball? I asked. Lovely. Because a dance was just what I needed when the one guy I might have said yes to hated my guts. Yes, Bane replied. It takes place following the tournament. It's a celebration to present the participants as full members of the tribe. Please, Liam scoffed. It's a party to celebrate the winners. We all know that. Jonah frowned. We have no chance of winning with that kind of attitude. Who said I wanted to win? Liam asked. I couldn't help but feel that Liam had a point. I just wanted to survive. My jaw clenched as my anger once again surfaced. You're all capable of winning, Bane assured him. But you'll have to set your differences aside. You must choose to work together. Why? What's the point? Liam snapped. I agree. I couldn't believe I'd said the words until they escaped my mouth. 
As soon as I started, I couldn't shut them off. I was forced to come here. I left my family and my entire life behind. Now I'm told I have to team up with the guy who dragged me here if I want to live? This was bull. All of it. I just wanted to go home. I wanted to see my family again. I didn't even care about Amelia's teasing or Dad's stinky socks. I missed Mom's hugs and Dad's deep belly laugh. I missed driving into the city to shop at the mall all day with my friends. I missed my own bed and all the memories I left behind. The only good thing about Arenda was Essis, and maybe Imogen. I'd thought there was more to Liam, too, but now I wasn't sure. Bane looked completely dumbstruck. I'd surprised everyone with my outburst. The elemental cup tests and secures your bond with your familiar, Bane said slowly. It also tests your ability to work with other elementi and determines your place in society. It's my understanding that you're here for a reason, Sophia. That reason being the very thing you left behind. My parents. I knew exactly what he was saying. If I didn't play my part, I'd no longer be able to protect my parents. I recalled how Amelia said my parents' familiars could be killed for my parents' crimes. If what Imogen told me was true, that Elementi didn't live long without their familiars, my parents were as good as dead. I'd never let that happen. I had only one choice. Suck it up, work with Liam, and make sure he doesn't quit on us. Liam whirled around and started back toward the castle. I scooped up Essis in my arms and instantly chased after him. I didn't look back to see if anyone else was following. Liam, wait! I called. Liam stopped abruptly and spun to face me. I just want to be alone right now. He pierced me with his dark eyes. Though his eyebrows were tight, there was a softness in his eyes when he looked at me. My gaze flickered to his lips. I had the sudden urge to brush my lips against his, to take away his pain and make everything better. What am I thinking? Liam would never kiss me. He hates me. You want to survive, don't you? I blurted. Liam hesitated. Yeah, I guess so. So do I. Whether we like it or not, we need each other. Can't we just try to get along? When he didn't say anything, I added, For Imogen and Jonah's sake. Liam's features softened. If we have any chance of making it through that tournament, there's something we need to do first. My curiosity peaked. What's that? Liam sighed and glanced around, like he didn't want to talk about it out in the open. Meet me by the fountain next to the greenhouses tomorrow at dusk. We can talk then. Chapter 11 I headed down to the fountain the minute the sun was starting to cast the earth in a warm autumn glow. Ezra cried out something when I left the Toaqua dorms, but I ignored him. This was important. I couldn't be distracted right now from what I was trying to tell Sophia. She was about to get a huge wake-up call. When I saw her, I paused for a moment to observe. She was working on homework, crouched over a pile of papers that was sitting on an open textbook on her lap. She sat on the ground with a muddled expression I couldn't decipher, the fountain towering over her and looking like it was about to attack. Essis was on her shoulder, peering at her homework like he was reading it too. I noticed something strange. Sophia kept switching her pen from one hand to another, writing with both chewing on her bottom lip like she couldn't grasp what the book was trying to tell her. Can't decide which hand to write with, I asked as I approached. She looked up and grimaced a bit when she saw me. She was obviously in a mood. Essis, though, peeped and grinned like he'd never been more ecstatic to see me. Weirdo. I'm ambidextrous, Sophia said. I play with my hands when I get agitated. Hmm, she could use both hands equally. Dad once told me that was a sign of a strong elementi. Maybe she was someone I needed to watch out for and not someone who was weak. 
Why are you anxious? It's just, this work, I don't get it. Sophia huffed a stray strand that had fallen out of her ponytail away from her eyes. The Elementi world is confusing, but Coigny magic is the most frustrating of all. There's no rhyme or reason to it. What do you mean? For me, everything has to be even. Symmetrical, Sophia explained. I don't like when things are out of order, and Coigny magic, it's all feeling. Chaos isn't my thing. I can't handle it. I didn't say anything. Even after my help, Sophia was still struggling. She wanted perfection and organization, but fire was rampage and chaos. Sophia kept suppressing the part of herself that she was most, probably on account of being taught to suppress it by Toaqua parents, whether she knew it or not. She'd been raised like a water child, and she clearly wasn't. You couldn't put a square peg in a round hole. At some point or another, she was going to have to embrace who she was. Maybe she would, after today. Come with me, I said. I jerked my head in the direction of the forest. Sophia slammed her book and threw it in her bag. She went to fling it over her shoulders, but I shook my head. Leave it, I told her. It'll be here when you get back. You've still got your bag, she countered. It's got things we need, I insisted. Just do as I ask. She did. I turned into the forest with my hands in my pockets, and she followed, Essis wrapped tightly in her arms. We walked for about ten minutes before we came to the base of a mountain. It towered above us like a proud warrior who refused to move in spite of outstanding odds against it. A range of smaller mountains dotted the area around it and spanned along the seashore, but the one in front of us was the most prominent. It was craggy and spiked, and a thin dirt path wound its way up to the summit. The very top had snow dotted upon it, but we wouldn't go that far. She looked at me. Up? Up, I responded. It's a mile climb. There's a well-worn path. You can make it, I told her. Shut up, I go hiking all the time. I know I can make it, she muttered under her breath. I laughed under my breath before I took the lead. I was feeling well today, so I'd pick tonight to make this hike. There was no guarantee that I'd be able to tomorrow, and this couldn't wait. Sophia needed to know. I was out of breath pretty quickly, but I continued to put one foot in front of the other as we ascended the rocky slope. It was slow going, and we were silent. Sophia kept looking at me like she was concerned, and I hated it. I stumbled for a moment. She reached out to catch me with the hand that wasn't holding Essis, but I shoved it away. I've done this a million times. I don't need your help, I grumbled. She scowled. You're sick, aren't you? Define sick. God, she made it sound like I needed to be on bed rest. The nerve of this woman. She tilted her head. What's wrong with you? A part of me jerked inside, and I said, No one knows. She was looking at me in a way that physically hurt. I didn't want her stupid pity. I was just as normal as she was, just had a broken body. I wanted her to see me that way too, but I felt like that was wishing for the moon. When we finally reached the top, an inner peace washed over me and I was able to breathe normally again. This was my favorite view, hands down. The mountaintop looked down upon the entire forest and all of Arenda Academy. The castle was far below. From here you could see the masses of magical creatures flying around it. The summit we'd reached was a relatively flat space, a decently sized area of a few hundred feet that was encapsulated in a circle. The ground was nothing but dirt and rock with a few remnants of wooden bowls filled with incense people had brought up here. The sky had turned to a burning orange now, streaked with lines of red and purple. It cast the mountainside in a bright glow of warm, muddled colors mixed with elongating shadows. At the center of the circle was a large totem pole. It had the symbols of each of the houses, fire, air, water, and earth stacked upon each other, with Navida on the bottom as a growing leaf, Toaqua depicted as a rushing wave within a water droplet, 
Yapluma as a gust of wind, and Coigni symbolized by a singular flame. Coigni was only topped by one other totem, Anichi, the soul house. Anichi was commemorated with a complicated swirling design meant to symbolize the spirit. Sophia stared at the Anichi symbol like she didn't know what it meant. She was going to hear the whole sad story today. Essis hopped out of her arms and skittered around the totem pole, looking up at the Anichi totem with an unhappy expression. It was lonely up here, and quiet. I put my bag on the ground and turned to face her. What is this? Why did you bring me here? She asked. Sit down, Sophia, I gestured to the dirt below the totem. What, on the ground? She gave me a skeptical look. Yes, Sophia, I gave her a hard look. Today would be nice. She sat. I took out a tiny placemat that I made in basket weaving, yes, I was proud of it, thank you, and set it on the ground before I placed another group of items upon it. A stick of sage, a leather pouch mixed with various incenses, a small leather drum, and silver bells on a wristlet. Lastly was a wooden smudging wand with eagle feathers splayed out in a fan across the top and small designs carved into the wood. The wand was old and had been made with the feathers of my grandfather's familiar. It had been a present from my dad when I turned 18. Usually this type of thing would require more people. There'd be dances, multiple chanters, and songs that would go on for days. Elementi would be wearing ceremonial outfits, not jeans and t-shirts. People didn't just up and summon the ancestors on a whim, and definitely not on a Tuesday. I could get in trouble for this, but this was my birthright. It was something that I wasn't going to let be taken away from me. Sophia stared at me. Essis had left the totem to crawl into her lap. I sat on the ground and let my wrists hang off my knees. The first thing you need to understand is that there weren't four original houses, I said. There used to be five. What? Sophia reeled back. How? What happened to the fifth house? Let me start from the beginning. I cleared my throat. Hundreds of years ago, the Hawkeye had no power. They were just normal human beings, a tribe of people who sought to live in peace like anyone else. And for a long time, they did. My tone turned dark. Then the colonizers came. They brought all kinds of diseases our bodies couldn't fight off. They hunted down our food and stole our land. They hated us for our brown skin and customs that they considered strange. At first, we thought coexistence was possible, but more and more settlers kept coming, and they didn't want peace. They wanted us gone. There weren't enough of us to fight back. A war meant certain extermination. We were dying. Sophia looked down at the ground. Her expression was sad and a little muddled. Our shamans pleaded with the ancestors to save us from our fate. Suddenly the skies opened, and from them flooded a dazzling array of magical creatures, hundreds of them in number. When they reached the ground, our spirits fled out of our bodies and attached themselves to the creatures. Once the bond was set, we found we could control the elements, earth, water, air, fire, and soul. Sophia's eyes were as wide as Essis's now. The little guy perched on Sophia's arm, his ears up and listening intently. Though we had our creatures to defend us now, and our magic, we still knew we needed to hide. So we walked until we found a special place of seclusion, a world that was so far removed the colonizers didn't dare venture through it. The forests and mountains surrounding it were filled with deadly animals, thick tar pits and treacherous mountains. The weather was harsh and changed constantly. There was no gold and little room for farming. The strangers didn't want it. The land was dangerous, but we would make it work. We had our magic now, and we had our familiars. Then what happened? Sophia was immersed in the story. Essis's little tail waggled, and I smiled slightly. We knew we had to diversify to survive. You've noticed that there are a variety of races within the school. 
The elders believed the more footholds we had in cultures around the globe, the better chance we had if the colonizers found us again. Nevita and Yapluma went to places like Africa, South America, and Asia to find partners and bring them back here. At first it was for diplomatic reasons, but then people started falling in love. Coigny worked on mating with influential and rich Europeans to gain power. Toaqua is the most traditional house, so we stayed behind to manage the tribe, which is why I look like me and you look like you. I grinned at her. I always wondered about that, she cuddled Essis. Sometimes I don't think I've got any Hawkeye in me because I can't see any traits. Don't believe that. You've got Hawkeye blood in your veins just as much as I do, I told her. If you didn't, you wouldn't be able to summon fire. You wouldn't have been able to bond with Essis. Sophia stroked Essis's head and I continued. Arthur Cedric was a settler from Europe, but he wasn't like the others. He was a friend to the Hawkeye. He'd been outcasted from his family and from his town because he preached that the Hawkeye and the settlers needed to live in peace. When he had nowhere else to go, the tribe took him in. He used his large family fortune to build a castle here to remind him of those that he missed growing up in Scotland. He had no known heirs and offered the castle as a gift to the Hawkeye before he passed away. The elders used it to create Orenda Academy, a place where elementi could come to learn how to use their magic. The castle had been specially designed by Arthur's daughter, Anna, who wanted the estate to go to the Hawkeye and crafted it specifically for use of our powers. I thought you said Arthur had no known heirs. How could he have a daughter? Sophia asked. Anna died before Arthur. She had some sort of disease. Her illness was so strong, not even the Anichi could heal her, only prolong her life for a time, I explained. Arthur was so grateful for extending her life that he left us everything he had. So Anichi could heal? Sophia asked. Anichi was the strongest house. They had control of the spirit, of healing, I told her. They ruled each of the five houses equally. They had the power to heal Anna, at least for a time. If they were the strongest house, how come they aren't here anymore? Her eyebrows knitted together in confusion. Something horrible happened. Coigny destroyed them. I closed my eyes and shook my head. Coigny was jealous of the power that Anna Chi had and wanted it for themselves. That's awful, Sophia frowned. I nodded. Coigny was looking for something, some sort of object that only the Anichi had and that gave them the power to rule. Whatever it was became lost to legend, but the stories say that whoever had possession of this item could control the fate of the Hawkeye, even control the ancestors. Sophia held her breath and I continued. A great war broke out between the Anichi and the Coigny. The other houses tried not to get involved, which ended up to be a grave mistake. Tawakwa's, Navita's, and Yapluma's inaction led to the demise of Anachi House. Coigny completely destroyed them. Healing magic was gone with the Anachi. So was whatever the Coigny were looking for. I paused. This part was hard to explain. The Coigny felt like they were in charge now, but the destruction of Anachi brought upon the Elementi a terrible curse. Without the healing house, we could no longer heal ourselves or our creatures if disease or terrible injury came to one of the tribe. Neither could we communicate with the ancestors as easily as we once could, because with Anichi remained that gift. We no longer had a ruling house, so each of the houses became divided. We began to fight amongst ourselves, which led to more death and slaughter. We were killing each other faster than the settlers ever had, and worse yet, we were at risk of exposing ourselves to the outside world. The wind blew, casting a few strands of hair in front of my eyes. I swept them away and said, It became clear that after Anichi was destroyed that if we didn't stick together, the Elementi would die out. So we became forced to rely on each other for survival. We stopped mating with outsiders, and the elders ruled that people could only marry within their own houses. We stayed within the confines of the village instead of venturing outside except for rare occasions. Once Anichi was gone, everything changed. 
Elementi could no longer survive without their familiars as they could before. Our world had become different. I stopped speaking. I stooped down to slip the bell wristlet over my wrist and to pick up the drum. What are you doing? Sophia asked, totally confused. You need to see that this is more than just a story, I told her. I started playing a steady beat on the drum. Every time I brought my hand down, the bells on my wrist jingled until the drum and the bells were creating a harmonious rhythm. Sophia didn't know the Hawkeye language, but I did. I made low chants in my throat, repeating a song that my father had drilled into my head from the moment I could understand language. I made the words mingle in time with the drum. Sophia watched curiously, mesmerized as I continued to cry out to the ancestors, calling them down. After a few minutes, I put down the drum and stopped chanting, but still the music continued. Other voices were there to replace mine now, humming a faraway song that was getting closer and closer with every second. What's that music? Sophia looked around, scared. Where's it coming from? I didn't answer her. Somewhere in the distance, an eagle cried, and I thought I heard a howl drifting on the wind. The sounds mingled with the dancing bells and the beating of the drum. The whispering got louder, approaching us from every angle. Sophia squeezed Essis and scrunched up into a tiny ball. I needed a piece from every house. Air was already all around us. I scooped up a bit of dirt and threw it into the wooden bowl for Nevita, then summoned what water I could from the ground. It formed in my hand, and I kept it tightly within my concealed fist before I threw the incense bag inside the bowl. I looked at Sophia. Fire, Sophia, I told her. I need fire. Despite her fear, she focused her intention on the incense bag in the bowl and lit it up. Her flames burned the bag quickly, sending smoke into the air and the smell of the incense floating around the mountain. The herbs burned quickly, turning to embers within moments. Before the embers could die out completely, I lashed out my hand to grab them, and Sophia gasped. Ignoring the burning in my palm, I clenched the smoldering embers tightly before I flung them upward into the setting sky. From the embers burst all colors, every shade possible known to creation. These colors flooded outward and upward, encircling the area and creating a spinning whirlwind around us that felt like the inside of a tornado, a column that spun up as far as the eye could see and into the sun. The entire mountaintop lit up with its glory. Sophia's hair whipped around her face as she jumped to her feet in alarm. Essis leapt out of her arms and onto the ground, squeaking and wiggling in delight. I too rose as the colors spread. From them emerged shapes and figures, magical creatures. Dragons spiraled above, gigantic winged beasts like chimeras and large birds at their sides. An enormous firebird with ruby feathers and an orange beak cawed triumphantly, and a jet of flame shot across the sky. Within the whirlwind of color, other creatures spanned, running upon thin air like it was the ground. There were feathered serpents, paratons, alicorns, and species that had long since gone extinct. Aquatic creatures like leviathans and megalodons swam around fire animals such as manticores and blazing pegasi. Among them were creatures such as big cats, like lions, panthers, and lynxes, Woodland creatures such as deer, bear, and raccoons. Reptiles and fish transforming into their elemental forms as they ran by. Fire and water. Some of these creatures I didn't even know the names of. There were hundreds, so many that they made a swirling wall on all sides that blocked out everything except the colors that painted the wind. It was hard to distinguish them all. One creature with a thin neck, a small, perched face, and long limbs that was entirely made of water swam by me. Its companion, a twin to it in everything except that it was made of fire, blazed by and intertwined itself with the water creature. They danced in unison as they returned to the stampede of charging animals. A group of white stags circled Sophia, jumping around her before bounding off into the air. She gasped 
pressing a hand to her mouth when a humpback whale swam by. Sophia gaped at the performance of the ancestors, tears streaming down her cheeks. She reached out to touch them, but their spirit essence floated through her fingers without any sense of actually being there. I laughed as a pack of wolves ran through me, ruffling my hair. They transformed into water canines and became a singular wave, sweeping through the area like it was the ocean. A wyvern spiraled down from the sky and landed in front of Sophia. As he did, he changed shape to resemble a muscular warrior wearing a feathered headdress. Another creature, the firebird, landed in front of Sophia to become a red-headed woman wearing a ball gown with a corset. A blazing hound made of flame came to a stop in front of her to morph into a man with a cowboy hat, and a white griffin landed beside him to transform into a beautiful woman with long black hair that reached her ankles. They bowed to Sophia. She took a few steps backward, unsure of what she was experiencing. My ancestors came down and started landing in front of me, too. They were wearing all types of clothing from various time periods, changing from animals like kelpies, krakens, and gigantic sea monsters. A pale-faced girl, her dark hair in two braids, stood near me and gave me a gentle smile. They bowed to me, too, and I nodded my head in return. Once I acknowledged them, they changed back into their animal forms and took off into the dazzling array, joining again with the crowd that was ever enclosing around us, the sound of their song welling in our ears. I thought I saw an eagle soaring far above, out of my reach, and I wondered if it was my grandfather. The song was swelling louder and louder, and I knew it was time to bring this to a close. With a singular movement, I swung my arm over my head and downward. I opened my palm and allowed the water residing in my hand to splash upon the burning incense that was still inside the bowl. The smoke went out, and in a few seconds the ancestors retreated into a slit in the sky, taking the colors and the song with them. When the ancestors were gone, Sophia and I were left in complete darkness. There was nothing above us except the littered array of bright stars against a dark sky. Night had come. Silence thickened the air between us, and it was harsh and ringing now that the loud chanting and drum beats were gone. Sophia was shaking. I didn't know what to say to her, but she spoke. That was beautiful, her voice cracked. Essis waddled over to her to put a paw on her shoe, and she looked down at him. That's our destiny, I told her. I don't pretend to have all the answers to life, or to even know where the rest of the human race goes after death. I don't even know where the ancestors go. But they're here with us, and that's our meaning. You don't die until your purpose in this life is done. Once it's accomplished, you move on to be with the rest of our kind. Elements, elementi, and familiars all united as one in perfect harmony. Her face was still pretty white. Who were those people that bowed to me? They were your guides. Those particular ancestors that came down to greet you agreed to watch over you and specifically be involved in your life before you were born, I said. Every Elementi has their own ancestor guides. They changed from human to animal, she said. Our familiars fuse with us in our magic when we die. We truly become one. I explained. Sophia sniffled. She wiped her nose and looked at me. Do you understand now? Our people were almost exterminated. Everything that meant anything to us was taken and destroyed. Our culture and religion is all we have, I told her. That's why the houses need each other to survive. I know you think this is all stupid political bullshit and everyone's trying to one-up each other all the time. I sighed. And yeah, a lot of it is that. But underneath it all is a pact for survival. To be frank, if we don't all work together, we're still facing extinction. And all of us agree that our creatures deserve better than that. If we're gone, there's no one left to take care of them. And you know as well as I do, they wouldn't survive in this modern world. Not without someone to protect them. Sophia nodded. She wiped away remnants of the tears that were still drying on her face and picked up Essis. Yeah, I, I get it, Liam. 
I understand why you brought me up here. It took something like this to make me realize who I really am. Essis purred happily. She kissed him on the top of the head, and I gathered my things. Ready to head down? I asked. Yeah, she chuckled. I'm starving, actually. I haven't eaten much all day. I'll sit with you, I blurted before I could stop myself. It's no big deal. I haven't eaten either. Sophia grinned. Stupid, stupid. Just a few weeks ago, I was refusing to be seen in the cafeteria with her, and here I was, changing my mind. We started heading down the mountain. I noticed that Sophia was unusually silent, even more so than when we'd started heading up here. Something bothering you? I asked. Nothing. It was just... She hesitated. There was a wolf standing there, staring at you. He was sitting by your side the entire time we were on the mountain. Talk about a punch to the gut. It was nearly enough to knock me off my feet. My eyes burned and I struggled to catch my breath. All the air had just gone out of me. He was your familiar, wasn't he? Sophia said softly. There was a lump in my throat. Yes. You can't see him? She sounded sad. No. My reply was heavy. Oh. She looked down. I'm sorry. It's okay. She brought her beautiful face back up to look at me. What was his name? Nashoma. His name was Nashoma. She was quiet for a moment. Do you mind telling me what happened? The words were hard to get out. He died for me. Sophia didn't press any further. She just clung tighter to Essis. And yes, before you ask, I added, I'm the only one of my kind. No one else in our history has ever survived their familiar's death, not since Anichi was destroyed. Not even one. Sophia didn't answer right away. For days afterward, I couldn't figure out why Nishoma had sacrificed himself for me, as his death would cause my own, too. He knew that. Every familiar did. But I hadn't died. I'd survived and managed to go on without him. Though how he could have known that, I didn't understand. Maybe he'd known something I didn't. While I was still lost in my thoughts, Sophia added, Well, for what it's worth, I'm glad you're still here, Liam. You've been a good friend to me. I like having you around. A small part of my spirits lifted, and I gave her a tiny grin. Thanks, Soph. We continued our descent, but we were closer together this time, walking so our bodies almost touched. I felt fine right now, but a part of me knew I'd be paying for this walk the next morning. I only had so much energy to give these days, and I'd spent a lot of it climbing up and down this mountain. Sophia, though, she was worth it. I almost wanted to reach out and hold her hand because, you know, I'm a masochist who loves torturing myself. My fingers reached out for hers, but I brought them back before she noticed. I called myself a wuss and reminded myself that we had rules. Can any elementi do that? Sophia asked abruptly, snapping me out of my stupid internal debate. Like, if I learned how to do it, could I summon the ancestors too? There are only a few Hawkeye who can summon the ancestors. The elders, chieftains, and firstborns of chieftains, I explained. My dad is chief of the Tawakwa tribe, so I have the ability to call them. Do you know anyone else who can? Haley can. She's the firstborn of a chief, I said. Her mother is chiefess of Coigny. <laughs> of course she is. Sophia made a bitchy face. What else has she got that I don't have? Well, for starters, her tournament team is probably phenomenal. Madame Doya already chose her for her front runner, and Doya doesn't take losers. Most likely, she has the best pick from every house. You're not helping me feel better, Liam. You called us the reject team, she said sourly. Because we are. We are the kids that nobody wanted, so we got stuck together, I said. Bane wanted us. He specifically chose us for his team, Sophia argued. Bane's being sympathetic. Poor stupid. He's about three fries short of a happy meal. It's not a compliment that he's our coach. People complain about getting him every year. I crossed my arms. 
I just want to get this thing over with and come out on the other end with all my limbs intact. That's not good enough. I want to win and rub it in Haley's stupid face, Sophia snapped. That's Coigny thinking. You need to get it out of your head that we have a chance of winning this thing. I shot her down immediately. The only thing I'm concerned about is making it out alive, because people do die in this tournament, Sophia. What if we just refuse to do the tournament, Sophia asked me. What then? No one is truly forced into the Elemental Cup. People have walked before, I tell her. But if you walk, you become an outcast. You're banished from the tribe and never allowed to speak with any Elementi ever again. Even worse, your familiar will be taken away from you. You won't die because your familiar is still alive, but you'll be separated forever. An Elementi that is too cowardly to enter the tournament is considered unworthy to have a familiar. How did this whole thing get started anyway? Sophia asked. Did the elders just decide to throw a contest where people die for fun? I smirked. No. Before the familiars came, the Hawkeye had a coming-of-age ceremony for every person in the tribe. They were expected to survive in the wilderness for three days alone. After Anichi fell, that ceremony turned into the Elemental Cup. This tournament is every Elementi's way of proving they belong here, that they're valuable to the tribe. Well, I think it's sick that we should have to prove we deserve to live. Sophia's face was scrunched up in a snarl. You don't understand. Back then, weak people would bring the tribe down. They'd take up resources and harm everyone's way of life. It was considered honorable to give your life for the tribes, I argued. Things aren't like that anymore, Sophia said harshly. We have more resources now. We should change. I took a deep breath. Look, I get that you don't like it, and I can understand it's barbaric and dated, but this is your way of proving that you and Essis can contribute to our society and that you're strong enough to help raise magical creatures. What about you? She raised an eyebrow, challenging me. What do you think of all of this, especially considering your situation? My situation. It didn't take her long to make me blissfully happy and piss me off again all in the same hour, did it? I get that people like me would have died out there a long time ago, but I'm not turning my back on my tribe. Not even to save your life? No. If I'm being forced to do this, I'm going to show everyone that I still belong here. That I'm not useless, I growled. And since you're doing it too, you should use it as your opportunity to show that you're really one of us. A true Elementi, not an outsider. Don't do it for Haley. Do it for yourself. Sophia's expression cleared. She glanced at Essis and stroked his fluffy fur. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I'm no coward. And after everything you've shown me today, I want to prove that this is where I belong. And I'm definitely not giving up Essis. Anyone who tries to make me can go straight to hell. Good, I responded sourly. My face went back to that shriveled up pout that I hated, and that I only realized that I did now. It had been set like that for months and I hadn't even realized. Sophia had shattered that statue today and bringing it back now was terribly uncomfortable, but I didn't want to smile right now because she'd poked the bear. Irritating. What, now that we're heading into school, you're going back to being emo? Sophia asked, laughing as we reached the bottom of the mountain. I'm not emo, I grumbled, and we headed back into the forest. You're pushing your luck. Oh, really? What are you going to do? She punched me in the shoulder and drew herself up. Give me one of your salty comments, water boy. Shut up. I laughed under my breath. I nudged her with my shoulder and she nudged back. It was by accident, but when Sophia leaned against me, I didn't pull away this time. We were leaning on each other the entire way back to the castle. Essis happily cheered and left Sophia's shoulder to hop on my head again. When we saw the spires of the castle coming into view, it was like we were electrically jolted apart. Both of us retreated from one another until we were at least a few feet away, like it was a crime to be seen together. I guess it kind of was. Essis, though, didn't come off my head until Sophia pried him away. He took a good chunk of my hair with him, too, the little shit. So, dinner, 
Sophia asked reluctantly, as if she was scared I was going to bow out on my promise now. Dinner, I confirmed. I followed her into the cafeteria. It crossed my mind that people might talk if they saw us eating together, but I pushed it out of my head. They could look. We were tournament partners now, after all. We had to talk to each other to strategize. People wouldn't think too much of it. We had an excuse. Far too convenient of an excuse. Don't get too close, I reminded myself. It was too late for that. I really liked Sophia. Which meant that I was totally screwed. Chapter 12 Orenda Academy was starting to feel more and more like home with each passing day following our trip up the mountain. If it wasn't for Madame Doya's class and the fact that I still worried about and missed my parents, I might actually feel like I could stay here forever. Sophia! Madame Doya snapped one Thursday morning during class. Just like almost every day. She had led us outside to a clearing in the forest. Dry pine needles and leaves littered the ground. We hadn't even started the lesson and she was already yelling at me. The sound of my name snapped me out of my thoughts. I'd been focused on how things had changed since Liam took me to meet my ancestors. He had returned to being my partner in our medical care of familiars class, and I'd even caught him smiling a time or two over the past several weeks. For the most part, Haley had left me alone, and the other Coigny in my dorm had grown bored of playing pranks outside my door. Imogen and I continued to hang out when we weren't in class. We spent most of our time outside the castle, either walking the mountain trails or scouring the beach for cool rocks. As a Navita, Imogen could sense the minerals in the rocks and knew where to find the pretty ones before I could even see them. Essis had a blast digging through the rocks to help. He always managed to find the shiniest rocks on the beach. The ledge of my dorm window was filling up with rocks far too quickly. I was making progress with my fire but it was easier in class where Madame Doya made my blood boil. Still, that didn't seem good enough for her, despite the fact that I was outperforming all my classmates besides Haley. Two other girls and a guy had since bonded with their familiars, and their skills were catching up. But until they did, I was maintaining the notion that Doya had absolutely nothing to yell at me about. She apparently didn't get the memo. I forced myself to hold her gaze. Yes? I want you and Haley up here in the front, she instructed with tight lips, as if I was wasting her time. A low growl bubbled up from Naomi's throat beside her, warning me to hurry up. The crowd of students parted. I stepped forward. Essis sat cradled in the hood of my sweatshirt, but tugged on my ponytail to get a better look. Haley crossed her arms and smirked from beside me. The phoenix on her shoulder held her head high, mirroring Haley's attitude. Above us, the October sky was overcast, and it looked like it might rain. Doya projected her voice across the clearing. In today's exercise, we will be extinguishing fire rather than conjuring it. You will each be paired up, and each pair will take a turn putting out their fires. You must work together quickly and efficiently. We don't want to start any forest fires. Doya shot a narrowed gaze my way, as if she believed I was most prone to letting things get out of hand. Naomi mimicked her. Anger settled in my gut like a bag of rocks. How much more could I possibly prove myself to her? I'd already shot flames from my palms, generated heat without a flame, and shaped my fire into a sphere, all before 99% of my classmates did. Plus, I was the only one who managed to set my hair on fire without singeing a single strand. Miranda had ended up needing a pixie cut to get rid of the damage, and I was pretty sure Haley had cut at least two inches off her hair. Granted, I lost one of my good ponytail elastics that day, but that was a small price to pay for the victory. Doya had just looked down her nose at me but didn't say anything. I considered it a compliment. Haley and Sophia, you're up first. That was all Madame Doya said before she stepped aside. In the blink of an eye, a band of fire lit a mere two feet in front of us. Pine needles cracked as the flames licked several feet into the air. 
The needles burned so quickly that the flames were already spreading across the clearing at an alarming rate before I had a chance to react. I'd already resigned myself to the fact that Madame Doya would never give us any clear instruction. She used a throw them into the lion's pit and watch them fend for themselves type of teaching style. I didn't bother asking how she expected us to complete this task. I turned to Haley. Any ideas? Haley's gaze was already narrowed at the fire, and her brows constricted as if she was thinking hard. Yeah, she snapped. You could help me. The more Haley concentrated, the bigger the flames grew. I took several steps back, but I could still feel the heat radiating across my face. We don't have all day, Madame Doya chastised. If you let the whole clearing burn, no one else will get a chance. I listened to her words, but only to drive my anger at her. It always seemed to help me do better in her class. Behind me, Essis kneaded the back of my neck. I brushed his small paws from my skin. Not now, Essis, I whispered. But he ignored me and continued to press his paws into my muscles. It was surprisingly relaxing, which was totally not what I needed right now. Like Liam had said, Coigny magic took strong emotions, and I needed to channel everything I had right now. I concentrated on the fire. Its warmth didn't just touch my skin. Its energy permeated down through my muscles and into my bones. My body buzzed to its frequency, but it was different than controlling my own fire. Doya had conjured this fire, and though it felt similar to my own, there was something slightly off about it. It seemed angrier and more brutal, as if I could feel Doya's emotions pulsing through the flames. The fire continued to spread, roaring and crackling. Dark smoke rose into the air. What are you doing, Sophia? Haley snapped. Help me! I blinked to clear my vision and focused on the fire. My mind raced with possible solutions. But so far, we'd only learned how to conjure fire, not extinguish it. We'd been using traditional means until now. I imagined the flames dying down, burning to nothing but embers. But they didn't. I tried to pull the flames together to create a fireball that would keep them from spreading. But that only separated a fireball from the other flames that continued to rage through the clearing. Stop it, Sophia! Haley yelled as she took another step back, as if it was entirely my fault the fire was growing. The flames burst higher, like they were exploding with Haley's anger. That's it, I realized. Fire was made of rage and fury. It thrived off untamed emotions. Extinguishing it would require just the opposite. I took a deep breath and focused on the soothing massage Essis was giving me. I ignored Haley's remarks and Doya's hard gaze, letting everything around me fade until it felt like I was alone in the forest with Essis and the fire. I willed the energy sizzling through my bones to calm, but it pushed against me. Haley. You have to calm down, I told her. Anger and frustration will only make it worse. Yeah, because that's so easy, Haley said with an eye roll. I forced my annoyance down. Haley didn't deserve any of my energy anyway. Just stay calm, I told myself. Nothing good will come out of anger today. You can do this. You can control it. Images flashed through my mind as I tried to focus on the things that would calm me most. I pictured Amelia's smiling face which only made me smile since I was wearing her jeans today. I thought of my parents. A pang entered my chest, the same one that hit every time they crossed my mind. Not working, I told myself. I quickly switched focus. Instead of focusing on the things I'd lost, I focused on those I'd gained. I thought about Essis, about his soft paws on the back of my neck, the way he purred when I held him in my arms, and the way he looked at me with his big blue eyes, as if I were the only person in the world he could ever love. My heart swelled at the thought of him. My thoughts flickered back to last week when I was sitting in one of the big comfy chairs in the castle foyer, 
waiting to meet up with Imogen for lunch. Essis was jumping from armrest to armrest, tagging my fingers that I wiggled in the air above him. I giggled until my gaze lifted and I spotted Liam passing through the hall at the top of the grand staircase. Our eyes met for a moment, and my heart flipped in my chest when I witnessed a ghost of a smile touch his lips. The flames in front of me shrank from several feet high to mere inches. I held the fire back, keeping it from eating away at any more dry debris. It fought against me, the energy pressing against my chest like a snowplow. I threw my walls up, blocking the pressure out and funneling my calm energy into it. The fire eased more and more until there was nothing left but embers. I forced the final bit of fire energy off my chest with a calming breath, and the remaining embers sizzled away to nothing. A large circle of black, charred debris, at least ten feet across, stood as a reminder of our exercise. Haley breathed a sigh of relief. Whew, I did it! She glanced to the other students proudly. Kelsey gave her a thumbs up, but Hudson and Tabitha both looked at me like they knew I'd been the one to extinguish the flames by myself. I looked to Doya, expecting some sort of praise, but she just pursed her lips and looked away from me. Beside her, Naomi shot daggers my way. Ben, Kelsey, you're next, Doya barked. She ignited another fire as soon as they made it to the front of the group. I turned in complete shock and found my way to the back. My mind raced as I watched group after group struggle with the task. Doya had to put most of the flames out herself, save for one group toward the end, who'd I'd seen whispering and strategizing beforehand. Clearly, I was outperforming most of my other classmates. What about that wasn't good enough for Doya? The calmness I'd felt during the exercise quickly washed away. My frustrations grew the more I thought about it. Doya hated me since the first day I showed up in her class. It was more than just her normal distaste for students, too. Did she hate Amelia so much that she had to take it out on me? What had Amelia done to her? Or was there something else going on here? I had the entire class period to mull it over in my mind. By the end of class, I was bound and determined to figure out what the reason was. That disappointed look she liked to give me had punched one too many holes through my gut. I hung back by the edge of the trail we'd come as soon as she dismissed the class. She'd just put out the last group's fire and didn't see me standing in the trees until she spun around. Her face immediately fell. I was going to say her name, but that look sent the words right back down my throat. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Essis tugged on my ponytail, snapping me back to attention. I was totally doing this, whether it risked her tossing me out of her class or not. Class dismissed, Sophia, Doya said with a sharp edge to her tone. I forced my voice to remain even. I know, but I'd like to talk with you. I purposely didn't ask her permission. She'd probably deny me the opportunity and tell me to find her during office hours. Doya sighed and started down the trail with Naomi at her side. Fine, but make it snappy. I hurried along behind her. I only took a second to gather my courage. Anything more than that and she'd for sure yell at me again. Honestly, it was impossible to please this woman. Why do you hate me? I spit out the words before I had a chance to second-guess myself. Madame Doya whirled around, her velvety dress and red hair swirling around her. She spun so fast that I nearly rammed into her. I took a step back, my heart thumping like a bass drum against my chest. I couldn't believe I'd actually worked up the courage to say it. Excuse me, she bit. Naomi growled protectively. I swallowed hard though my pulse continued to pound through my ears. There was no backing down now. It's pretty obvious that you hate me. I just don't know why. Madame Doya scoffed and turned her back to me to head down the trail. Do you honestly think I treat you differently than any of my other students, Sophia? 
I thought about the way she praised Haley whenever she executed a task with precision. She didn't exactly praise many other students, but most of them weren't as good as Haley either. I was certain there was no one else in class she yelled or snapped at more than she did to me. Yes, I stated confidently. I'm hard on you because I want to push you to be better, Sophia, Doya said from in front of me. I expect much more from you than the others. She was lying. I completed most of the tasks she required from us. I had a sure shot at passing this class. What more could she expect? Why would she even care? Why, I pressed. Is it because I'm bonded? Other people have bonded and... No, she said in a clipped tone. It's because... She trailed off like she didn't want to answer. It's because you show more promise. I couldn't see her expression as we walked along the trail, but I could hear the lie in her voice. There was something she wasn't telling me. I know that's not true, I said, my heart finally slowing. I came into your class knowing nothing. I had about as much promise as a slug. We emerged from the trees and reached one of the staircases at the edge of the castle's lawn. I took two steps at a time until I was beside Doya. Naomi climbed the stairs on her other side, giving Essis the stink eye as he chewed on the string of my hoodie. Doya kept her gaze fixed forward on the castle. That may be true, but look how far you've come. I wasn't sure if that was meant to be some backhanded insult or a compliment. I guess it made sense why she thought I had promise. It also made sense why my Coigny classmates weren't fond of me. I came in with less potential in my entire body than they had in their pinky fingers, bonded with the cutest, most harmless familiar around, and I still showed them up. I bet they were starting to think there was some truth to that prophecy after all. Which reminded me. No one had actually told me yet what the prophecy said or what I had to do with it. Every time I asked Imogen, she just said she didn't know exactly how it was worded and didn't want to give me false information, which was quickly followed up by, besides, it's just an urban legend, which, coming from Imogen, sounded like a complete lie. If anyone believed in the prophecy, Imogen would. She believed there were freaking Wolpertingers in the forest, which Jonah kindly explained to me didn't exist. Urban legends were kind of her thing. I'd resigned myself to believing that meant the prophecy was bad news for me and that maybe I didn't want to know what it said. But I was feeling bold today. The question slipped out before I could stop myself. What does the prophecy say about me? Madame Doya stopped dead at the top of the stairs. I took another step toward the castle before realizing she and Naomi had both frozen up. I turned to her. Essis dropped my hoodie string and straightened. That's why you're hard on me, isn't it? I asked. You want me to be better than everyone else, even Haley, so I can fulfill the prophecy? Doya folded her hands like she often did, but the muscles in her forearm bulged beneath her sleeves as her fingers tightened together. That may be part of it, she admitted though she kept her emotional walls up as she spoke. Of course it was. It's going to be kind of hard for me to fulfill this prophecy if I don't know what it says, won't it? Honestly, I didn't know where my confidence came from. Usually, I'd avoid Doya at all costs. I half expected her to snap back at me, scolding me for my attitude. Instead, she glanced toward the sky. It's going to rain soon, Sophia. I can't stand out here all day talking about this. I have another class soon. I sidestepped to block her path. Why are you keeping this from me? I demanded. Coigny magic tingled through my skin as my anger surfaced. Oh, that's where the confidence was coming from. Do the Coigny want me to fail? Madame Doya blinked rapidly as if I'd just slapped her in the face. No, of course not. Naomi snorted like I'd offended her. 
Then why aren't you helping me? I demanded. I am helping you, Doya all but roared. I'm doing what I was assigned to do. I'm teaching you how to use your magic. Well, damn, I wasn't expecting that answer. Yet it wasn't enough. I crossed my arms. Whose job is it to tell me about the prophecy? Because whoever was supposed to do that screwed up and forgot. A muscle fluttered in Doya's jaw, and she glanced around. The closest people were way across the lawn, near the courtyard. They couldn't hear us from here. Madame Doya caved with a sigh and lowered her voice. The prophecy says that you will be the one to bring our house, the Coigny, to glory. The fated Coigny child, born in the summer solstice in the year of the dragon, shall bring glory to the greatest house. Wait, that was a good thing? Weren't the Hawkeyes better off with a democracy where all the houses had a say in things, not one where the Coigny controlled everything? That's it? I asked. It seemed so simple. Isn't that enough? Doya snapped. I don't know, I replied in uncertainty. I thought the prophecy would be more dangerous. Of course it's dangerous, Doya barked like I was an idiot. The other houses don't want this prophecy to come true. They're watching you, Sophia. If you value your life, you will push yourself harder in my class, in all your classes, and take pride in the house you were born into. It's the only one you have. My hands shook at her words, and Essa's fingers tightened in my hair. That sounded bad. My voice quickly lost its confident tone. Does the prophecy say anything about how I'm supposed to do this? Doya glanced around again to make sure no one was within earshot. She spoke firmly. There is more, but I expect you will not repeat this part to anyone, as it is for Coigny ears only. Naomi glared at me. I swore she raised an eyebrow in my direction. After a beat, I realized Doya was waiting for my response. Honestly, I didn't know if I could keep the information quiet. Depending on what it was, I would be tempted to tell Imogen. But something told me I wasn't prying the information from Doya's lips without complete and utter honesty. I was playing by her rules. I won't tell anyone, I promised. Doya took a breath. You will have to find a powerful item that will serve to fulfill the prophecy. A specific item? Where am I supposed to find it? What does it look like? So many questions raced through my head. Chief among them, was the prophecy even worth fulfilling? I don't know. Madame Doya's features hardened, quickly turning her back into her usual, unhelpful self. I'm not the one who will fulfill this prophecy. You are. But for the ancestors' sake, Sophia, tread carefully. The other houses have not yet confirmed you are the one, but as soon as they do, you better be ready. They would rather see you dead than see the Coigny in their rightful place of power. With that, Madame Doya turned and hurried across the lawn toward the back of the castle. Her dress billowed out behind her, and Naomi prowled in her wake. I stood at the top of the steps, completely stunned. A shiver crawled down my spine as my eyes traveled toward the courtyard. People from all houses swarmed the lawn. It suddenly occurred to me that any one of them might want me dead, and I hadn't even done anything wrong yet. Yet. Key word. Did that mean I would fulfill this prophecy? Would I be responsible for the downfall of the other three houses? It didn't seem possible. But I couldn't shake the feeling that the ancestors wouldn't have delivered this prophecy if it weren't true. Girl, where have you been? Imogen demanded with a smile when I met up with her in Dragonology later that day. I'd spent the last three hours poring over books with Essis in the library, searching for any further information about the prophecy. But, as I'd already come to find, the library was useless when it came to Hawkeye history. 
I'd learned they much preferred passing down stories orally rather than writing them down. Who knew how much the prophecy had been twisted since it was first foretold? Sorry I'm late, I said vaguely as I joined her in the back of the class. The sky above us had darkened since earlier, but it hadn't started raining yet. I'd asked Imogen once why the Elementi didn't just control the weather around here, and she told me they didn't like to mess with it because it could damage the ecosystem. Plus, you never knew if another Elementi was messing with the weather a few miles away. It was strictly forbidden, except in controlled cases like the cruise ship and during the tournament. Dragonology took place in a clearing along a ledge between the castle and the ocean. It made for a perfect view of the beach. We'd spent the first half of the semester in the classroom studying dragon anatomy and taking care of Aisha, a baby dragon whose mother had abandoned her because she was born with a limp wing. She reminded me a lot of squeaks. Today was our first class outside, and it was our first chance to meet a full-grown dragon up close and personal. As excited as I was about this opportunity, my mind was elsewhere. I stared down the mountain toward the beach. Students prowled the rocky shore near the pier, but it wasn't the crowd that caught my eye. A quarter mile down the beach from them, a guy with long black hair sat alone on a big rock. He stared out across the vast water and twisted something beige around in his hands, almost like he was knitting a sweater. I'd recognize those broad shoulders and silky black hair anywhere. Liam. A whistle sounded from beside me, pulling me out of my daze. I turned to Imogen. She wiggled her eyebrows and sang, Somebody's got the hots for Liam. Shut up, I swatted at her. I do not. Besides, I'm not allowed to date anyone who isn't Coigny. Which meant my love life was going nowhere. Coigny guys were all assholes. Says who? Imogen challenged. She placed her hands on her hips, on top of the floral skirt she wore over skinny jeans. Um, everyone? I pointed out. Imogen rolled her eyes. So you can't marry him. That doesn't mean you can't have fun. I suppressed a smile. You're naughty. Imogen smiled proudly. Live a little. An involuntary frown crossed my face. I wasn't the kind of girl who broke the rules, not even for a guy like Liam. Seriously, come here. Imogen grabbed my shoulders and shook me. Just relax. Let all that tension go. Essis cooed from my shoulder, but his voice vibrated. I didn't feel much like smiling, but I couldn't help it. Okay, okay, I said through suppressed giggles. I'm relaxed. Good. Now, everyone? The sound of Professor Kurt's voice cut Imogen off. Meet Kalina. He gestured to the trees and stepped aside. Aisha, who he'd taken a fondness to, sat on a rock near him and scratched the back of her blue ear with her hind leg. From out of the thick forest stepped a beautiful dragon, coated in shiny red scales. Long horns protruded from her head and short spikes traveled the length of her spine and down her tail. She only took a few steps out of the trees before lowering herself to the ground and folding her bat-like wings across her back. She held her head high and looked positively comfortable, despite the thirty pairs of eyes staring back at her. She's magnificent, I whispered in wonder. Essis huffed like he was offended. I'd seen plenty of dragons since arriving at Arenda Academy, but I'd never been this close to one before. None except Aisha. Aisha was the size of a medium dog, while Kalina was bigger than a pickup truck. She held herself in a way Aisha never would. She was basically a work of art. Don't be shy, Professor Kurt encouraged. Kalina is my familiar. She will not harm you, unless I tell her to, of course. He let out a light laugh. But I assure you I won't. It's perfectly safe. Imogen bent and scooped up Sassy in her arms, who'd been playing with her shoelace the whole time. Let's go meet a dragon. Imogen pushed through the group and was the first to approach Kalina. I followed closely behind her with Essis on my shoulder. 
Kalina sat as still as a stone when Imogen approached. She held Sassy up to Kalina's face, as if introducing them. Sassy promptly let out a loud sneeze, her whole body tightening under the pressure. Kalina drew her head back in surprise, but she quickly stretched forward to give Sassy a good sniff. Imogen cradled Sassy in her arms. Oh, sweetheart, are you allergic to dragons? Whispers broke out behind us, but I was so used to it now that it barely registered. Sassy reached out a paw to touch Kalina's nose. If she wasn't careful, her paw would fit straight up Kalina's nostril. I giggled at the thought, which drew Kalina's eyes to me. She stared at me with a look in her eyes I couldn't quite place. Admiration, maybe? Whatever it was, it was inviting. Come on, Professor Kurt said, motioning for me to step forward. She likes you. I wanted to pet Kalina, but she was so large and confident, it was intimidating. She could literally bite my arm off. I stepped forward anyway and gently reached out with my hand. Kalina bowed her head, allowing me to pet the space between her eyes. Her scales were soft and warm. Good, good, Professor Kurt said. Anyone else? Several other students rushed forward to marvel at his beautiful familiar. Imogen and I were pushed aside. You're fine, sassy, Imogen said, bouncing her in her arms. You've never had any problems with Aisha, have you? Imogen held sassy up to Aisha's face. The baby dragon immediately stuck her tongue out and dragged it across sassy's cheek. We both laughed. I think they like each other. I giggled. Of course they do, Imogen agreed. Who wouldn't love this little red furball? From my shoulder, Essis stretched out a hand as if he wanted to touch Aisha. I bent to Aisha's rock until they were close enough to touch. Essis grabbed her small horn and climbed onto her head. She spun in a circle, nipping playfully at him as he slid down her back. Sassy squirmed in Imogen's arms as if she wanted to play with them too. Oh my gosh, I exclaimed. They're too cute. Behind us, a guy scoffed. I threw a glance over my shoulder to see Brandon, a Coigny senior, and his familiar, an orange cat the size of a lynx, staring at us. Is there a problem, Brandon? Imogen snapped at him. He shot her an unamused expression. That dragon's not cute. There's a reason its mother abandoned it. My gut twisted at his blatant disregard for another being's life. What did Aisha ever do to him? Screw you, Brandon, Imogen shot back at him. You wouldn't know cute if it bit you in the ass. I stifled a laugh. Sometimes Imogen's bold personality was a blessing. Yeah, well... Brandon started to retort, but Imogen turned away, ignoring him. He huffed, but apparently couldn't come up with a strong enough comeback because he let it drop. Essis reached the point behind Aisha's shoulder blades, right between her wings. He stretched out to her limp wing like he was about to climb out onto it. Hey there, buddy, I said, scooping him up off the dragon's back. We don't want to hurt her. Essis's small claws dug into the fabric of my sweatshirt as he tried to pry himself away from me. Whoa! I held onto him tighter. What's up? Where are you going? Essis struggled harder, until his hands were clamped around the exposed skin on my hands, digging in so deeply that I thought he might draw blood. Instinctively, I yelped and dropped him in the dirt. I rubbed my hands while Essis scurried up the rock and returned to Aisha's back. Ow, Essis! What's gotten into you? Essis grabbed Aisha's wing again and pumped it, as if encouraging her to take flight. Essis, she can't fly, I told him, as if he could understand. I noticed for the first time that Aisha's wing looked straighter and stronger than normal. Maybe she'd eventually grow out of her deformity. Relax, Imogen insisted. They're just having fun. Except I could tell something was wrong. Essis had never jumped out of my hands like that before. Essis trilled and continued the flapping motion. Aisha stood high on her rock and began flapping her good wing. See, Imogen said. Just having... The words died on her lips as Aisha's body lifted into the air. Essis cheered in victory the same moment my stomach dropped to the ground. 
I should have been happy for Aisha, considering none of us ever thought she would ever fly. But I wasn't. I was terrified for Essis as I watched them climb higher. Aisha dropped several feet between each flap of her wings, as if she was simply limping along. Sheer terror filled me as a slew of possibilities rushed through my mind. Essis could fall and get hurt. I couldn't let that happen. Behind me, all infatuation with Kalina died as everyone's attention turned to Essis and Aisha as they rose above the trees. Essis! I ran after them. If he fell, I'd be right there to catch him. Professor Kurt didn't seem at all concerned with my familiar's well-being. He just laughed in disbelief and said, That's my girl, Aisha. You're flying! I rushed into the trees to stay under them. I tried to keep an eye on them, but I only caught glimpses of blue scales through the canopy. The top of a tree moved as Aisha's toes grazed it. Essis! I cried. Oh, God, ancestors, whoever, don't let my little guy die. He means the world to me. His trill of excitement echoed through the trees. Essis, you get down here this instant! I screamed. To my horror, Aisha caught the top of another tree, and her body slammed into the next one. It pulled her from the air like a giant monster reaching for its prey, and she and Essis went tumbling to the ground. Twigs snapped on their way down, and pine needles rained to the forest floor. They both landed in the dirt with a sickening sud. My gut immediately tightened like I'd been punched. I quickly rushed forward to where Aisha and Essis lay sprawled. Aisha's bad wing was even more twisted than before and blood trickled out of a wound on her face. The red liquid was in stark contrast to her blue scales. Her eyes were closed, and I wasn't sure she was breathing. Beside her, Essis lay still. My heart hammered ferociously against my ribcage. I skidded onto my knees beside them. My hands shot out to cradle Essis. But before I touched him, his eyes popped open, and he sprang up to his feet. Dirt coated his white fur. So he normally dusted off, he ignored it this time. He ignored me, too, pushing my hands away when I reached for him. His eyes locked on the cut on Aisha's face. I froze as Essis stood beside her. He was barely the size of her head, but he bent over her like he was the stronger, wiser of the two. He placed his tiny little paws on either side of her wound, and then closed his eyes. My eyes widened as Aisha's cut began to knit itself together right in front of my eyes. Essis, I whispered. What kind of magical creature are you? I didn't have a chance to finish my thought aloud before someone cleared their throat from behind me. I whirled around to see that Imogen had followed me. She held Sassy in her arms. Imogen, I... I... I glanced between her and Aisha, who was starting to wake. The cut had completely vanished, and her scales were perfectly intact, as if nothing had happened at all. I didn't know what to say. This changed everything. It meant that Essis wasn't just a helpless familiar after all. He was powerful so powerful that if anyone got wind of this, they might take him from me. Like Doya had said, I needed to tread lightly. This kind of thing just might get us killed. I could barely think straight, but there was no denying Imogen's expression. Her usual smile had vanished, and her mouth hung open slightly. She didn't even blink. Imogen, please... I couldn't finish my sentence before Professor Kurt and the rest of our class rushed up behind her. Professor Kurt knelt beside me to inspect Aisha's injuries. But I never tore my gaze from Imogen's eyes. Before I could rise from the ground and drag her away to talk about what had just happened, she'd whirled around and bolted past our classmates and out of the trees. It was in that moment that the skies decided to open. Rain fell to the ground in large, heavy drops, 
soaking my clothing and S's fur within seconds. Students scattered, but I remained frozen, staring through the trees where Imogen had just ditched me. A chilling fear traveled down my spine. Imogen saw. She saw Essis heal Aisha. She knew as well as I did that Essis wasn't all he appeared to be. The only question was, would she honor our friendship, or would she turn us into the Navita elders? I wasn't sure how long Essis and I had before another house confirmed the prophecy and decided to kill us for it. Chapter 13 Survival instincts had been held in the woods almost every time I went to it, but since it was pouring out today, it had been moved into Professor Macaulay's main classroom, located in the dungeons. Professor Macaulay wasn't one to be afraid of a little rain, but when there had been a tornado sighted nearby, Head Dean Alric put his foot down and forced us to relocate inside. Macaulay had ranted that young people today were coddled before she started her lesson. Made me laugh. Good thing, too. I could keep the rain off of me, but I didn't want to hear the rest of the class whine that it was too wet. I guess the Yapluma would get their kicks when the rest of us were carried off by a twister, though. Although, I would almost rather be outside in these dangerous conditions than inside Macaulay's creepy classroom. There were no windows down here, and besides the wooden desks, the only decor she had were multiple arrays of skeletons, both human and familiar. They were mounted throughout the room in various poses before dark tapestries that depicted gruesome scenes. Every day was Halloween when Macaulay was concerned. When you are in a survival situation, the first thing you need to do is stop and assess your surroundings, Professor Macaulay boomed. It is better to create a plan and execute it than to hesitate too long and lose precious seconds. If you panic, you will most certainly end up dead. Macaulay's familiar, Bram, was lurking around the room and making people shiver. I ignored him and tried to focus. Professor Macaulay's familiar was a wendigo, and it was creeping out the majority of the people in this class. It was easy to tell why. The Wendigo had the skeletal body of a horse with wolf's paws and a reptilian tail. The head was merely the skull of a deer, the antlers intact. Its black skin was drawn tightly over its skeletal form, and its bones clicked together as it wandered around the room. Bram hissed and gnashed his sharp teeth near a student who'd fallen asleep. The guy woke up screaming and the class laughed. I was pretty sure the dude pissed himself. Bram chuckled like he was pleased before he moved on. The thing looked like it could survive in the wilds alone without a problem. In fact, Bram looked like he could survive, kill, and maim everything within a hundred miles of wherever he'd been abandoned. Macaulay was pretty creepy herself and had to be close to a hundred by now. She matched her familiar in looks, taut skin stretched over thin bones. The two of them appeared to be walking skeletons, Macaulay dressed in all black, only increasing her frightening appearance. They should have retired from teaching to become crypt keepers years ago. I was pretty sure Macaulay was going to outlive me. This wasn't Macaulay's class. Professor Devante usually taught survival instincts, but he and his wife had just had a baby, so Macaulay was filling in for this semester. Not that I minded. Professor Macaulay had sneered at everything that had tried to kill her off so far, so obviously she knew a thing or two about staying alive. Water is more important to find than food in a survival situation. Depending on the situation, you will either need to find a source or have a toaqua draw it up for you, Macaulay preached. Water was easy. I could supply it if we ran into a pinch, and Sophia had fire unless one of us died and the rest of us were screwed. If there is adequate access to water, the human body can survive around 20 days or so without food. Keep in mind, however, that by this time you will be very weak, and it will only take a matter of days without food before you become useless and unable to harvest or hunt. Macaulay scanned the room with piercing crow eyes. Therefore, daily nutrition becomes very important for both you and your familiar. 
Macaulay took a tray and began passing it around the room. These types of plants are local to the region and edible. You can find them in many places on Earth. Memorize their appearances and names. When the tray passed to me, I focused on it. Cattails, the inside of conifer bark, acorns, wild blueberries. Not exactly the most delicious, but when you were hungry, anything looked good. I passed the tray behind me, and Macaulay said, There will be a quiz next time you come in. Anyone who doesn't pass, I don't expect to last long. Class dismissed. People gathered their things and headed out. Macaulay's comment was obviously directed toward the tournament. Besides me, there were at least four other people in here who were going to be competing. I knew she was watching us and expecting us to do well. I passed a bunch of squealing girls in the hallway, complimenting one of the girls on her brand new familiar. I wasn't sure what it was, but it looked like a pink pom-pom. At least she had a year to bulk the thing up before she was forced to compete. I winced as the girl squealed again and continued on. I thought survival instincts was going to be a blow-off class, but now that I was forced to be in the tournament, I made myself pay attention. And it was a good thing, too. I'd already learned how to make a quick shelter. I no longer skipped class. I'd need every piece of information available to keep me and my team alive out there. I heard someone else giggling, and I knew that voice. Around the corner was Sophia. She was leaning against the wall with a bunch of books in her hands. Essis was perched on top of them. Ezra was with her, grinning coyly. They hadn't seen me. I was about to turn around and go the opposite way before Sophia said to Ezra, Seriously, your Liam impressions are the best. Aren't they? Ezra snorted. It took months of perfection to get just the right scowl. I slunk against the wall at Ezra's comment, hiding. Ezra and Sophia were talking about me. The little bastards. I was about to round the corner and confront them before a question from Sophia stopped me in my tracks. So, what was Liam like before he lost Nashoma? What was I like? What made her think she had the right to ask that question? I decided to hold back and listen in. Eavesdropping wasn't right, but hey, it was way better than playing the fool. Ezra laughed. I imagined him looking up, because any time someone asked him a question, the idiot always had to glance skyward, like the answer was on the ceiling. What was he like before Nishoma? Well, let's see. His favorite thing was swearing. Still is. I think he started saying the F-bomb when he was like ten. Sophia laughed and I smiled. Yep, that pretty much described me. He laughed a lot. He was always up for an adventure, whatever it was. He loved exploring. He wasn't a big sports guy, but he enjoyed being active. Hiking was one of his favorite things. I love hiking too, Sophia said quietly. And he loved helping people, Ezra added. He'd jump in any time to lend a hand. He had the biggest heart. Seriously? Sophia's tone was doubtful. None of that sounds like Liam. Is it really that hard to believe? Ezra sounded amused. Word around school is that he's the reason your fire started emerging, and pretty strong, too. Damn it. Should have known that would get out somehow. The damn trees had ears around here. It's just, Sophia paused. He was pretty blunt about it when he told me he hated helping people. Don't believe him. He's just being a jerk. It's like his default setting is grumpy nowadays. Sophia and Ezra laughed together, and I scowled. Thanks, assholes. And the Shoma just amplified those traits, Ezra said. He became super brave. He was never afraid of anything, and he was a really good leader. Better than I could ever be. Doubt that, Ez. People adored my brother. They rotated around him like he was the sun. I'd never been like that. Popular. And now he's not the same, Sophia said. Now, Ezra sighed. He's secluded. He doesn't like being around anyone. Not even me. He goes to class and then locks himself up in his dorm. I can't talk to him without being insulted. Ouch. That was kind of true, but it hurt. I had been a dick to Ezra lately, along with everyone else. He seems very spiritual, Sophia commented. 
I think she was trying to direct the conversation into a more positive light. He is. He's super religious. Not that it isn't true or anything, but I think Liam was more into our culture than any of us because he took the responsibility of being firstborn so seriously. It really hurt him when our dad told him he wasn't going to be chief anymore. Fuck yeah, it did. Second most painful day of my life was when dad brought me in to tell me he was passing on the chiefhood to Ezra. Frickin' sucked. You said he was a good leader, but that he likes seclusion, Sophia mulled. What does that mean? He's always kind of been a lone wolf, pun intended, Ezra said. Even before he lost Nashoma, he found it hard to let people in. He'd shoulder other people's problems, but never share his own. It's just how he is. I bet he would have made a really great chief, Sophia said. That small bit of praise made me want to fly. It was nice Sophia believed in me. Until she said, How do you feel about being chief? I imagined Ezra shrugging. I don't know. It is what it is. I knew he wasn't into it, but it wasn't like he had a choice now. My one bad decision had cost me Nashoma, but it had also cost my tribe its leader and my brother his future. Do you, do you think he wants to make it through this tournament? Sophia asked. He said he didn't want to die, but... Sophia made a good point. Yeah, I didn't want to die, but I didn't really want to live either. I was caught in the middle. Ezra's voice became heavy. I don't know. We were super close before Nishoma died. Then once it happened, it's like he couldn't see me anymore. He just forgot about me. A surge of guilt rampaged through my insides. Ezra and I had been close. We practically hung out every day, even after I started at Orenda. That had changed pretty quickly over the past few months. I made a mental note to hang out with Ezra more often. I didn't realize it until now, but I missed him. Are you excited to find your familiar? Sophia asked him, trying to change the subject. I wasn't sure, but once I found Essis... It's like my entire life changed. I'm so happy now. I don't know. Ezra's tone was guarded. Not really. Not really. What the hell was that supposed to mean? I get scared, you know, Ezra said, quietly now. After seeing Liam go through what he did, if having a familiar can cause you that much pain, I'm not sure I want one. Double whammy. If I was guilty before, I felt like melting into the floor now. This was my fault. My grief over losing Nashoma had pushed my brother into thinking having a familiar was a terrible thing. But though my time with Nashoma had been so short and the pain afterwards so intense, I wouldn't have changed a thing. Not for anything. Ezra paused. Why are you asking about Liam anyway? Yeah, Polly. Why are you trying to dig up dirt on me? She hesitated. We're tournament partners. It's my job to know as much as possible about him. I depend on him for my survival out there. It was a great excuse, but I didn't buy it. Neither did Ezra. I could hear it in his voice. Well, if the rest of us can't get him to open up, maybe you can. He really likes you. You think? Sophia's voice sounded hopeful. Oh yeah, I know my brother. He's really mean to the ones he likes the most. It keeps them from getting too close. I heard footsteps. I've got to get to class. Catch you later. Yeah. Sophia went the opposite way, I assumed. I turned the corner and saw them going in different directions. Sophia's hair was bouncing up and down on her shoulders behind her. I longed to explain to her that I really wasn't as big of a prick as she'd been told, but I couldn't. You know, because I was. I took a step forward to go after her, but then thought better of it. I needed to spend my free hour alone. Bang, bang, bang. I was jolted out of my dreams at the loud noise and wrenched awake. Somebody was trying to bang down my door at eight o'clock on a Friday morning. I moaned and rolled over in bed. I was going to kill whoever was out there. Fridays were my days to sleep in, and my body frickin' ached all over. Twelve hours of sleep hadn't done anything to dull the pain that had been coursing through me last night. Liam! I heard Jonah's voice outside the door. Let me in, man! 
People from other houses weren't usually allowed in dorms that didn't belong to them, but people made an exception for Jonah, mostly because he was friends with my family and also because the female RAs from my dorm loved having a gay best friend around. As long as no teachers found out, it wasn't a big deal. He was going to bust the door off its hinges. I staggered out of bed and wrenched the door open. I swear to the ancestors, Jonah, you're gonna die, I snapped immediately. Jonah looked down once at me and my boxers. Good morning, sexy. Are you checking me out because I'm seriously not in the mood, I growled. Bang called us in for a training session for the tournament, Jonah said. We gotta go. It starts at nine, beachside. Oh, it was like Bane to ruin a perfectly good Friday. Fine, I slammed the door in his face, threw on some clothes, and staggered outside without combing my hair. Jonah offered me a donut. Breakfast? The sight of it made me feel like puking and devouring it at the same time. Chronic illness was fucking stupid. Yes, I grabbed it and shoved it down my throat. You've got jelly on your face, Jonah sang out. He was way too chipper in the morning. I waved my hand as we walked by the pools. A huge wave welled up out of them and crashed down on Jonah, soaking him from head to toe. What the hell? Jonah yelled at me as Tawakwa people laughed. Was that really necessary? Was it necessary to ram on my door to wake me up, Paul Bunyan? I snapped. You wouldn't have woken up any other way. Jonah said back. I rolled my eyes because I knew he was right. I raised my hand and the water soaking him was drawn out of his clothes and hair, leaving him completely dry again. I opened my palm and it splashed on the floor over his boots. What'd you do that for? Maybe I liked looking soaked and seductive, Jonah said. By the ancestors, I couldn't deal with him this early in the morning. Why are you even studying to be an elementi, Jonah? Why don't you just become a model for some sex toy catalog instead, I asked. If only, Jonah sighed dreamily. I slapped myself in the forehead. It had been a joke, but seriously, I could see Jonah leaving school for such an opportunity. Squeaks was waiting for us outside of the Tawakwa dorms. She squealed happily when she saw Jonah and followed us outside. She stumbled over her big feet a few times and knocked over a couple of statues on our way out. I shook my head. If I ever met a more clumsy hippogriff than squeaks in my life, I'd protest for the species to continue. It was still cloudy outside, but the storms had passed late last night. When we got to the beach, squeaks tripped and went head over heels into the sand. While Jonah helped her up, I looked around for Sophia. She was there, sitting on a large rock by the shore. Imogen wasn't with her, which was odd. Those two girls were hardly apart lately. Hey, I said as I approached her. Sophia looked up and I asked, where's Imogen? It's almost nine. She isn't coming, Sophia said. She has a cold. You heard from her? Jonah asked. Sophia went slightly pink. Uh, no, I haven't talked to Imogen since yesterday. A Navita girl from her dorm hall told me that this morning before I left. This was irritating. Our first training session and Imogen was skipping. Usually I wouldn't care if someone didn't show up because they got sick. Like stay in bed because I don't want that shit. I hated when classmates showed up with a cold or the flu. All you were doing was making people miserable and spreading it around. But this was survival and we only got so many chances to get this right before we were literally tossed into the threshold of hell. She better be puking her guts out right now, because having a cold wasn't a good enough excuse for, you know, learning how to avoid death. That's okay, I forced myself to say. She needs to take care of herself and get strong for what's coming. You don't seem to think that way when it comes to yourself, Sophia said. I have different standards for myself. If I stayed in bed every time I felt ill, I'd never leave my room, I told her. Jonah and Squeaks nodded solemnly behind me in unison. It was a little weird. What about Sassy, I asked. Is she gonna show? I don't think so. Sophia shook her head. She couldn't even send Sassy. This was getting interesting. 
I was starting to think that Imogen not showing up was because of something that happened between her and Sophia, and not this imaginary cold. Drama was the last thing we needed right now. These girls needed to get it together. Imogen should be here. There are only two more sessions after this, Jonah said. What? Sophia's expression became surprised. We only get three train sessions with Bane, I told her. More than that is considered cheating. Great, she wrinkled her nose. I guess we should make the most of it. We waited on the beach for Bane to show up, but nine o'clock came and then 9.30 and Bane was nowhere to be seen. Okay, this was majorly annoying. First Imogen wasn't coming and now Bane was late to his own damn training session? We were so going to lose. I'm about ready to head back to my dorm, I said. It had been annoying before, but now it was seriously pissing me off. Did Bane even care if we survived? Let's just wait a few minutes longer. Sophia looked around. She was getting nervous. Well, hold on a minute, guys. Jonah looked around, and Squeaks' head swiveled on her neck. Do you hear something? I paused and listened closely. There was the rushing of water, the approach of an oncoming wave. Jonah, get Sophia up in the air, I screamed. I ran toward the forest and paused at the edge while Jonah took Sophia's hand tightly. He pushed his free palm toward the ground, and the two of them rose into the sky, hovering far above the beach. Sophia clung tightly to Essis as she was sent soaring into the skies. Squeaks followed them, beating her wings so she could match their height. Then it came. Trees bowed over as a massive wave came rushing out from the forest. I immediately threw my hands up in front of me, fingers wide, to prevent the wave from knocking me over. The water swelled around me and rushed back into the ocean, but it was hard. I struggled to keep my balance and my strength as the force of the powerful wave threatened to bowl me over. Jonah saw that I needed help and curled his fingers into his palm. Immediately, I felt the wind pick up around me, and it spun quickly in a circle, protecting me from the water. Sophia was looking around above me, unsure of what to do. The wave was getting stronger, harder for me to fend off. Eventually, the water broke through Jonah's shield and crushed my magic. I was drug underneath the wave and rushed out to sea. I heard Sophia screaming. I couldn't tell which way was up, but I knew I needed to breathe. Summoning what magic was left within me, I pushed my hands downward and the water around me shot me up like a rocket. I broke onto the surface. I felt Jonah's air magic around me as I was lifted to the clouds where he, Sophia, and Squeaks were levitating. The wave below us had vanished, returning to the ocean. The beach was soaking wet and a few trees had been knocked over. As far as we could tell, everything was safe. Jonah drifted us downward. We landed and looked around, not sure what had just happened. Without warning, Jonah was knocked down to the sand by a jet of water that slapped him in the back of the head. He groaned, and as Squeaks raced to check on him, the pools of water she stood in turned to ice. Her feet were caught. Squeaks squawked and tried to pull free, but as hard as she tried to escape, she just couldn't break the hold the ice had on her. The ice was spreading. It was growing over Jonah and Squeak's legs, their bodies. I tried to use my own water magic to stop it, but it was far too strong. Whoever was controlling the element had more experience than I did. No matter how much I willed the ice to turn to water again, it just wouldn't obey my command. Sophia raised her hand to shoot a jet of fire at the ice so it would melt and set Jonah free, but as she was doing so, I saw several small streams of water right from behind her. They formed into snow, then changed into daggers of ice, spinning in the air and shooting directly for Sophia's back. Look out, I shouted, and I ran toward her. I was too far away, so I would never get to her before the knives did, but Sophia had good instincts, and she was able to spin around and duck before the daggers implanted themselves in her form. I was already on my way, so I ended up tripping and knocking her down before she could free Jonah. Essis flew from her arm, landing a few feet away. Liam, Sophia shouted in frustration. I had it handled. 
I just wanted to make sure you were safe, I shot back, but this was no time for arguing. Before our horrified gazes, Jonah and Squeaks were slowly being taken over by the ice. We rushed over. Sophia used her power to try and melt the ice, while I did my best to try and break it apart. Essis scratched at Squeaks with his little nails, but it was no use. Sophia's fire wasn't powerful enough now. The ice had spread too far, had been given too much time. I tapped on the ice with my knuckles. I could see Jonah inside, but he didn't move. Oh shit, he was dead. I had helped to kill my best friend now, I knew. I was definitely cursed. Everyone who came around me met an untimely end. Maybe Haley was right, and I was a burden to the tribe. Suddenly, the ice turned to water and Jonah broke free, gasping for air. Squeaks crashed out of her icy prison and tumbled onto the ground. Essis made chattering sounds, looking her over and making sure she was all right. Jonah, are you okay? Sophia worried. He was coughing and gasping for breath. I used the pockets of air within the ice to survive, but there wasn't much in there, Jonah said. His skin was blue. Sophia lit a fire in her palms to warm him up, and he huddled close to it, shivering. Squeaks came up behind him and wrapped herself around his form, using her wings as a blanket. Well, I can hardly say I'm impressed, a voice behind us said. Thane was standing there, looking thoroughly disappointed and even more glum than usual. You did this? I asked furiously. This was total bullshit. Yes, I did, Liam, and it's far from the worst you're going to experience out there during the tournament, Bane quipped back immediately. If that was your best effort, none of you will make it past the first task. It wasn't our best, Sophia protested. We were just unprepared. Do you think you're going to be prepared for what's coming? Bane raised an eyebrow. No one is going to hand you a list of what you're going to be put through, Sophia. Can't you just tell us what the tasks are? Jonah whined, shivering under Squeaks' wings. Even if I would, I couldn't. The tasks change every year. This makes it so no one has an unfair advantage, Bane said. Jonah groaned. Bane turned toward me with his hands in his pockets. I'm surprised, Liam. I thought you trusted Sophia but the way you acted made it seem like you don't think she has the ability to back you up. That's not true, I snapped. She's strong enough. Her magic's nothing to downplay. Sophia's face was red. No, you were too busy trying to protect me. If this had been real, Jonah would have died, Sophia shouted. I cringed. Yeah, that had been my fault. My first instinct had been to protect Sophia before anyone else. I told Jonah to get her out of the way of the wave before we made a cohesive plan to combat it together. And I messed her up when she was trying to save our friend. She saw the knives coming. So why did I feel the need to interfere? The tribe as a unit is more important than any one person. You have to learn this, Liam, Bane said sharply. There are no heroes or martyrs in the Elemental Cup, only survivors and casualties. My cheeks burned. Our first test as a group and we'd horribly failed. Did you really have to put us through all that? Jonah asked. He'd stopped shivering now and looked pissed. That's why I sprang on you. You need to learn to expect the unexpected, Bane said. The tournament only gets harder each year. I will put you three through whatever I have to in order to make sure you survive. You three? Bane didn't even notice one of our teammates was missing. I was going to start hitting my head against a tree in about two seconds. Get up, Bane told all of us roughly. We've already wasted precious time. Whose fault is that since they showed up late, I thought bitterly. This guy was too much. Jonah stumbled to his feet with the help of squeaks. The rest of the morning was spent with Bane drilling us on our powers, doing so many summoning reps that it made my arms hurt. I sparred with Jonah and Sophia both, but none of us managed to get a hit on the other. I could have, seeing as how I was a third year and had sparring experience, but I already felt bad enough I'd hurt Jonah, so I left him alone. And Sophia, I couldn't fight her, not even for practice. It just wasn't in me. 
she noticed because her fire kept getting more and more intense with every fireball she tossed at me. Fury burned in her eyes, but the angrier she got, the gentler I became. I just fizzled their fireballs out with my water and tried not to look her in the eye. Essis watched us closely, his eyes darting back and forth with every bit of magic we flung at each other. When it was time to break for lunch, Bane appeared even more disappointed than he was before. We headed back to the castle without him. Jonah mumbled that he had a headache and was going to lie down. When we could no longer hear squeaks tripping over things, I knew they were gone. I was going to head back to the Tawakwa dorms, but I followed Sophia to the Coigny Hall instead. Before we got to the doors, she rounded on me. You think I'm so weak I need to be escorted? No, I just... I hesitated. I just wanted to hang out with you. Her face softened a little, but my response wasn't enough to calm her down. I already know that I'm the outcast here, but I thought you were the one person who believed I was capable of being your teammate. Now I know you just think I'm weak. Damn Bane for putting words in my mouth. It's not about being weak, I told her. My voice was calm and steady. I just reacted today. That's all. If you react and don't think, we're all dead out there, she said harshly. Essis was at her feet, looking between us with droopy ears. He didn't like it when we fought. I just wanted to protect you, I leaned against the wall. Is that so wrong? Sophia chewed her lip. No, but you know how things go in the Elementi world. You have to be the strongest, otherwise people won't respect you. I may be new here, but I've learned that much. You can't protect me everywhere, Liam. I was regretting so much of everything I told her when she got here. I wanted to take it all back and convince her things were different, but that would be a lie because they weren't. I think you're strong, I told her. This was just the first training session. It's okay we made mistakes. We still have two more chances. Sophia nodded. I guess you're right. She put her hand on the Coigny door. I would love to hang out, but I have to practice. See you later, Liam. When she shut the door in my face, the sound of the door clicking was like a gunshot to my heart. I backed away from the door slowly, unsure of what I would do with myself. I'd been secretly hoping Sophia would come with me to town, get some food, see stuff. Not like a date, you know, just friends. I realized I really didn't want to spend another weekend hiding in my dorm like I had been. I decided to go looking for Ez. Maybe he had nothing going on. I thought about hitting up Jonah, but he was in a rough way. He probably wouldn't get out of bed now until Monday. I racked my brain for other people to hit up, but I hadn't talked to most of them in months. Had I really pushed everyone in my life so far away? As I walked back to the Toakwa dorms, Bane's words resonated in my head. I had to trust that Sophia was strong enough to stand on her own. It's not that I didn't believe in her or her powers. I just didn't trust whatever the elders had created to take us down. I'd already lost Nishoma. I didn't want to lose her, too. Chapter 14 Exhaustion settled into my bones on Saturday morning. I lay in bed staring up at the ornate carvings in the shape of flames on the ceiling, thinking about yesterday. Bane's training session should have motivated me to train harder, but I couldn't seem to summon the energy to get out of bed. I just kept playing scenarios in my head of what obstacles we might face in the tournament, and all the possible ways Liam would manage to screw it up, or save me, one of the two. Thinking about Liam was always dangerous. Every time he crossed my mind, I thought about the pain he was in without Nishoma. I contemplated telling him about Essis, so that Essis could heal him. But I also didn't want anyone knowing about Essis' power. It was the only way to protect him. And if I had to choose between a guy I might possibly be falling for and my familiar, my literal soul, my familiar would win out every day single time. I only wished I could find a way to protect them both. Essis stretched from where he slept beside my head on the pillow. His weight shifted, and suddenly his big blue eyes were hovering over me. 
He placed a small palm on my cheek and made a chipper sound like a songbird. I sighed. I know it's time to get up, buddy, but I'm just not feeling it today. I'd spent every weekend since I'd been summoned training with my magic so I wouldn't die in this stupid tournament. But all I really wanted was a break. And I didn't mean another study session in the library either. Reading over the stats of previous year's tournaments was just depressing. There'd been more deaths in the tournament in the past few years than in the last century. And sometimes they didn't even find the bodies. The elders were seriously stepping up their game, so our generation had to work harder than any before to prove our place. I'd hoped the records would teach me something about what was to come, but I was starting to think that it didn't matter how much I trained or how much studying I did. I'd never be ready for this. The only thing that would keep me alive was making sure my team was willing to work together. But I still hadn't heard from Imogen, and I wasn't sure Liam wanted to talk to me after the way I blew him off last night. Which totally sucked, because for some reason, all I wanted to do was hang out with him. Essis patted my face again. When I turned my eyes to him, he stuck a thumb in his mouth and started sucking on it. I couldn't help but smile. Are you hungry, buddy? He nodded. I forced myself to get up and stroked my hand through his fur. Fine, we'll go grab breakfast after I take a quick shower. Essis immediately jumped down from the bed and scurried across the room. My dorm was bigger than my room back home, with fancy decor that went beyond anything I could ever imagine. Deep red velvety sheets hung over the sides of my queen-sized bed. The bed frame was made from metal rods painted in gold, with a bed knob in the shape of a flame at the end of each post. The bed sat upon a large, ornate area rug, but the rest of the room had hardwood flooring. The walls were red to match my sheets. The long curtains in front of my windows had various shades intertwining to create complicated patterns. Across the room stood a small brick fireplace, with a plush red chair in front of it like the ones in the common room. Various other pieces of furniture were scattered around the room, including a vanity by the bathroom, a dresser near the walk-in closet, and a nightstand next to the bed. A candelabra chandelier hung from the high ceiling. The room was beautiful. I couldn't argue with that. But it seemed more like a place you'd spend the weekend than a place you'd call home. Essis hurried into the open bathroom door. He jumped toward the towel rack, his tiny little fingers stretching high into the air. He chirped in victory when the towel came sliding down. It draped over top of him, but he burrowed his way out and dragged the towel into the bedroom behind him. I stood, laughing. Thank you, Essis, you're so helpful. I bent to pick up the towel and gave him a pat on the head. He cooed in response. Essis sat outside the bathroom while I showered and changed. At my dresser, he handed me my hairbrush and hair tie. He made sure to choose a green hair tie to match my shirt, since he knew I didn't like to mix colors. Essis perched atop my shoulder as we made our way to the dining hall for breakfast. The bright morning sunlight shone through the tall windows, casting rays across the red carpet in the Coigny Hall. Like most Saturday mornings, the castle was quiet. When we reached the cafeteria, it buzzed lightly with conversation, but most of the tables remained empty. I grabbed two breakfast sandwiches from the takeout line and turned back to the main doors to head outside when I heard the sound of someone calling my name. I spun around and my eyes scanned the cafeteria. They landed upon Imogen in the corner who was waving me over. Relief flooded through me to see a familiar face, but it was quickly replaced with sickening doubt when I reminded myself what had recently happened between us. Then again... No Navita elders had shown up at my door to drag Essis away, so maybe there was still hope that Imogen hadn't abandoned me after what she saw. I sighed and approached her, knowing I was going to have to face her sooner or later. Today she wore brightly colored rainbow leggings with a rhinestone t-shirt. Her strawberry blonde hair was tied into a high ponytail with multicolored strings mixed into the strands. Sassy's fluffy red tail poked out from beneath the table. I was starting to think I'd never see you again, I said lightheartedly, as I slid into the seat across from Imogen. My heart felt anything but light. She furrowed her brow. 
Why wouldn't you see me again? I was sick, not dead. I unwrapped the foil from one of the breakfast sandwiches and handed it to Essis. Suddenly, I didn't feel like eating. Why'd you run away from us the other day? You weren't sick then, were you? No. Oh, my ancestors! Imogen smacked her palm to her forehead. You must have thought the worst of me. I'm so sorry. I should have got in touch with you sooner. It was just that inspiration struck and I had to get home. Then my little brother got me sick, and it was just this whole thing. She waved her hands like it didn't really matter. So, we're still friends? I asked cautiously. By the ancestors, of course we are! Imogen placed a hand over her heart as if she was having a heart attack. What did you think happened? I glanced around the cafeteria, but no one was close enough to hear us. I lowered my voice anyway. I thought after what you saw, you might turn me and Essis into the Navita elders. I dropped my gaze and bit my lower lip. What? Imogen asked in disbelief. I would never do that to you, Sophia. I pulled Essis down from my shoulder and cradled him in my arms. I'm just scared that if anyone knew what he could do, they might try to take him away from me. This kind of power isn't normal, right? Imogen took a bite of pancake and shook her head. No, it's not, and it's probably best if you don't tell anyone else about it. I gazed up at her, hopeful. So you'll keep our secret? Girl, I'll take it to the grave. A moment later, Imogen's eyes lit up, and she leaned forward to rest her elbows on the table. Do you want to know what I've been doing the past few days? Yes, I said, intrigued. A smile spread across her face. I've been researching Essis' origin. Do you want to come over to my house and see what I found? I couldn't contain my eagerness. Absolutely! After we finished breakfast, Imogen led me outside and through the gardens. My neighborhood is pretty far from the school, Imogen explained, so we'll have to borrow a ride. Ooh, I said in excitement. My mood had drastically improved now that I knew Imogen and I were cool. What kind of ride are we talking about? A periton? A pegasus? A dragon? No, no, she said, shaking her head. The strings in her hair swung from side to side. I prefer to keep my feet on the ground. You know how to ride horseback, don't you? Um, is it complicated? My only experience riding a horse was at a petting zoo when I was six, but I wasn't sure that counted, considering the trainer held onto the reins the whole time, and I only rode the horse for maybe five minutes. Imogen shrugged, sending Sassy bouncing in her tote bag. That's okay, the unicorns are very well trained, and do most of the work anyway. I get to ride a unicorn? I exclaimed in excitement. Yeah, Imogen said, like it was no big deal. Come on, we're almost there. The trees opened to a large clearing with two huge red stables sitting side by side. Each of them had large sliding doors. I peered inside the first building to see a row of stalls on either side of the barn. I caught sight of several different creatures, including two peritons and a pegasus. Several guys milled around, tending to the animals. This way, Imogen said, gesturing me over to the second building. A cool breeze rushed through the stables when we stepped inside. I didn't know why I was expecting to inhale a floral scent, as if the unicorns farted rainbows and pooped butterflies. But all that hit my nose was the scent of a barn. Hay, wood shavings, leather, and dust. My eyes fell upon each unicorn as we passed. They had the body of a horse, with the same long nose, pointed ears, and large frame. But everything else about them looked as if they'd just stepped out of a fantasy painting. The first unicorn was completely white, with a mane that took the shape of cool blue water. It was as if a waterfall was flowing right out of its head, the water droplets disappearing into the air like magic. A shiny silver horn stretched a foot in length and twisted to a sharp point. The next unicorn had brown fur, with hooves the texture of tree bark and a mane the color of grass. Its horn was like an expertly carved branch growing out of its forehead, with intricate carvings etched into it. I couldn't tell if the designs were natural or placed there deliberately, 
but given the magical beauty of these creatures, I guessed they were born that way. In the next stall stood a black unicorn whose mane and tail flickered red and orange, like real flames. It was a wonder the stables hadn't burned down. Its horn looked as if it had been forged from a black matte metal, with subtle but elegant ridges traveling the length of it. Hey, Cade, Imogen greeted cheerfully as she strolled up to one of the guys, scooping out an empty stall. Cade shoveled a pile of used shavings into his wheelbarrow, then looked up at us. He wore a skin-tight cotton t-shirt that stretched across his broad shoulders and toned chest. His skin was naturally tan, but most of his hawkeye jeans had been traded for Latin American features. He had short, dark hair, and his brown eyes were soft and friendly. Cade definitely had a sexy vibe going on, but looking at him in that way made me feel like I was cheating on Liam, which was so totally weird because we weren't together. I immediately pushed the thought from my mind. Imogen, on the other hand, was eyeing Cade up and down like he was a god. I guessed he was Navita, but he didn't have his familiar at his side, so it was hard to tell. What can I do for you today? he asked in a friendly tone as he wiped sweat from his brow. Is anyone up for a ride? Imogen walked over to the nearest stall, the one with the water unicorn inside, and patted her hand on the top of the door. What do you say, Kiki? You want to go for a ride today? Kiki just got back from a ride last night, Cade said. How about Daisy and Jack? He gestured to the two unicorns in the stalls beside Kiki. Imogen's eyes lit up, and she stepped toward the earth unicorn. I love Jack. Kate opened the door and coaxed Jack out of his stall. You're not going to braid ribbons in his tail again, are you? Imogen swatted at him and her cheeks grew bright red. Shut up. He looked gorgeous. Cade smirked playfully. If I'm going to sign Jack out to you, you have to promise not to bring him back dyed purple or some crazy shit like that. Imogen giggled like a little schoolgirl. It was so unlike her. Essis threw his hands over his eyes and then slowly peeked out between them. He clearly couldn't watch their obvious flirting. I won't, I swear, Imogen promised. Cade moved to the next stall to get the fire unicorn. Good. I'll bring him back blue, Imogen deadpanned. Imogen, he complained, but he didn't sound truly bothered. Fine, she relented. I won't do anything weird. He's beautiful just the way he is. Aren't you, Jackie boy? Imogen rubbed Jack's head. He nuzzled into her arm as if searching for treats. And here's Daisy, Cade said, patting her back. Daisy stepped out of her stall until she was just a foot away from me. I reached up to stroke her soft black fur. It felt like velvet. Warily, I reached out for her fiery mane and was surprised when my fingers passed straight through it without feeling a thing. I glanced down at my hand, like I expected it to be blistered or something. She won't hurt you, Imogen said. She's magical, remember? Daisy pivoted on the spot until her middle was facing me. She likes you, Cade said. She's inviting you to climb on her back. I stroked her fur again, but hesitated. Don't I need a saddle and reins? Cade laughed. Not with unicorns. Would you like a boost? Before I could answer, Cade was helping me onto Daisy's back. I gave an involuntary yelp, and Imogen giggled. She didn't need any help hopping onto Jack's back. She jumped and swung her leg onto him, then sat there comfortably with Sassy secured safely in her bag. Sassy poked her head out and glanced around, looking positively at peace atop the unicorn's back. I, on the other hand, clamped my hands around Daisy's neck, hoping I wouldn't topple off her back and be trampled. Essis chirped and hopped off my shoulder. He climbed up Daisy's head and wrapped a small hand around her horn. He stood there proudly, like a captain holding onto the mast of his ship. Daisy didn't seem to mind. Make sure to keep them both hydrated. Imogen knows the drill. Cade winked at her, and she went beet red. Thanks, Cade. Imogen said as Jack started leading her toward the open door. Daisy followed. My hold on her tightened as I swayed from side to side with each step. Wait, Cade called, just as both of our unicorns stepped outside.
You forgot something. Cade stopped beside Imogen and wiggled his fingers. Next to him, a green plant rose from the ground. Its thin stem twisted and grew until it stopped in front of Imogen's nose. A small purple flower bloomed at the end of it, confirming that Cade was Navita. Imogen smiled and plucked the flower from the long stem. She placed it in her hair behind her ear. Thank you, Cade. You're the best. We'll see you later. She waved. Cade returned to the stables while Imogen and I started down a nearby path. It wasn't as wide as the roads back home, but since no one used cars around here, I figured it must have been the main drag into town. Daisy and Jack walked beside each other at a brisk pace. So? I wiggled my eyebrows. Imogen looked at me innocently. Yeah? Why haven't you ever mentioned him before? Who, Cade? Imogen's voice rose at least three pitches when she said his name. He's just a guy I grew up with. He was my older brother's best friend. What's there to say about him? How about the fact that you're totally crushing on him and never once mentioned it? What? Imogen squeaked. I am not. Cade is just... Cade. Yes, sweet and handsome Cade, I agreed. Who you have the hots for? Imogen rolled her eyes and then stared straight down the road. Girl, are you high or something? I laughed. Okay, so you don't like him, but you have to know he likes you. Well, that answers that question. Clearly you're on drugs. No guy ever pays attention to me. I'm fat and weird. You're not fat, I countered. And maybe he likes you because you're weird. I like your quirks. Imogen pressed her lips together. She didn't look convinced. I was starting to feel comfortable enough on Daisy's back that I loosened my grip on her mane. He made sure you didn't leave without giving you a flower. So he always does that. I stared at her with raised eyebrows. Imogen inhaled a deep breath. Oh, my ancestors! I never knew! I totally friend-zoned him! She threw her hands over her face and nearly fell off her unicorn in the process. Tell me about him, I said. I don't know what to say. We've known each other my whole life. We used to play in my treehouse when we were kids. So you're close? Imogen shrugged. I guess you could say that. He was there when I bonded with Sassy almost a year ago. She dropped her head and bit her lip. Anyway, that's not important. Cade and I can go weeks without talking, but we always pick right back up where we left off. We reached town while she was recounting a story about how Cade and her brother had convinced her the forest was haunted. I listened to her story, but my eyes roamed the city. The only other time I'd seen it was when Liam and I had arrived, but that was only the smallest part of town. There was so much to see in the heart of the Hawkeye village that I couldn't seem to take it all in. We rode along the narrow streets of the Chinatown district. Paper lanterns hung above our heads, and the scent of fried rice and noodles filled my nose. From there, we passed into the Hawkeye district. People milled along the streets and stopped at carts that sold things like potions and Hawkeye food such as corn roasted with butter and spices. I'd seen this part of town before, but it was like seeing it for the first time all over again. I barely had time to take it all in before Daisy turned and led us down a secluded street. We left the buildings behind and traveled into the forest, where some of the largest trees I'd ever seen grew. They rose at least 300 feet into the sky. We hadn't made it far before my eyes fell on a large structure hanging high in the trees. I squinted, trying to make out its shape. Soon, more and more structures of similar size came into view. Tree houses. Oh my gosh, I exclaimed. When you said tree houses, I thought you meant a playhouse in your backyard. I didn't think you literally lived in a tree house. Imogen laughed. I'm Nevita. Where else would I live? I gazed upward in wonder. The tree houses were huge and suspended at least 40 feet in the air. Each one was supported by at least three different trees. They all had wooden exteriors like log cabins, 
with wraparound balconies, big windows, and slanted roofs, but each had its own unique charm. A network of bridges passed from house to house. Daisy and Jack stopped below one of the bigger tree houses. I barely noticed we'd stopped. I was still trying to take in the sheer size of this neighborhood suspended in the trees. It went on farther than I could see. Imogen slid off Jack's back and adjusted Sassy in her bag. Then she reached out to pat Jack's head. You did so well, Jack. You deserve some carrots later. We'll be back soon, okay? I swung my leg over Daisy's back and landed softly on the ground. Essis chirped and scurried off Daisy's head and onto my shoulder. I glanced around, looking for any sign of steps or ladders to get up to the house. You look worried, Imogen said. I turned back to her. No, just wondering how we get up there. Are there stairs or something? Yeah, but we're not going that way. Um, okay. How do we get up then? Oh, it's easy. She giggled. Well, not for you. What does that mean? I asked curiously. I wasn't going to have to learn how to climb the tree without footholds, was I? Imogen smiled. It means you'd burn this whole forest down if you tried my method. Here, stand over there. Imogen took me by the shoulders and guided me away from the unicorns and to the base of the nearest tree. Don't try this at home, she warned. Here we go. Before I knew what was happening, something tickled my leg. I lifted my foot in surprise, but it grabbed a hold of me and wouldn't let go. I looked down to see a thick tree root snaking up out of the ground and curling around my leg like the tentacles of an octopus. Several more roots crept out of the dirt and secured themselves around my legs, all the way up to my hips. Relax, Imogen said as another root wrapped itself around her. I'm not going to hurt you. I relaxed as she instructed and held tightly onto Essis so we wouldn't fall. The tree roots grew more and more until they were lifting us up into the sky. Although it should have freaked me out, I felt secure in the roots' hold, as if they were a safety harness keeping me from plummeting to the ground. We ascended skyward like an elevator. The roots arched over the railing and set us down on the bridge. Their hold on me loosened and they shrank away. I glanced over the top of the railing to see them retreating into the ground until they were completely gone. The dirt shifted to cover them, as if they'd never seen the light of day. That was really cool, Imogen, I said. Yeah, it's cool now, she replied. Living in a treehouse wasn't so cool when you were a kid who had to walk all the way down 15 houses to get to the stairs. You wouldn't believe it, but I could barely keep a weed alive. I didn't learn the shortcut until recently. Anyway, you want to meet my parents? Imogen started down the bridge toward the nearest house, which rose two stories high and was supported by five massive trees. I hesitated as nerves settled in my gut. I knew Imogen didn't care that I was Coigny, but I wasn't sure her parents would like me. Like she said, I could literally burn this whole forest down. There was probably a reason they didn't have many entrances that other elementi could enter through. What's wrong? Imogen asked when she reached the front door. I swallowed down the lump in my throat. Will your parents be fine with having a coigny in their house? Imogen smiled. Of course, don't worry about it. My parents are a lot more progressive than most. They think all the houses should mix and that we should do away with most of our traditions. My shoulders relaxed. That's good to know. Imogen turned and swung the door open. Mom, Dad, I'm home, and I brought a friend. Two young boys raced in from the living room and body slammed her with a group hug. I thought you were going back to school, the taller of them said, gazing up at her with a twinkle in his eye. He looked like he might be six, while the other boy looked around four. They both had Imogen's strawberry blonde hair, but they didn't have her sense of style. They dressed normally both wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Imogen bent to her knee. I had to come back because Sassy missed you. On cue, Sassy leapt from her bag. She jumped playfully at the younger boy who let out a gleeful laugh. Imogen stood, giggling as she watched her brothers tickle Sassy. Sassy rolled over like a dog and they scratched her belly. 
I glanced around to take in the home. Everything was bathed in natural wood tones, from the hardwood floor and walls to the cupboards and the furniture. It was like something you'd see out of a travel magazine if you were looking for a quaint cabin getaway. A long wooden table with eight chairs around it sat to our left, beside a pair of double glass doors that led onto the balcony. Beyond that sat a full kitchen. To our right was a living room with two long couches and a TV above a cute metal fireplace. A hallway behind the stairs stretched back into the house. The pile of dishes in the sink and toys scattered around the living room gave the home an obvious lived-in vibe. How old are your brothers? I asked, trying to remember if she'd told me before. Oh, gosh, Imogen said with a sigh. Levi is four and Quentin is seven. Then Roland is ten and Soren is fifteen. So you're the oldest? I asked. No, well, yeah. Imogen dropped her head. I laughed. Well, which is it? It's, um, complicated. Imogen didn't meet my gaze. My older brother, the one who was friends with Cade, he's a uh, not around anymore. My heart immediately sank. Imogen, I'm so sorry. I shouldn't have asked. No, it's okay, she said, finally meeting my gaze. You didn't know. I bit my lower lip, wishing I had words for her. Why didn't you mention anything? I didn't want to scare you. Scare me? Imogen nodded. Yeah, because of how he died. Are you talking about Trace? Quentin asked while still petting Sassy. Levi stuck his bottom lip out. I miss Trace. It's been almost a year, you know, Quentin told Levi. I know, Levi said, but I can still remember him from when I was three. I can even remember from when I was two. Trace was the best brother ever, until he died in the tournament. The breath left my chest. I suppose I couldn't blame Imogen for never mentioning him to me. The conversation came to an abrupt halt as a blonde woman descended the stairs. She wore a pink polka-dotted scarf around her head and a blue dress that looked like it came straight out of the fifties. A pair of black cat-eye glasses framed her face. I could see where Imogen got her quirky fashion inspiration from. The woman was followed by a type of canine I'd never seen before. It looked like a Pomeranian, but with longer ears. Its fur was completely white except for the rings of blue outlining its silver eyes and the matching tufts of blue on its ears. It wore a pink scarf around its neck that matched the one in the woman's hair. Hey, Mom, Imogen greeted. Where's Dad and the boys? It's strangely quiet in here without them. Mushroom hunting, her mom answered. Yum, mushrooms! Imogen gestured to me. This is Sophia, by the way, the girl I was telling you about. Her mom's face lit up. Oh, hello, Sophia! She held her arms out as she made her way over to me. She drew me into a hug. I squeezed her back awkwardly. I'm Gracie, she said, pulling away from me. Imogen's told me all about you. Oh, who's this little guy? She smiled at Essis but didn't try to pet him. I was grateful for her respect of my familiar. This is Essis, I introduced, scratching behind his ears. He responded with a purr and nuzzled into my fingers. He's so adorable. Gracie clapped her hands together. Gracie's dog barked once at Essis and then let his tongue hang from his mouth cheerfully. Essis jumped down from my shoulder and circled the dog. Gracie's familiar nipped at Essis playfully as they chased each other around. Across the room, Sassy perked her ears up and quickly joined in on the game. Imogen's brothers burst into a fit of laughter. I couldn't contain my own giggles. There was just too much cuteness in one room to handle all at once. Gracie tore her eyes off our familiars and turned her attention back to Imogen and me. So, what are you girls up to? Imogen's eyes darted toward me but quickly returned to her mother. Um, we're working on something for Dragonology. We need to use the library. Gracie's brows drew together. You've already spent so much time in there the last few days. 
Your teachers are pushing you too hard. When I attended Arenda, we didn't have homework. And don't even get me started on the Elemental Cup. It's ludicrous how times have changed. Your father and I both... Mom, Imogen cut her off. Can we not do this again? Gracie looked at me, then back to Imogen. You're right. Now's not the time. I'm sorry. You two go have fun. Can I bring you anything? No, but thanks, Mom, Imogen answered before gesturing for me to follow her down the hall. Sassy and Essis scurried behind us. We passed by two bedrooms and a bathroom before reaching the door at the end. Imogen paused with her hand on the doorknob. You like books, right? Of course. I bounced on my toes, eager to see her family's library. Imogen smiled. Then you're going to love this. The door swung open, and my jaw promptly dropped to the floor. When she hinted at a library in her home, I pictured a few shelves of books and a couch or something. This was much, much more than that. The room was twice the size of the living room, with a vaulted ceiling and tall bookcases that covered every inch of the walls on my left and my right. There was even a short wooden ladder leaning against one of the bookcases so that you could reach the top shelf. The wall opposite the door was made entirely of glass, and overlooked the beautiful green forest. Beneath the window, a plush couch stretched from wall to wall, providing the perfect reading nook. It was long enough that Imogen and I could easily stretch out on either side at the same time. A round table with two chairs sat in the middle of the room, with several thick books stacked atop it. The same natural wood tones that covered the rest of the house were present in the library as well. Holy crap! I whispered breathlessly as I stepped into the room, taking it all in. Your family really loves books. Imogen just shrugged, as if it was normal for families to have their own home libraries. She pulled out a chair at the table and flipped open the book at the top of the stack. Yeah, I guess you could call us bookworms. Most people just call us crazy. What? I squeaked, sliding into the chair across from her. Why would they say that? The truth was, I kind of understood. Imogen and her mom were a little... out there. Essis hopped past me and jumped onto the couch. He fluffed one of the throw pillows before curling up on top of it. Sassy lay beside him. It was one of the first times I'd ever seen her sit still. An unamused expression crossed Imogen's face. Have you met my family? Anyway, no big deal. We might seem a little crazy, but being crazy has its perks. Like, I prodded. Like the fact that our family is the only one brave enough to speak the truth. I leaned my elbows on the table, intrigued. The truth about what? I don't know. Just things that no one else believes in. It's funny that we live with creatures of legend, unicorns and dragons and things like that, but none of the Hawkeye actually believe in things they can't see with their own eyes. We have our own myths, you know. Galley swanks, womgrombits, lily bats, you name it. They were all real once, yet most of the Hawkeye refused to believe it. Why wouldn't they believe it? I asked. Imogen shrugged. After the war that killed the Anachi, certain species started dying off. I guess none of the houses wanted to admit they were responsible for the mass extinction. How can you be sure these creatures existed? Imogen sat up straighter and pushed her open book toward me. My ancestors made sure we wouldn't forget. Komoko Kani was one of my great-great-great-grandfathers, or something like that. Anyway, a lot of greats. In our native language, his name loosely translates to Brother of the Beloved Animals, and he lived up to that name. He was very close with the magical creatures that roamed our valley. He recorded everything he saw. He discovered several new species, actually. That must be really cool, I said. To be related to him, I mean. It is, Imogen agreed. But he wasn't very well known. My family has been pushing for years to get his journal published, but the elders claim they can't authenticate it and don't want to be putting misinformation out to the masses. My lips turned down. That's unfair. Imogen rolled her eyes. Tell me about it. 
Anyway, the good news for you is that Komoko wrote about the Kerbals in his journal. Kerbals? I asked with raised eyebrows. Yeah, that's what Essis is, Imogen said in a dead serious tone. I couldn't help it when I burst out laughing. You're kidding! No. Imogen didn't even twitch. I'm sorry, I just don't think it fits Essis. It just sounds so... So what? Cute and cuddly? I glanced to Essis. His eyes were closed, and his chest rose and fell slowly. My heart filled with all kinds of positive vibes. I turned back to Imogen. Who am I kidding? Kerbal totally fits him. Agreed. Anyway, I totally forgot I'd ever read about Kerbals until I saw Essa's heel. There aren't many creatures who can do that, so when I saw it, I instantly knew I had to check out Komoko's journal for confirmation. And it's right here. Imogen turned the book toward me and pointed to the left-hand page. See? Kerbals. The entry was entirely handwritten. At the top of the page was a surprisingly good sketch of a Kerbal, though it had black spots like a cow, unlike Essa's flawless white fur. Below the sketch was a list of words in a language I didn't recognize. Underneath that was the English translation in a different handwriting. Size, up to six pounds. Temperament, good-natured and playful, but protective and territorial. Fights when threatened. Abilities, healing. Notes, eats a high-calorie diet, buries feces and cleans self, enjoys climbing and collecting shiny objects. That's it? I asked in disbelief. There was nothing here I didn't already know, except the part about Kerbal's fighting. Though now the horns on Essa's head made sense. Somehow I couldn't imagine Essa's fighting anyone or anything. Unfortunately, yes, that's it, Imogen replied. What else do you want to know? I turned the page, as if expecting more information on the next page, but it just led to another entry on something called Wilmoth's. I don't know. Maybe what he eats? He eats hamburgers, Imogen said simply. Obviously. I couldn't tell if she was being serious or trying to make me laugh. Yeah, but they can't be healthy for him. Look at him. Imogen gestured to Essis on the pillow. He's fine. I chewed my lower lip while I watched Essis. His ear twitched while he slept. Yeah, I suppose. I just... I wish I knew more about him. Imogen sighed. Maybe it's a good thing no one does, you know? Yeah, I agreed after a brief silence. No one else does know, do they? I mean, what about your parents or other relatives? Worry filled my chest as I considered the possibility. What if someone recognized him for what he was? They could take him for his powers. Imogen shook her head. I don't think so. I searched through all of our books that might mention Kerbals, and this was the only one it was in. I read these books cover to cover hundreds of times as a kid, and I barely remembered Kerbals existed. I don't think anyone else knows. And I didn't tell my parents the truth of what I was researching, either. Relief washed over me. Good. So we can keep this between us, then? Of course, Imogen agreed. I wouldn't want anyone knowing if Sassy had unique magical powers like this, either. Your secret's safe with me, Sophia. My shoulders completely relaxed. Thank you, Imogen. You're a really great friend. We spent the rest of the morning combing through the books in Imogen's family library. We didn't expect to find more on Kerbals, but I couldn't let go of the hope that we would. I wanted to know all I could about them. What if Essis was allergic to something? How would I medicate him if he got sick? What if he had weird anatomy, like four stomachs or two hearts? How long did Kerbals survive? And how old was Essis anyway? All of these questions assaulted me, but by mid-afternoon I didn't have an answer to any of them. Essis had woken up and lay curled in my lap on the sofa while Sassy batted at him from the floor. Piles of books sat beside me on the adjacent cushion. 
I rubbed behind his ears. I'm sorry I couldn't learn more about you, buddy. Essis snuggled into my belly, as if letting me know it wasn't my fault and that he forgave me. We should probably call it a day, Imogen suggested. We need to get Daisy and Jack back to the stables anyway. Imogen had ducked out of the library earlier to give them a snack and water, but they needed a more substantial meal. Okay, I agreed. You ready, Essis? He jumped out of my lap, trilling. Sassy chased after him toward the door. Whoa, girl, Imogen said with a laugh, following behind them. Not so fast. We made it down from the treehouse the same way we came and started the long journey back to the school. Hey, Cade called cheerfully when we returned to the stables. He wore a clean blue shirt, so I figured he hadn't been in the stables all day. The way he looked at Imogen and how she responded with flushed cheeks I guessed that he came back just for the chance to see her again. I was starting to think you got lost. Nah, Imogen said, patting her unicorn's back. Jack would never lead me astray. Of course not, Cade said. He stepped up to Daisy and handed her a carrot, which she promptly gobbled out of his hand. What are you girls up to tonight? Oh, uh... Imogen looked to me, as if begging me to say something. I'd never seen her look so flustered. Imogen's free, I blurted. But I'm busy. She could use some company at dinner. Imogen's eyes went wide, as if she didn't think I was doing her a favor. She'd thank me later. Sophia, weren't you just saying that I was going to grab takeout and meet up with Liam? I cut in. Yep. What the heck, stupid mouth? Why was meeting up with Liam the first excuse I came up with? Ah, well, if you have plans, I'll let you get to them, Cade said while helping me down from Daisy's back. Imogen just blinked at me, completely shocked. I, I guess I'll help Cade with the unicorns, and then, then we'll get dinner together? She said it like a question, like she couldn't believe this was actually happening. It's a date, Cade said, before turning a light shade of pink himself. Well, not a date, but... Oh, no, Imogen agreed immediately. Not a date. Imogen hopped down from Jack with ease and readjusted Sassy in her bag before leading Jack into his stall. Have fun on your not a date, I whispered to Imogen under my breath, before raising my voice and waving to both of them. Essis waved from my shoulder. See you later! Imogen shot me a huge, excited grin that Cade couldn't see. I turned away with a sense of victory filling me. I had successfully managed to get my best friend to go out with her very obvious crush. Pride followed me all the way back to the castle and down the deserted hallway on my way to the cafeteria. Until I heard the sound of my name. I ducked behind the sprite statue next to Madame Doya's classroom when I realized the voices I'd heard were hers and Haley's. What the hell were those bitches saying about me? Yeah, I know, Haley said in a bored tone. I've been following her, but honestly, the girl is a total bore. She's either sitting in her dorm room or hanging out with her weird Navita friend. She's started asking questions, Doya said with almost no emotion. It won't be long before she finds it, and when she does... I know... Haley cut in. I'll be right there to report back to you. Honestly, I don't know why you worry. Sophia's probably going to die in the tournament anyway, especially with that useless furball of hers. I saw their first training session. It was laughable at best. Anger pulsed through my veins. What the hell did Haley know? I urged to singe the sleek black hair off her head just to teach her some manners. Yes, Madame Doya responded coolly. I'm well aware, but as I recall, your first session didn't go well either, did it, Haley? Oh, burn. Haley went dead silent. That's it for now, Doya said. I'll see you tomorrow after class for training. Let your team know. But we've already used up our allotted training sessions. Haley sounded confused. And? 
I pictured Doya raising an eyebrow. Who's counting? You let me worry about the rules. You just worry about your training and keeping an eye on Sophia. Understand? My breath froze in my chest. I should have known Doya would cheat. But sending someone after me to spy on me? That was crossing a line. Essis nearly jumped off my shoulder. To give Doya a piece of his mind, I presumed. But I held him back. Haley's voice fell. I understand. The sound of footsteps met my ears, sending a wave of panic through me. I pressed myself to the wall, diving behind the statue so I wouldn't be seen. Haley breezed out of the room and headed in the opposite direction of where I stood. Anwara flew behind her. My entire body remained tense until she was out of sight and for at least another minute afterward. When I was satisfied that Doya wasn't going to exit her room and that Haley was long gone, I stepped out of my hiding spot and bolted. I raced toward the castle's main entrance, knowing there would be enough people there or in the courtyard that I could duck into the safety of the crowd. I didn't feel safe going back to my dorm, not when I knew there was a target on my back. In the deserted hallway, nerves rushed up and down my arms, making my whole body shake. It felt as if someone was watching me, even though I knew Haley and Doya hadn't known I was there. Still, I glanced behind myself just to make sure I wasn't being followed. Just as I turned my eyes forward to round the corner, I smacked into something hard. I stumbled backward and caught Essis before he could tumble off my shoulder. Whomever I'd run into cursed under their breath. When I gazed up, I saw the most beautiful pair of dark eyes staring back at me. Liam, I breathed. Thanks, the ancestors. What's wrong, Sophia? He asked, immediate concern laced in his tone. He held onto both my arms. His eyes darted between mine as if searching for an answer in them. I, I heard Doya and Haley... I swallowed deeply, still trying to catch my breath. Liam, I need help. Liam sighed and ran a hand over his face. He took a deep breath to collect himself. What are you talking about, Sophia? I overheard Madame Doya and Haley talking about me. I tried again, this time in a calmer tone. Apparently Haley's been following me. Liam, I'm literally being stalked. Liam just stood there with worry in his expression, but he didn't say anything. Liam? I prodded. I don't know what you want me to say, Sophia, he replied. You just told me you didn't want me to protect you. Now you're asking me to? You come to me all the time asking for help, then you push me away. Make up your mind. I... I stared up at him, completely speechless. I mean, I couldn't say he was wrong. Tears welled in my eyes. I tried to blink them away, but it only made them rise higher until the floodgates opened and a tear ran down my cheek. Shit, Liam muttered. Please don't cry, Sophia. It's just, I'm just... A bawling mess. Slowly, Liam reached out and ran his thumb over my cheek, wiping away the tears. I sniffled and looked up at him. The most intense look of care filled his eyes. Without thinking, I threw myself forward into his arms. My hands flew around his neck, and my head rested just beneath his shoulder. Tears soaked into his t-shirt. He tensed momentarily, before relaxing and pulling his arms around me, squeezing me tight. Warmth tingled across my torso where he touched me. He smelled like a warm jacket and the rain-kissed needles of an ancient pine forest. I'd never felt as safe and protected as I did in Liam's arms. That only made me want to cry more, as if it was an invitation to let my emotions flow. It's okay, Sophia, he whispered, rubbing my back. Haley's not worth it. Forget about her. How can I forget about her when she's stalking me? I asked, burying my face deeper into his shoulder. Liam sighed, like he didn't know what to say. He probably hated me right now. 
He didn't seem like the kind of guy who could handle crying girls. But I also couldn't bring myself to pull away. He was like a protective blanket hiding me from the monsters that lurked in the corners of the castle. How can I help, Sophia? He asked softly. I drew away from him and wiped my tears. I don't know. I just... I guess I just needed to tell someone. Liam nodded like he understood, then reached out and grabbed my hand. My breath caught, and my stomach did this whole flip-in-my-abdomen thing. I know what you need, Liam said as a light smile touched his lips. Let's go have some fun. <laughs>